prologue of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefanu being a dish of village chat we are going to talk if you please in the ensuing chapters of what was going on in chapel is it about a hundred years ago a hundred years to be sure is a good while but though fashions have changed some old phrases dropped out and new ones come in and snuff and hair powder and sacks and solitaires quite passed away yet men and women were men and women all the same as elderly fellows like your humble servant who have seen and talked with rearward stragglers of that generation now all and long marched off can testify if they will in those days chapel is it was about the gayest and prettiest of the outpost villages in which old dublin took a complacent pride the poplars which stood in military rows here and there just showed a glimpse of formality among the orchards and old timber that lined the banks of the river and the valley of the Liffey, with a lively sort of richness. The broad old street looked hospitable and merry, with steep roofs and many-colored hall doors. The jolly old inn just beyond the turnpike, at the sweep of the road, leading over the buttressed bridge by the mill, was first to welcome the excursionist from Dublin under the sign of the Phoenix, there in the grand wainscoted back parlour, with the great and good King William in his robe, garter, periwig, and sceptre presiding in the panel over the chimney-piece, and confronting the large projecting window through which the river and the daffodils and the summer foliage looked so bright and quiet, the alderman of Skinner's Alley, a club of the true blue dye, as old as the Jacobite wars of the previous century, the corporation of shoemakers, or of tailors, or the Freemasons, or the musical clubs, loved to dine at the stately hour of five, and deliver their jokes, sentiments, songs, and wisdom on a pleasant summer's evening. Alas, the inn is as clean gone as the guests. A dream of the shadow of smoke lately too came down the old salmon house so called from the blazonry of that noble fish upon its painted signboard at the other end of the town that with a couple of more wheeled out at right angles from the line of the broad street and directly confronting the passenger from dublin gave to it something of the character of a square and just left room for the high road and martin's row to slip between its flank and the orchard that overtopped the river wall well it is gone i blame nobody i suppose it was quite rotten in that the rats would soon have thrown up their lease of it in that it was taken down in short chiefly as one of the players said of old drury to prevent the inconvenience of its coming down of itself. Still a peevish but harmless old fellow, who hates change, and would wish things to stay as they were just a little, till his own great change comes, who haunts the places where his childhood was passed, and reverences the homeliest relics of bygone generations, may be allowed to grumble a little, at the impertinences of improving proprietors with a taste for accurate parallelograms and pale new brick then there was the village church with its tower dark and rustling from base to summit with thick-piled bowering ivy the royal arms cut in bold relief in the broad stone over the porch where pray is that stone now the memento of its old viceregal dignity. Where is the elevated pew? Where many a lord lieutenant in point and gold lace and thundercloud periwig, 
satan awful isolation and listened to orthodox and loyal sermons and took french rapi whence too he stepped forth between the files of the guard of honour of the royal irish artillery from the barrack over the way in their courtly uniform white scarlet and blue cocked hats and cues and ruffles presenting arms into his emblazoned coach and six with hanging footmen as wonderful as cinderella's and outriders outblazing the liveries of the troops and rolling grandly away in sunshine and dust the ecclesiastical commissioners have done their office here the tower indeed remains with half its antique growth of ivy gone but the body of the church is new and i and perhaps an elderly fellow or two more miss the old-fashioned square pews distributed by a traditional tenure among the families and dignitaries of the town and vicinage who are they now and sigh for the queer old clumsy reading desk and pulpit grown dearer from the long and hopeless separation and wonder where the tables of the ten commandments in long gold letters of queen anne's date upon a vivid blue ground arched above and flanking the communion table with its tall thin rails and fifty other things that appeared to me in my nonage as stable as the earth and as sacred as the heavens are gone too as for the barrack of the royal irish artillery the great gate leading into the parade ground by the riverside and all that i believe the earth or rather that grim giant factory which is now the grand feature and centre of chapel is it throbbing all over with steam and whizzing with wheels and vomiting pitchy smoke has swallowed them up a line of houses fronting this old familiar faces still look blank and regretfully forth through their glassy eyes upon the changed scene how different the company they kept some ninety or a hundred years ago where is the mill too standing fast by the bridge the manorial appendage of the town which i loved in my boyhood for its gaunt and crazy aspect and dim interior whence the clapper kept time mysteriously to the drone of the mill sluice i think it is gone surely that confounded thing can't be my venerable old friend in masquerade but i can't expect you my reader polite and patient as you manifestly are to potter about with me all the summer day through this melancholy and mangled old town with a canopy of factory soot between your head and the pleasant sky one glance however before you go you will vouchsafe at the village tree that stalworth elm it has not grown an inch these hundred years it does not look a day older than it did fifty years ago i can tell you there he stands the same and yet a stranger in the place of his birth in the new order of things joyless busy transformed chapel is it listening as it seems to me always to the unchanged song and prattle of the river with his reveries and affections far away among bygone times and a buried race thou hast a story too to tell thou slighted and solitary sage if only the winds would steal it musically forth like the secret of mildus from the moaning reeds the palmy days of chapel is it were just about a hundred years ago and those days though i am jealous of their pleasant and kindly fame and specially for the preservation of the few memorials they have left behind were yet i may say in your ear with all their colour and adventure perhaps on the whole more pleasant to read about and dream of than they were to live in still their violence follies and hospitalities softened by distance and illuminated with a sort of barbaric splendour have long presented to my fancy the glowing and ever-shifting combinations upon which as on the red embers 
in a winter's gloaming i love to gaze propping my white head upon my hand in a lazy luxury of reverie from my own armchair while they drop ever and anon into new shapes and silently tell their winter's tales when your humble servant charles de cresseron the compiler of this narrative was a boy some fourteen years old how long ago precisely that was is nothing to the purpose tis enough to say he remembers what he then saw and heard a good deal better than what happened a week ago it came to pass that he was spending a pleasant week of his holidays with his benign uncle and godfather the curate of chapel is it on the second day of his or rather my sojourn i take leave to return to the first person there was a notable funeral of an old lady her name was darby and her journey to her last home was very considerable being made in a hearse by easy stages from her house at lisnabane in the county of sligo to the churchyard of chapel is it there was a great flat stone over that small parcel of the rector's freehold which the family held by a tenure not of lives but of deaths renewable for ever so that my uncle who was a man of an anxious temperament had little trouble in satisfying himself of the mirrings and identity of this narrow tenement to which lemuel mattox the sexton led him as straight and confidently as he could have done to the communion table my uncle therefore fiated the sexton's presentiment and the work commenced forthwith i don't know whether all boys have the same liking for horrors which i am conscious of having possessed i only know that i liked the churchyard and deciphering tombstones and watching the labours of the sexton and hearing the old world village talk that often got up over the relics when this particular grave was pretty nearly finished it lay from east to west a lot of earth fell out on the northern side where an old coffin had lain and good store of brown dust and grimy bones and the yellow skull itself came tumbling about the sexton's feet these fossils after his want he lifted decently with the point of his shovel and pitched into a little nook beside the great mound of mould on top be the powers o war here's a battered headpiece for yees said young tim moran who had picked up the cranium and was eyeing it curiously turning it round the while show it here tim let me look cried two or three neighbours getting round as quickly as they could oh murder said one oh be the powers of mal kelly cried another oh bloody wars exclaimed a third that poor fellow got no chance for his life at all at all said tim that was a bullet said one of them putting his finger into a clean circular aperture as large as a halfpenny and look at them two cracks oh murder there's only one oh i see you're right too begora each of them a wipe of a poker maddox had climbed nimbly to the upper level and taking the skull in his fist turned it about this way and that curiously but though he was no chicken his memory did not go far enough back to throw any light upon the matter could it be the matros that was shot in the year ninety as i often heard for striking his captain suggested a bystander oh that poor fellow's buried round by the north side of the church said maddox still eyeing the skull it could not be councillor gallagher that was kilt in the duel with colonel rock he was shot in the head but it could not be ach not at all why not mish the maddox no nor the matros neither this you see is a dry part of the yard here 
There is old Darby's coffin at the bottom down there, sound enough to stand on, as you see, with the plank, and he was buried in the year ninety-three. Why, look at the coffin this skull belongs to. Tis go into powder between your fingers. Tis nothing but tinder. I believe you're right, Mr. Maddox. For to be sure, tis longer underground by thirty years good, or maybe more. Just then, the slim figure of my tall, mild uncle, the curate, appeared, and his long, thin legs in black worsted stockings and knee breeches stepped reverently and lightly among the graves. The men raised their hats, and Maddox jumped lightly into the grave again, while my uncle returned their salute with a sad sort of smile, a regretful kindness, which he never exceeded in those solemn precincts. It was his custom to care very tenderly for the bones turned up by the sexton, and to wait with an awful solicitude until after reading of the funeral service. He saw them gently replaced, as nearly as might be, in their old bed, and discouraging any idle curiosity or levity respecting them, with a solemn rebuke which all respected. Therefore it was that so soon as he appeared the skull was, in Hibernian phrase, dropped like a hot potato, and the grave-digger betook himself to his spade so nimbly. "'Oh, Uncle Charles,' I said, taking his hand and leading him towards the foot of the grave, "'such a wonderful skull has come up. It is shot through with a bullet and cracked with a poker besides.' "'Tis true for him, your reverence. "'He was murdered twice over. "'Whoever he was, rest his soul.' "'And the sexton, who had nearly completed his work, "'got out of the grave again with a demure activity, "'and raising the brown relic with great reverence, "'out of regard for my good uncle, "'he turned it about slowly before the eyes of the curate, "'who scrutinized it, from a little distance, with a sort of melancholy horror. "'Yes, Lemuel,' said my uncle, still holding my hand, "'twas undoubtedly a murder, I indeed. He sustained two heavy blows beside that gunshot through the head. "'Twasn't gunshot, sir. Why, the hole is taking a grape-shot,' said an old fellow just behind my uncle in a pensioner's cocked hat, leggings, and long old-world red frock coat, speaking with a harsh, reedy voice, and a grim sort of reserved smile. I moved a little aside with a sort of thrill, to give him freer access to my uncle, in the hope that he might perhaps throw a light upon the history of this remarkable memorial. The old fellow had a rat-like grey eye, the other was hid under a black patch and there was a deep red scar across his forehead, slanting from the patch which covered the extinguished orb. His face was purplish, the tinge deepening towards the lumpish top of his nose, on the side of which stood a big wart, and he carried a great walking cane over his shoulder, and bore, as it seemed to me, an intimidating but caricatured resemblance to an old portrait of Oliver Cromwell, in my Whig grandfather's parlor. "'You don't think it a bullet, sir?' said my uncle, mildly, touching his hat, for coming of a military stock himself, he always treated an old soldier with uncommon respect. "'Why, please, your reverence,' replied the man, reciprocating his courtesy. "'I know it's not.' "'And what is it, then, my good man?' interrogated the sexton, as one in authority." and standing on his own dunghill. "'The trepan,' said the fogey, in the tone in which he had cried attention to a raw recruit without turning his head, and with a scornful momentary skew glance from his grey eye. "'And do you know whose skull that was, sir?' asked the curate. "'Aye, do I, sir. Well, with the same queer smile he answered, "'Come now, you're a grave-digger, my fine fellow,' he continued, accosting the sexton cynically. 
How long do you suppose that skull's been underground? Long enough, but not so long, my fine fellow, as yours has been above ground. Well, you're right there, for I seen him buried, and he took the skull from the sexton's hands, and I'll tell you more. There were some dry eyes, too, at his funeral. Ha, ha, ha. You were a resident in the town, then? said my uncle, who did not like the turn his recollections were taking. Ay, sir, that I was, he replied. See that broken tooth there? I forgot twas there, and the minute I seen it, I remembered it like this morning. I could swear to it. When he left, ay, and that sharp corner to it, hang him and he twirled the loose tooth the last but two of all its fellows from its socket and chucked it into the grave and were you you weren't in the army then inquired the curate who could not understand the sort of scoffing dislike he seemed to bear it be my faith i was so sir the royal irish artillery replied he promptly and in what capacity pursued his reverence drummer answered the mulberry-faced veteran ho oh, drummer that's a good time ago i dare say said my uncle looking on him reflectively well so it is not far off fifty years answered he he was a hard-headed codger he was but you see the sprig of shillelagh was too hard for him <laughs> and he gave the skull a smart knock with his walking cane as he grinned at it and wagged his head gently gently my good man said the curate placing his hand hastily upon his arm for the knock was harder than was needed for the purpose of demonstration you see sir at that time our colonel-in-chief was my lord blackwater continued the old soldier not that we often seen him for he lived in france mostly the colonel and second was general chatsworth and colonel stafford was lieutenant colonel and under him major o'neill captains four clough devereux barton and berg first lieutenants puttock delaney sackville and armstrong second lieutenants salt barber lilliman and pringle lieutenant fireworkers o'flaherty i beg your pardon interposed my uncle fireworkers did you say yes sir and what pray does a lieutenant fireworker mean why law bless you sir a fireworker twas his business to see that the men loaded sarved laid and fired the gun all right but that doesn't signify you see this old skull sir well twas a nine days wonder and the queerest business you ever heard tell of why sir the women was frightened out of their senses and the men puzzled out of their wits they were ha <laughs> ha and i can tell you all about it a mighty black and bloody business it was i i beg your pardon sir but i think yes the funeral has arrived and for the present i must bid you good morning and so my uncle hurried to the church where he assumed his gown and the solemn rite proceeded when all was over my uncle after his wont waited until he had seen the disturbed remains redeposited decently in their place and then having disrobed i saw him look with some interest about the churchyard and i knew twas in quest of the old soldier i saw him go away during the funeral i said i the old pensioner said my uncle peering about in quest of him and we walked through the town and over the bridge and we saw nothing of his cocked hat and red single-breasted frock and returned rather disappointed to tea i ran into the back room which commanded the churchyard 
in the hope of seeing the old fellow once more, with his cane shouldered, grinning among the tombstones in the evening sun. But there was no sign of him, or indeed any one else there, so I returned, just as my uncle, having made the tea, shut down the lid of his silver teapot with a little smack, and with a kind but absent smile upon me, he took his book, sat down, and crossed one of his thin legs over the other, and waited pleasantly until the delightful infusion should be ready for our lips, reading his old volume, and with his disengaged hand gently stroking his long shin-bone. In the meantime, I, who thirsted more for that tale of terror which the old soldier had all but begun, of which in that strangely battered skull I had only an hour ago seen, face to face, so grisly a memento, and of which, in all human probability, I never was to hear more, looked out dejectedly from the window, when whom should I behold marching up the street at slow time towards the salmon house but the identical old soldier, cocked hat, copper nose, great red single-breasted coat with its prodigious wide buttonholes, leggings, cane, and all, just under the village tree. Here he is! Oh, Uncle Charles, here he comes! I cried. Eh, the soldier, is he? said my uncle, tripping in the carpet in his eagerness, and all but breaking the window. So it is indeed. Run down, my boy, and beg him to come up. But by the time I had reached the street, which you may be sure was not very long, I found my uncle had got the window up and was himself inviting the old boy, who, having brought his left shoulder forward, thanked the curate, saluting soldier fashion, with his hand to his hat, palm foremost. I observed, indeed, that those grim old campaigners, who have seen the world, make it a principle to accept anything in the shape of a treat. If it's bad, why, it costs them nothing, and if it's good, so much the better. So up he marched, and into the room with soldierly self-possession, and being offered tea, preferred punch, and the ingredients were soon on the little round table by the fire, which the evening, being sharp, was pleasant, and the old fellow being seated, he brewed his nectar to his heart's content, and as we sipped our tea in pleased attention, he, after his own fashion, commenced the story, to which I listened with an interest which I confessed has never subsided. Many years after, as will sometimes happen, a flood of light was unexpectedly poured over the details of his narrative. On my coming into possession of the diary, curiously minute, and the voluminous correspondence of Rebecca, sister of General Chatsworth, with whose family I had the honor to be connected, and this journal to me, with my queer cat-like affection for this old village, a perfect treasure, and the interminable bundles of letters, sorted and arranged so neatly with little abstracts of their contents in red ink, in her own firm thin hand upon the covers, from all and to all manner of persons, for the industrious lady made fair copies of all the letters she wrote, formed for many years my occasional and always pleasant winter night's reading. I wish I could infuse their spirit into what I'm going to tell, and above all, that I could inspire my readers with ever so little of the peculiar interest with which the old town has always been tinted and saddened to my eye. My boyish imagination, perhaps kindled all the more at the story, by reason of it being a good deal connected with the identical old house in which we three my dear uncle, my idle self, and the queer old soldier, were then sitting. But wishes are as vain as regrets, so I'll just do my best, bespeaking your attention and submissively abiding your judgment. End of Prologue Recording by John Brandon
Chapter One of the House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. The Rector's Night Walk to His Church. A.D. 1767. In the beginning of the month of May. I mention it because, as I said, I write from memoranda. An awfully dark night came down on Chapel Izzard and all the country round. I believe there was no moon, and the stars had been quite put out under the wet blanket of the night, which impenetrable muffler overspread the sky with a funereal darkness. There was a little of that sheet lightning early in the evening, which betokened sultry weather. The clouds, column after column, came up sullenly over the Dublin mountains, rolling themselves from one horizon to the other into one black dome of vapor, their slow but steady motion contrasting with the awful stillness of the night. There was a weight in the atmosphere, and a sort of undefined menace brooding over the little town as if unseen crime or danger some mystery of iniquity was stealing into the heart of it and the disapproving heavens scowled a melancholy warning that morning old sally the rector's housekeeper was disquieted she had dreamed of making the great four-post state bed with the dark green damask curtains a dream that betokened some coming trouble it might to be sure be ever so small it had once come with no worse result than dr walsingham's dropping his purse containing something under a guinea in silver over the side of the ferry-boat but again it might be tremendous the omen hung over them doubtful a large square letter with a great round seal as big as a crown piece addressed to the rev hugh walsingham doctor of divinity at this house by the bridge and chapel is it had reached him in the morning and plainly troubled him he kept the messenger a good hour awaiting his answer and just at two o'clock the same messenger returned with a second letter but this time a note sufficed for reply twill seem ungracious said the doctor knitting his brows over his closed folio in the study but i cannot choose but walk clear in my calling before the lord how can i honestly pronounce hope when in my mind there is nothing but fear let another do it if he see his way i do enough in being present as tis right i should it was indeed a remarkably dark night a rush and downpour of rain the doctor stood just under the porch of the stout brick house of king william's date which was then the residence of the worthy rector of chapel is it with his great surt out and cape on his leggings buttoned up and his capacious leather overalls pulled up and strapped over these and his broad-leaved hat tied down over his wig and ears with a mighty silk kerchief i dare say he looked absurd enough but it was the woman's doing who always upon emergencies took the doctor's wardrobe in hand old sally with her kind mild grave face and grey locks stood modestly behind in the hall and pretty lilius his only child gave him parting kiss and her last grand charge about his shoes and other exterior toggery in the porch and he patted her cheek with a little fond laugh taking old john tracy's the butler's arm john carried a handsome horn lantern which flashed now on a roadside bush now on the discolored battlements of the bridge and now on a streaming window they stepped out there were no umbrellas in those days splashing among the wide and widening pools while sally and lilius stood in the porch 
holding candles for full five minutes after the doctor and his jack-o'-lantern as he called honest john whose arm and candle always befriended him in his night excursions had got round the corner through the back bow window of the phoenix there pealed forth faint in the distance and rain a solemn royal ditty piped by the tuneful alderman of skinner's alley and neither unmusical nor somehow uncongenial with the darkness and the melancholy object of the doctor's walk the chant being rather monastic wild and dirge-like it was a quarter past ten and no other sound of life or human neighbourhood was stirring if secrecy were an object it was well secured by the sable sky and the steady torrent which rolled down with electric weight and perpendicularity making all nature sound with one long hush shh 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 deluging the broad street and turning the channels and gutters into mimic mill-streams which snorted and hurtled headlong through their uneven beds and round the corners towards the turbid liffey which battered all over with rain muddy and sullen reeled its way towards the sea rolling up to the heavens an aspect black as their own as they passed by the phoenix a little rivulet by the way was spouting down from the corner of the sign and indeed the night was such as might have well caused that suicidal fowl to abandon all thoughts of self-incremation and submit to an unprecedented death by drowning there was no idle officer or lounging waiter upon the threshold military and civilians were all snug in their quarters that night and the inn except for the alderman in the back parlour was doing no business the door was nearly closed and only let out a tall narrow slice of candle light upon the lake of mud over every inch of which the rain was drumming the doctor's lantern glided by and then across the street and so leisurely along the footway by the range of lightless hall doors towards the salmon house also dark and so sharp round the corner and up to the churchyard gate which stood a little open as also the church door beyond as was evidenced by the feeble glow of a lantern from within i dare say old bob martin the sexton and grave mr irons the clerk were reassured when they heard the cheery voice of the rector hailing them by name there were now three candles in church but the edifice looked unpleasantly dim and went off at the far end into total darkness zekiel irons was a lean reserved fellow with a black wig and blue chin and something shy and sinister in his fizz i don't think he had encountered honest bob with much conversation from those thin lips of his during their grisly tete-a-tete among the black windows and the mural tablets that overhung the aisle but the rector had lots to say though deliberately and gravely still the voice was genial and inspiring and exercised the shadows that had been gathering stealthily around the lesser church functionaries mrs iron's tooth he learned was still bad but she was no longer troubled with that sour humour in her stomach there were sour humours alas still remaining enough and to spare as the clerk knew to his cost bob martin thanked his reverence the cold rheumatism in his hip was better irons the clerk replied he had brought two prayer books bob averred he could not be mistaken the old lady was buried in the near vault though it was forty years before he remembered it like last night they changed her into her lead coffin in the vault he and the undertaker together her own servants would not put a hand to her. She was buried in white satin and with her rings on her fingers. It was her fancy, and so ordered in her will. 
They said she was mad. He'd know her face again if he saw her. She had a long hooked nose, and her eyes were open, for, as he was told, she died in her sleep and was quite cold and stiff when they found her in the morning. He went down and saw the coffin today, half an hour after meeting his reverence. The rector consulted his great warming pan of a watch. It was drawing near eleven. He fell into a reverie and rambled slowly up and down the aisle with his hands behind his back and his dripping hat in them, swinging nearly to the flags. Now lost in the darkness, now emerging again, dim, nebulous in the foggy light of the lanterns. When his clerical portrait came near, he was looking down, with gathered brows, upon the flags, moving his lips and nodding, as if counting them, as was his way. The doctor was thinking all the time upon the one text. Why should this livid memorial of two great crimes be now disturbed, after an obscurity of twenty-one years, as if to jog the memory of scandal, and set the great throat of the monster baying once more at the old midnight horror? And as for that old house at Valley Fermat, why any one could have looked after it as well as he. Still he must live somewhere, and certainly this little town is quieter than the city, and the people on the whole very kindly, and by no means curious. This latter was a mistake of the doctor's, who, like other simple persons, was fond of regarding others as harmless repetitions of himself. And his sojourn will be, he says, but a matter of weeks, and the doctor's mind wandered back again to the dead, and forward to the remoter consequences of his guilt. So he heaved a heavy, honest sigh, and lifted up his head, and slackened his pace for a little prayer, and with that there came the rumble of wheels to the church door. End of chapter 1 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 2 of The House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. The Nameless Coffin. Three vehicles with flambeau and the clang and snorting of horses came close to the church porch, and there appeared suddenly, standing within the disk of candle light at the church door, before one would have thought there was time, a tall, very pale, and peculiar-looking young man, with very large, melancholy eyes, and a certain cast of evil pride in his handsome face. John Tracy lighted the wax candles which he had brought, and Bob Martin stuck them in the pockets at either side of the cushion on the ledge of the pew beside the aisle, where the prayer book lay open at the burial of the dead, and the rest of the party drew about the door, while the doctor was shaking hands very ceremoniously with that tall young man, who now stepped into the circle of light, with a short black mantle on and his black curls uncovered, and a certain air of high breeding in his movements. He reminded me painfully of him who is gone, whom we name not, said the doctor to pretty Lilius when he got home. He has his pale, delicately formed features, with a shadow of his evil passions too, and his mother's large, sad eyes. And an elderly clergyman in surplice, band and white wig with a hard yellow furrowed face hovered in like a white bird of night from the darkness behind and was introduced to dr walsingham and whispered for a while to mr irons and then to bob martin who had two short forms placed traversely in the aisle to receive what was coming and a shovel full of earth already 
so while the angular clergyman ruffled into the front of the pew with irons on one side a little in the rear both books open the plump little undertaker diffusing a steam from his moist garments making a prismatic halo round the candles and lanterns as he moved successfully by them whispered a word or two to the young gentleman mr mervyn the doctor called him and mr mervyn disappeared dr walsingham and john tracy got into contiguous seats and bob martin went out to lend a hand then came the shuffling of feet and the sound of hard tugging respiration and the suppressed energetic mutual directions of the undertaker's men who supported the ponderous coffin how much heavier it always seems to me that sort of load than any other of the same size a great oak shell the lid was outside in the porch mr tressels was unwilling to screw it down having heard that the entrance of the vault was so narrow and apprehending it might be necessary to take the coffin out so it lay its length with a dull weight on the two forms the lead coffin inside with its dusty black velvet was plainly much older there was a plate on it with two bold capitals and a full stop after each thus r d obiet may eleventh a d seventeen forty six Atot thirty-eight, and above this plain oval plate was a little bit of an ornament no bigger than a sixpence. John Tracy took it for a star. Bob Martin said he knew it to be a Freemason's order, and Mister Tressels, who almost overlooked it, thought it was nothing better than a fourpenny cherub. But Mister Irons, the clerk, knew that it was a coronet and when he heard the other theories thrown out being a man of few words he let them have it their own way and with his thin lips closed with their changeless and unpleasant character of an imperfect smile he coldly kept this little bit of knowledge to himself earth to earth rumble dust to dust tumble ashes to ashes rattle and now the coffin must go out again and down to its final abode the flag that closed the entrance of the vault had been removed but the descent of avernus was not facile the steps being steep and broken and the roof so low young mervyn had gone down the steps to see it duly placed a murky fiery light came up against which the descending figures looked black and cyclopean dr walsingham offered his brother clergyman his hospitalities but somehow that cleric preferred returning to town for his supper and his bed mervyn also excused himself it was late and he meant to stay that night at the phoenix and to-morrow designed to make his compliments in person to dr walsingham so the bilious clergyman from town climbed into the vehicle in which he had come and the undertaker and his troop got into the hearse and the morning coach and drove off demurely through the town but once a hundred yards or so beyond the turnpike at such a pace that they overtook the rollicking cortege of the aldermen of skinner's alley upon the dublin road all singing and hallooing and crowing and shouting scraps of banter at one another in which recreations these professional mourners forthwith joined them and they cracked screaming jokes and drove wild chariot races the whole way into town to the terror of the divine whose presence they forgot and whom though he shrieked from the window they never heard until getting out when the coach came to a standstill he gave mr tressels a piece of his mind and that in so alarming a sort that the jolly undertaker expressing a funereal concern at the accident was obliged to explain that all the noise came from the scandalous party they had so unfortunately overtaken 
and that the drunken blackguards had lashed and frightened his horses to a runaway pace, singing and hallooing in the filthy way he heard, it being a standing joke among such roisterers to put quiet tradesmen of this melancholy profession into a false and ridiculous position. He did not convince, but only half puzzled the ecclesiastic, who, muttering, Credat Judeus, turned his back upon Mr. Tressels with an angry whisk without bidding him good night. Dr. Walsingham, with the aid of his guide in the meantime, had reached the little garden in front of the old house, and the gay tinkle of a harpsichord and the notes of a sweet contralto suddenly ceased as he did so, and he said, smiling in the dark in a pleasant soliloquy, for he did not mind John Tracy. Old John was not in the way. She always hears my step, always. Little Lily, no matter how she's employed. And the hall door opened, and a voice that was gentle, and yet somehow very spirited and sweet, cried a loving and playful welcome to the old man. End of chapter 2 Recording by John Brandon Chapter Three of the House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Le Fanu. Mr. Mervyn in his inn. The morning was fine. The sun shone out with a yellow splendor. All nature was refreshed. A pleasant smell rose up from tree and flower and earth. The now dry pavement and all the row of village windows were glittering merrily. The sparrows twittered their lively morning gossip among the thick ivy of the old church tower. Here and there the village cock challenged his neighbor with high and vaunting crow and the bugle notes soared sweetly into the air from the artillery ground beside the river. Moore the barber was already busy making his morning circuit. Servant men and maids were dropping in and out at the baker's, and old Paul Delaney, in her weather-stained red hood, and neat little Kitty Lane, with her bright, young, careful face and white basket, were calling at the doors of their customers with new-laid eggs. Through half-opened hall doors you might see the powdered servant, or the sprightly maid, in her mob-cap, in hot haste, steaming away with the red japanned tea-kitchen into the parlor. The town of Chapel Isit, in short, was just sitting down to its breakfast. Mervyn, in the meantime, had had his solitary meal in the famous black parlor of the Phoenix, where the newspapers lay, and all comers were welcome. He was by no means a bad hero to look at, if such a thing were needed. His face was pale, melancholy, statuesque, and his large enthusiastic eyes suggested a story, and a secret, perhaps a horror. Most men, had they known all, would have wondered, with good Dr. Walsingham, why of all places in the world he should have chosen the little town where he now stood for even a temporary residence. It was not a perversity, but rather a fascination. His whole life had been a flight and a pursuit, a vain endeavor to escape from the evil spirit that pursued him, and a chase of a chimera. He was standing at the window, not indeed enjoying, as another man might, the quiet verdure of the scene and the fragrant air and all the mellowed sounds of village life, but lost in a sad and dreadful reverie, when in bounced little red-faced bustling Dr. Toole, the joke and the chuckle with which he had just requited the fat old barmaid still ringing in the passage. "'Stay here, sweetheart,' addressed to a dog squeezing by him, and which screeched out as he kicked it nearly round the doorpost. "'Hey, your most obedient, sir,' cried the doctor, with a short but grand bow, affecting surprise. 
though his chief object in visiting the back parlor at that moment was precisely to make a personal inspection of the stranger. "'Pray don't mind me, sir. Your whole breakfast ended, eh? Coffee not so bad. Sir, rather good coffee. I hold it at the Phoenix. Cream very choice, sir? I don't tell him so, though, a wink. It might not improve it, you know. I hope they gave you a... a... He peeped into the cream ewer, which he turned towards the light with a whisk. And no disputing the eggs, forty-eight hens in the poultry yard, and ninety ducks in Tresham's little garden, next door to Sturk's. They make a precious noise, I can tell you, when it showers. Stirk threatens to shoot em. He's the artillery surgeon here, and Tom Larkin said last night it's because they only dabble and quack, and two of a trade, you know. Ha, ha, ha! And what a night we had, dark as Erebus, pouring like pumps, by Jove. I'll remember it, I warrant you. Out on business, a medical man, you know, can't always choose and near meeting a bad accident, too. Anything in the paper, eh? Oh, I see. Sir, haven't read it? Well, and what do you think? A queer night for the purpose, eh? You'll say we had a funeral in the town last night, sir. Someone from Dublin. It was Tressel's men came out. The turnpike rogue, just round the corner there, one of the talkingest gossips in the town, and a confounded prying tattling place it is, I can tell you. Knows the driver, and Bob Martin, the sexton, you know, tells me there were two parsons, no less, hey? Cauliflowers in season, by Jove. Old Dr. Walsingham, our rector, a pious man, sir, and does a world of good, that is to say, relieves half the blackguards in the parish. Ha, <laughs> ha! And we're on the point of getting rid of them, but means well, only he's a little bit lazy and queer, you know, and that rancid raw-boned parson, Gillespie. How the plague did they pick him up? One of the mutes told Bob twas he. He's from Donegal. I know all about him. The sourest dog I ever broke bread with. And Mason, if you please by Jove, a prince pelican. He supped at the Grand Lodge after labor one night. You're not a Mason. I see. Tipped you the sign, and his face was so pinched and so yellow by Jupiter, I was near squeezing it into the punch bowl for a lemon. Ha, 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 hey! Mervyn's large eyes expressed a well-bred surprise. Dr. Toole paused for nearly a minute, as if expecting something in return, but it did not come. So the doctor started afresh, never caring for Mervyn's somewhat dangerous looks. Mighty pretty prospects about here, sir. The painters come out by dozens in the summer with their books and pencils and scratch away like so many Scotchmen. Ha, ha, ha. If you draw, sir, there's one prospect up the river by the mills. Upon my conscience, but you don't draw. No answer. A little, sir, maybe? Just for a maggot. I'll wager, like my good lady, Mrs. Toole. A nearer glance at his dress had satisfied Toole that he was too much of a macaroni for an artist, and he was thinking of placing him upon the Lord Lieutenant's staff. We've capital horses here. If you want to go on to Leipzig, where, this between ourselves and the reader, during the summer months His Excellency and Lady Townsend resided, and where, the old newspapers tell us, they kept a public day every Monday, and he had a levy, as usual, every Thursday. But this had no better success. If you design to stay over the day and care for shooting, we'll have some ball practice on Palmerstown Fairgreen today. Seven baronies to shoot for ten and five guineas. One o'clock, hey? At this moment... Major O'Neill of the Royal Irish Artillery, a small man, very neatly got up, and with a decidedly Malaysian cast of countenance, who said little but smiled agreeably. Gentlemen, you're most obedient. 
ha doctor how goes it anything new anything on the free man tool had scanned that paper and hummed out as he rumpled it over nothing very particular here's lady moira's ball fancy dresses all irish no masks a numerous appearance of the nobility and gentry upwards of five hundred persons a good many of your corps there major ay lord blackwater of course and the general and devereux and little puttock and stirk wasn't with a grin interrupted tool who bore that practitioner no good will a gentleman robbed by two footpads on chapel is it road on wednesday night of his watch and money together with his hat wig and cane and lies now in a dangerous state having been much abused one of them dressed in an old light-coloured coat wore a wig by jupiter major if i was in general chadsworth place with two hundred strapping fellows at my orders i'd get a commission from government to clear that road it's too bad sir we can't go in and out of town unless in a body after nightfall but at the risk of our lives the convivial doctor felt this public scandal acutely the bloody-minded miscreants i'd catch every living soul of them and burn them alive in tar barrels by jove here's old joe napper of dirty lanes dead plenty of dry eyes after him and stay here's another row and so he read on in the meantime stout tightly faced captain clough of the same corps and little dark hard-faced and solemn mr nutter of the mills lord castle mallard's agents came in and half a dozen more chiefly members of the club which met by night in the front parlour on the left opposite the bar where they entertained themselves with agreeable conversation cards backgammon draughts and an occasional song by dr tool who was a florid tenor and used to give them while gentle folks strut in silver and satins or a maiden of late had a merry design or some other such ditty with a recitation by plump little stage-stricken ensign puttock who in spite of his lisp gave rather spirited imitations of some of the players mossop sheridan macklin barry and the rest so mervyn the stranger by no means affecting this agreeable society took his cane and cocked hat and went out the dark and handsome apparition followed by curious glances from two or three pairs of eyes and a whispered commentary and criticism from tool so taking a meditative ramble in his majesty's park the phoenix and passing out at castle knock gate he walked up the river between the wooded slopes which make the valley of the liffey so pleasant and picturesque until he reached the ferry which crossing he at the other side found himself not very far from palmerstown through which village his return route to chapel is it lay end of chapter three recording by john brandon chapter four of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton le Fanu. chapter four the fair green of palmerstown there were half a dozen carriages and a score of lead horses outside the fair green a precious lot of ragamuffins and a good resort to the public-house opposite and the gate being open the artillery band rousing all the echoes round with harmonious and exhilarating thunder within an occasional crack of a brown bess with a puff of white smoke over the hedge being heard and the cheers of the spectators and sometimes a jolly chorus of many-toned laughter all mixed together and carried on with a pleasant running hum of voices 
Mervyn the stranger, reckoning on being unobserved in the crowd, and weary of the very solitude he courted, turned to his right, and so found himself upon the renowned fair green of Palmerstown. It was really a gay rural sight. The circular target stood, with its bright concentric rings in conspicuous isolation, about a hundred yards away against the green slope of the hill. The competitors, in their best Sunday suits, some armed with muskets and some with fowling pieces, for they were not particular, and with bunches of ribbons fluttering in their three-cornered hats and sprigs of gay flowers in their breasts, stood in the foreground in an irregular cluster, while the spectators, in pleasant disorder, formed two broad and many-colored parterres, broken into little groups and separated by a wide, clear sweep of green sward, running up from the marksman to the target. In the luminous atmosphere, the men of those days showed bright and gay. Such fine scarlet and gold waistcoats, such sky-blue and silver, such pea-green lute-strings and pink silk linings, and flashing buckles and courtly wigs or becoming powder, went pleasantly with a brilliant costume of the stately dames and smiling lassies. There was a pretty sprinkling of uniforms, too, the whole picture of gentle motion, and the bugles and drums of the Royal Irish Artillery filling the air with inspiring music. All the neighbors were there, merry little Dr. Toole, in his grandest wig and gold-headed cane, with three dogs at his heels. He seldom appeared without this sort of train, sometimes three, sometimes five, sometimes as many as seven, and his hearty voice was heard bawling at them by name as he sauntered through the town of a morning, and theirs occasionally in short screeches, responsive to the touch of his cane. Now it was, Fairy, you savage, let that pig alone. A yell and a scuffle, Juno, drop it, you slut, or Caesar, you blackguard, where are you going? Look at Stirk there with his lordship, said Toole to the fair Magnolia, with a wink and a nod and a sneering grin. Good-natured dog, that. Ha, <laughs> ha, you'll find he'll oust Nutter at last and get the agency. That's what he's driving at. Always undermining somebody. Dr. Stirk and Lord Castle Mallard were talking apart on the high ground, and the artillery surgeon was pointing with his cane at distant objects. A lay of fifty, he's picking holes in Nutter's management this moment. I'm afraid there was some truth in the theory, and Toole, though he did not remember to mention it, had an instinctive notion that Stirk had an eye upon the civil practice of the neighborhood, and was mediating a retirement from the army and a serious invasion of his domain. Stirk and Toole, behind backs, did not spare one another. Toole called Stirk a horse doctor and the smuggler, in reference to some affair about French brandy, never made quite clear to me, but in which I believe Stirk was really not to blame, and Stirk called him that drunken little apothecary, for Toole had a boy who compounded, under the rose, his draughts, pills, and powders in the back parlor, and sometimes that smutty little ballad singer, or that whiskey-fied dog fancier Toole. There was no actual quarrel, however. They met freely, told one another the news. Their mutual disagreeabilities were administered guardedly, and on the whole they hated one another in a neighborly way. Fat, short, radiant General Chatsworth, in full artillery uniform, was there, smiling and making little speeches to the ladies, and bowing stiffly from his hips upward, his great cue playing all the time up and down his back, and sometimes so near the ground when he stood erect and threw back his head, that Toole, seeing Juno eyeing the appendage rather viciously, thought it prudent to cut her speculations short with a smart kick. His sister Rebecca, tall, erect, with grand lace, in a splendid stiff brocade, and with a fine fan, 
was certainly five and fifty but still wonderfully fresh and sometimes had quite a pretty little pink colour perfectly genuine in her cheeks command sat in her eye and energy on her lip but though it was imperious and restless there was something provokingly likable and even pleasant in her face her niece gertrude the general's daughter was also tall graceful and i am told perfectly handsome be the powers she's mighty handsome observed lieutenant fireworker o'flaherty who being a little stupid did not remember that such a remark was not likely to pleasure the charming magnolia mcnamara to whom he had transferred the adoration of a passionate but somewhat battered heart they must not see with my eyes that think so said mag with a disdainful toss of her head they say she's not twenty but i'll wager a pipe of claret she's something to the back of it said o'flaherty mending his hand why bless your innocence she'll never see five and twenty and a bit to spare sniggered miss mag who might more truly have told the tale of herself who's that pretty young man my lord castle mallard is introducing to her and old chatsworth the commendation was a shot at poor old flaherty hey so my lord knows him says toole very much interested why that's mr mervyn that's stopping at the phoenix a mervyn i saw it on his dressing-case see how he smiles ay she simpers like a fermity kettle said scornful miss mag they're very grand to-day the chatworths with them their two livery men behind them threw in o'flaherty accommodating his remarks to the spirit of his lady love that young buck's a man of consequence tool rattled on miss does not smile on everybody ay she looks as if butter would not melt in her mouth but a warrant cheese won't choke her magnolia laughed out with angry eyes magnolia's fat and highly painted parent poor bragging good-natured cunning foolish mrs mcnamara the widow joined with a venomous wheeze in the laugh those who suppose that all this rancor was produced by mere feminine emulations and jealousy do these ladies of the ancient sept mcnamara foul wrong mrs mac on the contrary had a fat and genial soul of her own and magnolia was by no means a particularly ungenerous rival in the lists of love but aunt rebecca was hoity-toity upon the mcnamaras whom she would never consent to more than half know seeing them with difficulty often failing to see them together though magnolia's stature and activity did not always render that easy to-day for instance when the firing was brisk and some of the ladies uttered pretty little timid squalls miss mcnamara not only stood fire like brick but with her own fair hands cracked off a firelock and was more complimented and applauded than all the marksmen beside although she shot most dangerously wide and was much nearer hitting old arthur's slow then that respectable gentleman who waved his hat and smirked gallantly was it all aware aunt rebecca notwithstanding all this and although she looked straight at her from a distance of only ten steps yet she could not see that large and highly coloured heroine and magnolia was so incensed at her serene impertinence that when gertrude afterwards smiled and curtsied twice she only held her head the higher and flung a flashing defiance from her fine eyes right at that unoffending virgin everybody knew that miss rebecca chatsworth ruled supreme at belmont with a docile old general and a niece so young she had less resistance to encounter than perhaps her ardent soul would have relished fortunately for the general it was only now and then that aunt becky took a whim to command the royal irish artillery she had other hobbies just as odd though not quite so scandalous it had struck her active mind that such of the ancient women of chapel is as were destitute of letters 
mendicants and the like, should learn to read. Twice a week her old woman's school, under the energetic lady's presidency, brought together its muster-roll of rheumatism, paralysis, dim eyes, bothered ears, and invincible stupidity. Over the fireplace, in large black letters, was the legend, Better Late Than Never. And out came the horn-books and spectacles, and to it they went with their A, B, A, B, etc., and plenty of wheezing and coughing. Aunt Becky kept good fires, and served out a mess of bread and broth, along with some pungent ethics to each of her hopeful old girls. In winter she further encouraged them with a flannel petticoat apiece, and there was besides a monthly dole, so that although after a year there was perhaps on the whole no progress in learning, the affair wore a tolerably encouraging aspect, for the academy had increased in numbers, and two old fellows, liking the notion of the broth and the sixpence a month, one a barber, Will Potts, ruined by a shake in his right hand, the other a drunken pensioner, Phil Doolan, with a wooden leg, petitioned to be enrolled, and were accordingly admitted. Then Aunt Becky visited the jails, and had a knack of picking up the worst characters there and had generally two or three discharged felons on her hands. Some people said she was a bit of a Voltarian, but unjustly, for though she now and then came out with a bouncing social paradox, she was a good, bitter churchwoman. So she was liberal and troublesome, off-handed and dictatorial, not without good nature, but administering her benevolences somewhat tyrannically, and for the most part, doing more or less of positive mischief in the process. And now the general, old Chadsworth, as the scornful Magnolia called him, drew near, with his benevolent smirk and his stiff bows, and all his good-natured formalities, for the general had no notion of ignoring his good friend and officer, Major O'Neill, or his sister or niece. And so he made up to Mrs. McNamara, who arrested a narrative in which he was demonstrating to O'Flaherty the general's lineal descent from old Chatsworth, an army tailor in Queen Anne's time, and his cousinship to a live butter dealer in Cork, and spicing her little history with not a nice epigram on his uncle the counsellor by Dr. Swift, which he delivered with a vicious chuckle in the fireworker's ear, who also laughed, though he did not quite see the joke, and said, Oh, ho, oh, oh, ho, murder! The good Mrs. Mack received the general haughtily and slightly, and Miss Magnolia, with a short courtesy and a little toss of her head, and up went her fan, and she giggled something in Toole's ear, who grinned and glanced uneasily out of the corner of his shrewd little eye at the unsuspicious general, and on to Aunt Rebecca, for it was very important to Dr. Toole to stand well at Belmont, so seeing that Miss Mag was disposed to be vicious, and not caring to be compromised by her tricks, he whistled and bawled to his dogs, and with a jolly smirk and flourish of his cocked hat, off he went to seek other adventures. Thus was their feud and malice between two houses, and Aunt Rebecca's wrong-headed freak of cutting the McNamaras, for it was not snobbery, and she could talk for hours on band days publicly and familiarly with scrubby little Mrs. Toole, involved her innocent relations in scorn and ill-will, for this sort of offence, like Chinese treason, is not visited on the arch-offender only, but according to a scale of consanguinity, upon his kith and kin. The criminal is minced, his sons lashed, his nephews reduced to cutlets, his cousins to joints, and so on. None of the family quite escapes, and seeing the bitter reprisals provoked by this kind of uncharity, fiercer 
and more enduring by much than any begotten of more tangible wrongs christian people who pray lead us not into temptation and repeat blessed are the peacemakers will on the whole do wisely to forbear practising it as handsome slender captain devereux with his dark face and great strange earnest eyes and that look of intelligence so racy and peculiar that gave him a sort of enigmatical interest stepped into the fair green the dark blue glance of poor nan glenn of palmerstown from under her red sunday riding hood followed the tall dashing graceful apparition with a stolen glance of wild loyalty and admiration poor nan with thy fun and thy rascalities thy strong affections and thy fatal gift of beauty where does thy head rest now handsome captain devereux gypsy devereux as they called him for his clear dark complexion was talking a few minutes later to lilius walsingham o oh, pretty lilius o oh, true lady i never saw the pleasant crayon sketch that my mother used to speak of but the tradition of thee has come to me so bright and tender with its rose and violet tints and merry melancholy dimples that i see thee now as then with the dew of thy youth still on thee and sigh as i look as if on a lost early love of mine i am out of conceit with myself he said i'm so idle and useless i wish that were all i wish myself better but i'm such a weak coxcomb a father confessor might keep me nearer to my duty someone to scold and exhort me perhaps if some charitable lady would take me in hand something might be made of me still there was a vein of seriousness in this reverie which amused the young lady for she had never heard anything worse of him very young ladies seldom do hear the worst than that he had played once or twice rather high shall i ask gertrude chatsworth to speak to her aunt rebecca said lilius slyly suppose you attend her school in martin's row with better late than never over her chimney-piece there are two pupils of your own sex you know and you might sit on the bench with poor potts and good old doolan thank you miss lilius he answered with a bow and a little laugh as it seemed just the least bit in the world piqued i know she would do it zealously but neither so well nor so wisely as others might i wish i dare ask you to lecture me i said the young lady oh yes i forgot she went on merrily five years ago when i was a little girl you once called me dr walsingham's curate i was so grave do you remember she did not know how much obliged devereux was to her for remembering that poor little joke and how much the handsome lieutenant would have given at that instant to kiss the hand of the grave little girl of five years ago i was a more impudent fellow then he said than i am now won't you forget my old impertinences and allow me to make atonement and be your your very humble servant now she laughed not my servant but you know i can't help you being my parishioner and as such surely i may plead in humble right to your counsels and reproof yes you shall lecture me i'll bear it from none but you and the more you do it the happier at least you make me he said alas if my censure is pleasant to you tis a certain sign it can do you no good it shall do me good and it be never so bitter and so true it will be pleasant to me too he answered with an honest and very peculiar light in his dark strange eyes and after a little pause i'll tell you why 
just because I had rather you remembered my faults than that you did not remember me at all. But tis not my business to make people angry. More likely you should make me sad, or perhaps happy. That is to say, better. I think you'd like to see your parish improve. So I would, but by means of my example, not my preaching. No, I leave that to wiser heads, to the rector, for instance. And she drew closer to the dear old man with a quick fond glance of such proud affection, for she thought the sun never shone upon his like as made Devereux sigh a little unconscious sigh. The old man did not hear her. He was too absorbed in his talk. He only felt the pressure of his darling's little hand and returned it after his wont with a gentle squeeze of his cassocked arm while he continued the learned essay he was addressing to young, queer, erudite, simple Dan Loftus on the descent of the Desi branch of the Desmonds. There was, by the by, a rumor, I know not how true, that these two sages were concocting between them, beside their folios, on the castle of Chapel Isit, an interminable history of Ireland. Devereux was secretly chafed at the sort of invisible but insufferable resistance which pretty Lilius Walsingham, as it seemed, unconsciously opposed to his approaches to a nearer and tenderer sort of trifling. The little siren. There are air-drawn circles round her which I cannot pass, and why should I? How is it? that she interests me and yet repels me so easily. And when I came here first, he continued aloud, you were, oh dear, how mere a child, hardly eleven years old. How long I've known you, Miss Lilius, and yet how formal you are with me. There was reproach almost fierce in his eye, though his tones were low and gentle. Well, he said, with an odd, changed little laugh, you did commit yourself at first. You spoke against card-playing, and I tell you frankly, I mean to play a great deal more, and a great deal higher than I've ever done before, and so adieu. He did not choose to see the little motion, which indicated that she was going to shake hands with him, and only bowed the lower, and answered her grave smile, which seemed to say, Now you are vexed with another little laugh, and turned gaily away, and so was gone. She thinks she has wounded me, and she thinks, I suppose, that I can't be happy away from her. I'll let her see I can. I shan't speak to her, no, nor look at her for a month. The Chatsworths, by this time, as well as others, were moving away, and that young Mr. Mervyn, more remarked upon than he suspected, walked with them to the gate of the fair green. As he passed, he bowed low to good Parson Walsingham, who returned his salute, not unkindly, that never was, but very gravely, and with his gentle and thoughtful blue eyes followed the party sadly on their way. Aye, there he goes, Mervyn, well, so, so, pray heaven, sorrow and a blight follow him not into this place. The rector murmured to himself and sighed, still following him with his glance. Little Lilius, with her hand within his arm, wondered, as she glanced upward into that beloved face, what could have darkened it with a look so sad and anxious? and then her eyes also followed the retreating figure of the pale young man, with a sort of interest, not quite unmixed with uneasiness. End of chapter 4 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 5 of The House by the Churchyard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. Chapter 5 How the Royal Irish Artillery Entertained Some of the Neighbors at Dinner. If I stuck at a fib as little as some historians, I might easily tell you who won the prizes at their shooting on Palmerstown Green. But the truth is, I don't know. My grand uncle could have told me, for he had a marvelous memory, but he died, a pleasant old gentleman of fourscore and upwards, when I was a small urchin. I remember his lively old face, his powdered bald head and pigtail, his slight erect figure, and how merrily he used to play the fiddle for his juvenile posterity to dance to. But I was not of an age to comprehend the value of this thin, living volume of old lore or to question the oracle well it can't be helped now and the papers i've got are silent upon the point but there were jollifications to no end both in palmerstown and chapel is it that night and declaratory conversations rising up in the street at very late hours and singing and hurrooing along the moonlit roads there was a large and pleasant dinner party, too, in the mess room of the Royal Irish Artillery. Lord Castle Mallard was there in the place of honor, next to jolly old General Chatsworth, and the worthy rector, Dr. Walsingham, and Father Roach, the dapper, florid little priest of the parish, with his silk waistcoat and well placed paunch, and his keen relish for funny stories side dishes and convivial glass and dan loftus that simple meek semi-barbarous young scholar his head in a state of chronic dishevelment his harmless little round light blue eyes pinkish from late night reading generally betraying the absence of his vagrant thoughts and i know not what of goodness as well as queerness in his homely features Good Dr. Walsingham, indeed, in his simple benevolence, had helped the strange, kindly creature through college, and had a high opinion of him, and a great delight in his company. They were both much given to books, and according to their lights, zealous archaeologists. They had got hold of Chapel Izzard Castle, a good tough enigma. It was a theme they never tired of. Loftus had already two folios of extracts, copied from all the records to which Dr. Walsingham could procure him access. They could not have worked harder, indeed, if they were getting up evidence to prove their joint title to Lord Castle Mallard's estates. This pursuit was a bond of close sympathy between the rector and the student, and they spent more time than appeared to his parishioners quite consistent with sanity in the paddock by the river pacing up and down and across poking sticks into the earth and grubbing for old walls underground loftus moreover was a good irish scholar and from celtic m s s had elicited some cross lights upon his subject not very bright or steady i allow but enough to delight the rector and inspire him with a tender reverence for the indefatigable and versatile youth who was devoting to the successful equitation of their hobby so many of his hours and so much of his languages labor and brains lord castle mallard was accustomed to be listened to and was not aware how confoundedly dull his talk sometimes was it was measured and dreamy and every way slow he was entertaining the courteous old general at the head of the table with an oration in praise of paul dangerfield a wonderful man immensely wealthy the cleverest man of his age he might have been anything he pleased his lordship really believed his english property would drop to pieces if dangerfield retired from its management and he was vastly obliged to him inwardly for retaining the agency even for a little time longer he was coming over to visit the irish estates 
perhaps to give nutter a wrinkle or two he was a bachelor and his lordship averred would be a prodigious great match for some of our irish ladies chapel is it would be his headquarters while in ireland no he was not sure he rather thought he was not of the thurley family and so on for a mighty long time but though he tired them prodigiously he contrived to evoke before their mind's eyes a very gigantic though somewhat hazy figure and a good deal stimulated the interest with which a new arrival was commonly looked for in that pleasant suburban village there is no knowing how long lord castle mallard might have prosed upon this theme had he not been accidentally cut short and himself laid fast asleep in his chair without his or anybody else's intending it for overhearing during a short pause in which he sipped some claret surgeon stirk applying some very strong and indeed frightful language to a little pamphlet upon magnetism a subject then making a stir as from a much earlier date it was periodically done to the present day he languidly asked dr walsingham his opinion upon the subject now dr walsingham was a great reader of out-of-the-way lore and retained it with a sometimes painful accuracy and he forthwith began there is my lord castle mallard a curious old tract of the learned van helmont in which he says as near as i can remember his words that magnetism is a magical faculty which lieth dormant in us by the opiate of primitive sin and therefore stands in need of an exciter which exciter may be either good or evil but is more frequently satan himself by reason of some previous opignoration or compact with witches the power indeed is in the witch not conferred by him but this perspellius or protean impostor these are his words will not suffer her to know that it is of her own natural endowment though for the present charmed into somnolent inactivity by the narcotic of primitive sin i verily believe that a fair description none of your poetical balderdash but an honest plodding description of a perfectly comfortable bed and of the process of going to sleep would judiciously administered soon after dinner overpower the vivacity of any tranquil gentleman who loves a nap after that meal gently draw the curtains of his senses and extinguish the bedroom candle of his consciousness in the doctor's address and quotation there was so much about some nullancy and narcotics and lying dormant and opiates that my lord castle mallard's senses forsook him and he lost as you my kind reader must all the latter portion of the doctor's lullaby i'd give half i'm pothetted of thur and all my prospect in life lisped vehemently plump little lieutenant puddock in one of those stage frenzies to which he was prone to be the firth alexander on the borth between ourselves puddock was short and fat very sentimental and a little bit of a gourmet his desk stuffed with amorous sonnets and receipts for side dishes he always in love and often in the kitchen or under the rose he loved to direct the cooking of critical little plats very good-natured rather literal very courteous a chevalier indeed sans reproche he had a profound faith in his genius for tragedy but those who liked him best could not help thinking that his plump cheeks round little light eyes his lisp and a certain lackadaisical though solemn expression of surprise which nature in one of our jocular moods seemed to have fixed upon his countenance were against his shining in that walk of the drama he was blessed too with a pleasant belief in his acceptance with the fair sex but had a real one with his comrades who knew his absurdities and his virtues and laughed at and loved him but hang it 
there's no youth in doing things by halves melpomene's the most jealous of the muses i tell you if you stand well in her graith by jove there you must give yourself up to her body and thole how the dooth can a fellow that's out at drill at hicth in the mornin and all day with his head filled with tactith and gunnery and 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 farced pigeons and lovely women said devereux and such dry professional matters continued he without noticing perhaps hearing the interpolation how can he possibly have a chance against geniuses no doubt vastly superior by nature puttock the rogue believed no such thing but who devote themselves to the study of art incessantly exclusively and and impossible said o'flaherty there now was tommy shycock of bally Baisley that larned himself to balance a fiddlestick on his chin and the young ladies especially miss katie mahoney used to be all around him in the ballroom at Thralee, looking wonderin and laughin and i that had twished his brains could not come round it though i got up every mornin for a month to four o'clock and was obliged to give over by raisin of a sort of a squint i was gettin by looking continually at the fiddlestick i began with a double bass the way he did it's it that was the powerful fatigue and exercise i can tell you two blessed hours a day regular practice besides an odd half hour now and again but three mortial hours it took him to larn it and drilled a dimple in his chin you could put a marrow fat pay in practice resumed puttock i need not spell his lisp study time to devote industry in great things as in small there's the secret nature to be sure ay nature to be sure we must sustain nature dear puttock so pass the bottle said devereux who liked his glass be the powers mr puttock if i had half your genius for play actin persisted o'flaherty nothing would keep me from the boards of smock alley playhouse in cog i mean of course there's that wonderful little mr garrick why he's the talk of the three kingdoms as long as i can remember and making his thousand pounds a week coining big gannies and he can't be much taller than you for he's contemptibly small i'm the taller of the two said little puttock haughtily who had made inquiries and claimed half an inch over rocious honestly let us hope but this is building castles in the air joking apart however i do confess i should dearly love just for a maggot to play two parts richard the third and tamerlane was not that the part you spoke that sympathetic speech out of for me before dinner no that was just as greedy said devereux ay so it was was it that smothered his wife with a pudding clout persisted devereux no with a poo ah uh, you know and stabbed himself continued o'flaherty with a larding pin tis written in good italian ah not at all it isn't italian but english i'm thinking of a pillar puttock you know the black rascal well english or italian tragedy or comedy said devereux who liked puttock and would not annoy him and saw he was hurt by othello's borrowing his properties from the kitchen i venture to say you were well entertained and for my part sir there are some characters in farce puttock was really highly diverting in which i prefer puttock to any player i ever saw oh ho ho laughed poor little puttock with a most gratified derisiveness for he cherished in secret a great admiration for devereux and so they talked stage talk puttock lifting away grand and garrulous o'flaherty the illiterate blundering in with sincere applause and devereux sipping his claret and dropping a quiet saucy word now and again 
i shall never forget mrs sibber's countenance in that last scene you know in the orphan monomia you know devereux and the table being by this time in high chat and the chairs a little irregular Hoddick slipped off his and addressing himself to devereux and o'flaherty just to give them a notion of mrs sibber began with a countenance the most woebegone and in a piping falsetto when i'm laid low in the grave and quite forgotten mona mia dies at the end of the speech as the reader may not be aware but when puttock came to the line when i'm dead as presently i shall be all mrs sibber's best points being still to come the little lieutenant's heel caught in the edge of the carpet as he sailed with an imaginary hoop on grandly backward and in spite of a surprising flick flack cut in the attempt to recover his equipoise down came the orphan together with a table load of spoons and plates with a crash that stopped all conversation lord castle mallard waked up with a snort and a hello gentlemen it's only poor dear monomia general said devereux with a melancholy bow in reply to a fiery and startled stare darted to the point by that gallant officer hey hey said his lordship brightening up and gazing grassily round with a wan smile and i fancy he thought a lady had somehow introduced herself during his nap and was pleased for he admired the sex if there's any recitation going on i think it had better be for the benefit of the company said the general a little surly and looking full upon the plump monomia who was arranging his frill and hair and getting a little awkwardly into his place and i think twould be no harm lieutenant puttock my dear said his father roach testily for he had been himself frightened by the crash if you'd die a little easier the next time puttock began to apologize never mind said the general recovering let's fill our glasses my lord castle mallard they tell me this claret is a pretty wine a very pretty wine said my lord and suppose my lord we ask these gentlemen to give us a song i say gentlemen there are fine voices among you will some gentlemen oblige the company with a song mr loftus sings a very fine song i'm told said captain clough with a wink at father roach ay cried roach backing up the joke a good old one and not yet quite off the hooks mr loftus sings i'll take my davy i've heard him loftus was shy simple and grotesque and looked like a man who could not sing a note so when he opened his eyes looked round and blushed there was a general knocking of glasses and a very flattering clamour for mr loftus's song but when silence came to the surprise of the company he submitted though with manifest trepidation and told them that he would sing as the company desired it was a song from a good old writer upon fasting in lent and was in fact a reproof to all hypocrisy hereupon there was a great ringing of glasses and a jolly round of laughter rose up in the cheer that welcomed the announcement father roach looked queer and disconcerted and shot a look of suspicion at devereux for poor dan loftus had in truth hit that divine straight in a very tender spot the fact is father roach was as irish priests were sometimes then a bit of a sportsman he and Toole used occasionally to make mysterious excursions to the dublin mountains he had a couple of mighty good dogs which he lent freely being a good-natured fellow he liked good living and jolly young fellows and was popular among the officers who used to pop in freely enough at his reverence's green hall door whenever they wanted a loan of his dogs or to take counsel of the ghostly father whose opinion was valued more highly even than tools upon the case of a sick dog or a lame nag 
well one morning only a few weeks before devereux and toole together had looked in on some such business upon his reverence a little suddenly and found him eating a hare by all the gods it was hare pie in the middle of lent it was at breakfast his dinner was a meal of anchorite and who would have guessed that these confounded sparks would have bounced into his little refectory at that hour of the morning there was no room for equivocation he had been caught in the very act of criminal conversation with the hare pie he rose with a spring like a jack-in-a-box as they entered and knife and fork in hand and with shining chops stared at them with an angry bothered and alarmed countenance which increased their laughter it was a good while before he obtained a hearing such was the hilarity so sustained the fire of ironical compliments inquiries and pleasantries and the general uproar when he did with hand uplifted after the manner of a prisoner arraigned for murder he pleaded a dispensation i suppose it was true for he backed the allegation with several most religious oaths and imprecations and explained how men were not always quite so strong as they looked that he might if he liked it by permission of his bishop eat meat at every meal in the day and every day in the week that his not doing so was a voluntary abstinence not conscientious only expedient to prevent the unreasonable remarks of his parishioners a roar of laughter that he was perhaps rightly served for not having publicly availed himself of his bishop's dispensation renewed peals of merriment by this foolish delicacy more of that detestable horse laughter he had got himself into a false position and so on till the admis recordium peroration addressed to captain devereux dear and tool my honey well they quizzed him unmercifully they sat down and ate all that was left of the hare pie under his wistful ogle they made him narrate minutely every circumstance connected with the smuggling of the game and the illicit distillation for the mess they never passed so pleasant a morning of course he bound them over to eternal secrecy and of course as in all similar cases the vow was religiously observed nothing was ever heard of it at mess oh no and duel never gave a dramatic representation of the occurrence heightened and embellished with all the little doctor's genius for farce there certainly was a monologue to which he frequently afterwards treated the aldermen of skinner's alley and other convivial bodies at supper the doctor's gestures were made with knife and fork in hand and it was spoken in a rich brogue and tones sometimes of thrilling pathos anon of sharp and vehement indignation and again of childlike endearment amidst pounding and jingling of glasses and screams of laughter from the company indeed the lord mayor a fat slob of a fellow though not much given to undue merriment left his ribs into such a state of breathless torture that he implored of tool with a wave of his hand he could not speak to give him breathing time which that voluble performer disregarding his lordship had to rise twice and get to the window or as he afterwards said he should have lost his life and when the performance was ended his fat cheeks were covered with tears his mouth hung down his head wagged slowly from side to side and with short gasping o's and o's his hands pressed to his pudgy ribs he looked so pale and breathless that although they said nothing several of his comrades stared hard at him and thought him in rather a queer state shortly after this little surprise i suppose by way of ratifying the sacred treaty of silence father roach gave the officers and tool a grand lent dinner of fish with no less than nineteen different plates baked boiled stewed in fact a very splendid feast 
and Puddock talked of some of those dishes more than twenty years afterwards. End of chapter five. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter Six of the House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. Chapter Six In Which the Minstrelsy Proceeds. No wonder, then, if Father Roach when loftus in the innocence of his heart announced his song and its theme was thoroughly uneasy and would have given a good deal that he had not helped that simple youth into his difficulty but things must now take their course so amid a decorous silence dan loftus lifted up his voice and sang that voice was a high small pipe with a very nervous quaver in it he leaned back in his chair and little more than the whites of his upturned eyes were visible and beating time upon the table with one hand clawwise and with two or three queer little trills and roulades which reappeared with great precision in each verse he delivered himself thus in which i suspect was an old psalm tune now lent is come let us refrain from carnal creatures quick or slain let's fast and macerate the flesh impound and keep it in distress here there came a wonderful unspeakable choking sound partly through the mouth partly through the nose from several of the officers and old general chatsworth who was frowning hard upon his dessert plate cried order gentlemen in a stern but very tremulous undertone lord castle mallard leaning upon his elbow was staring with a grave and dreamy curiosity at the songster and neither he nor his lordship heard the interruption and on went the pleasant ditty and as the musician regularly repeated the last two lines like a clerk in a piece of psalmody the young wags to save themselves from bursting outright joined in the chorus while verse after verse waxed more uproarious and hilarious and gave a singular relief to loftus's thin high wavering solo loftus solo but to forbear from flesh fowl fish and eat potatoes in a dish done o'er with amber or a mess of ringos in a spanish dress chorus of officers done o'er with amber or a mess of ringos in a spanish dress tis a good song murmured dr walsingham in lord castle mallard's ear i know the verses well the ingenious and pious howell penned them in the reign of king james the first ha thank you sir said his lordship loftus solo or to refrain from all high dishes but feed our thoughts with wanton wishes making the soul like a tight wench wear patches of concupiscence chorus of officers making the soul like a tight wench wear patches of concupiscence loftus solo this is not to keep lent aright but play the juggling hypocrite for we must starve the inward man and feed the outward too on bran chorus of officers for we must starve the inward man and feed the outward too on bran i believe no song was ever received with heartier bursts of laughter and applause puddick indeed was grave being a good deal interested in the dishes sung by the poet so for the sake of its moral point was dr walsingham who with brows gathered together judiciously kept time with head and hand murmuring true true good sir good from time to time as the sentiment liked him but honest father roach was confoundedly put out by the performance he sat with his blue double chin buried in his breast his mouth pursed up tightly 
a red scowl all over his face his quick little angry suspicious eyes peeping cornerwise now this way now that not knowing how to take what seemed to him like a deliberate conspiracy to roast him for the entertainment of the company who followed the concluding verse with a universal roaring chorus which went off into a storm of laughter in which father roach made an absurd attempt to join but it was only a gunpowder glare swallowed in an instant in darkness and down came the black portcullis of his scowl with a chop while clearing his voice and directing his red face and vicious little eyes straight on simple dan loftus he said rising very erect and square from an unusually ceremonious bow i don't know mr loftus exactly what you mean by a ring goat in a spanish dress the priest had just smuggled over a wonderful bit of ecclesiastical toggery from salamanca and uh, a person wearing patches you said of of patches of concupiscence i think father roach's housekeeper unfortunately wore patches she was altogether virtuous and by no means young but i'm bound to suppose by the amusement our friends seem to derive from it sir that a ring goat whatever it means is a good joke as well as a good-natured one but by your leave sir emphatically interposed puddock on whose ear the ecclesiastic splendour grated like a discord mr loftus sang nothing about a goat though kid is not a bad thing he said ringos meaning i conclude iringonius a delicious preserve or confection have you never eaten them either preserved or candied ah uh, why i uh, i happen to have a receipt ah uh, and if you permit me sir a capital receipt when i was a boy i made some once at home sir and by jupiter my brother sam eat of them till he was quite sick i remember so sick by jupiter my poor mother and old dorcas had to sit up all night with him ah uh, and i was going to say if you will allow me sir i shall be very happy to send the receipt to your housekeeper you'll not like it sir said devereux mischievously but there really is a capital one quite of another kind a lenten dish fish you know puddock the one you described yesterday but mr loftus has i think a still better way have you sir asked puddock who had a keen appetite for knowledge i don't know captain puddock murmured loftus bewildered what is it remarked his reverence shortly a roast roach answered puddock looking quite innocently in that theologian's fiery face thank you said father roach with an expression of countenance which polite little puddock did not in the least understand and how do you roast him we know loftus's receipt persisted devereux with remarkable cruelty just like a lump said puddock briskly and how is that inquired devereux flay the lump splat him divide him answered puddock with great volubility and cut each side into two pieces season with salt pepper and nutmeg and baste with clarified butter dish him with slices of oranges barberries grapes gooseberries and butter and you will find that he eats deliriously either with farced pain or gammon pain this rhapsody delivered with the rapidity and emphasis of puddock's earnest lisp was accompanied with very general tokens of merriment from the company and the priest who half suspected him of having invented it was on the point of falling foul of him when lord castle mallard rose to take leave and the general forthwith vacated the chair and so the party broke up fell into groups and the greater part sauntered off to the phoenix where in the club-room they with less restraint and some new recruits carried on the pleasures of the evening which pleasures as will sometimes happen 
ended in something rather serious. End of chapter six. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter seven of the house by the churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Le Fanu. Chapter 7 Showing How Two Gentlemen May Misunderstand One Another Without Enabling the Company to Understand Their Quarrel. Loftus had by this time climbed to the savage lair of his garret, over strewn with tattered papers and books, and Father Roach in the sanctuary of his little parlor was growling over the bones of a devil turkey and about to soothe his fretted soul in a generous libation of hot whiskey punch. Indeed, he was of an appeasable nature, and on the whole a very good fellow. Dr. Toole, whom the young fellows found along with Nutter over the draft board in the club room, forsook his game to devour the story of Loftus's Lenten hymn, and poor Father Roach's penance, rubbed his hands, and slapped his thigh, and crowed and shouted with ecstasy. Oh, Flaherty, who called for punch, and was unfortunately prone to grow melancholy and pugnacious over his liquor, was now in a saturnine vein of sentiment, discoursing of the charms of his peerless mistress, the Lady Magnolia McNamara, for he was not one of those maudlin shepherds who pipe their loves in lonely glens and other sequestered places, but rather love to exhibit his bare scars and roar his tender torments for the edification of the marketplace. While he was decanting on the attributes of that bewitching crater, Horik not two yards off was describing with scarcely less unction the perfections of pig roast with the hair on, and the two made a medley like the roast beef of old England and the last rose of summer, arranged in alternate stanzas, O'Flaherty suddenly stopped short, and said a little sternly to Lieutenant Puddock, Does it very much signify, sir, or, as O'Flaherty pronounced it, sore, whether the animal has hair upon it or not? Everything. Thur, in this particular receipt, answered Puddock, a little loftily. But said Nutter, who, though no great talker, would make an effort to prevent a quarrel, and at the same time winking to Puddock in token that O'Flaherty was just a little hearty, and so to him alone, what signifies pig's hair compared with human tresses? Compared with human tresses, interrupted O'Flaherty with stern deliberation, and fixing his eyes steadily, and rather unpleasantly upon Nutter. I think he saw that wink, and perhaps did not understand its import. I, sir, and Mrs. Magnolia McNamara, has a rich head of hair, as you could wish to see, says Nutter, thinking he was drawing him off very cleverly. As I could wish to see, repeated O'Flaherty grimly, as you could desire to see, sir reiterated Nutter firmly, for he was not easily put down, and they looked for several seconds in silence, a little menacingly, though puzzled at one another. But O'Flaherty, after a short pause, seemed to forget Nutter, and returned to his celestial theme. Be the powers, sir. That young lady has the most beautiful dimple in her chin I ever set eyes on. "'Have you ever put a marrow-fat pea in it, sir?' inquired Devereux, simply, with all the beautiful rashness of youth. "'No, sore,' replied O'Flaherty in a deep tone, and with a very dangerous glare. "'And I'd like to see the man who, in my presence, I'd presume to take that liberty.' "'What a glorious name Magnolia is,' interposed little Toole, in great haste for it was a practice among these worthies to avert quarrels. 
very serious affairs in these jolly days by making timely little diversions and it is wonderful at a critical moment what may be done by suddenly presenting a trifle a pin's point sometimes at least a marvellously small one will draw off innocuously the accumulating electricity of a pair of bloated scowling thunderclouds it was her noble godmother when the family resided at castle mara in the county of roscommon the lady carrick o'gunniel who conferred it said o'flaherty grandly upon her goddaughter as who had a better right i say who had a better right and he smote his hand upon the table and looked round inviting contradiction my godmother's in my baptism that's catechism and all the town of chapel is it won't put that down the holy church catechism while hyacinth o'flaherty of coolna kirk lieutenant fireworker wears a sword nobly said lieutenant exclaimed o'toole with a sly wink over his shoulder and what about that lady's nemi sir demanded the enamoured fireworker by jove sir it is quite true lady carrick o'gunniel was her godmother and toole ran off into the story of how that relationship was brought about narrating it however with a great caution and mildness extracting all the satire and giving it quite a dignified and credible character for the lieutenant fireworker smelt so confoundedly of powder that the little doctor though he never flinched when occasion demanded did not care to give him an open those who had heard the same story from the mischievous merry little doctor before were i dare say amused at the grand and complimentary turn he gave it now the fact was that poor magnolia's name came to her in no very gracious way young lady carrick o'gunniel was a bit of a wag and was planting a magnolia one of the first of those botanical rarities seen in ireland when good-natured vaporing vulgar mrs mcnamara's note who wished to secure a peeress for her daughter's spiritual guardian arrived her ladyship pencilled on the back of the note pray call the dear babe magnolia and forthwith forgot all about it but madame mcnamara was charmed and the autograph remained afterwards for two generations among the archives of the family and with great smiles and much complacency she told lord carrick o'gunniel all about it just outside the grand jury room where she met him during the assize week and being a man of a weak and considerate nature rather kind and very courteous although his smile was very near exploding into a laugh as he gave the good lady snuff out of his own box he was yet very much concerned and vexed and asked his lady when he went home how she could have induced old mrs mcnamara to give that absurd name to her poor infant whereat her ladyship who had not thought of it since was highly diverted and being assured that the babe was actually christened and past recovery magnolia mcnamara laughed very merrily kissed her lord who was shaking his head gravely and then popped her hood on kissed him again and laughing still ran out to look at her magnolia which by the way of reprisal he henceforth notwithstanding her entreaties always called her mcnamara until to her infinite delight he came out with it as it sometimes happens at a wrong time and asked old mac a large mild man then extant madame herself nurse infant magnolia and all who had arrived at the castle to walk out and see lady carrick o'gunniel's mcnamara and perceived not the slip such is the force of habit though the family stared and lady c laughed in an uncalled-for way at a sudden recollection of a tumble she once had when a child over a flower-bed and broke out repeatedly 
to my lord's chagrin and bewilderment as they walked towards the exotic when Tool ended his little family anecdote which you may be sure he took care to render as palatable to magnolia's knight as possible by not very scrupulous excisions and interpolations he wound all up without allowing an instant for criticism or question by saying briskly though incoherently and so what do you say lieutenant to a welsh rabbit for supper the lieutenant nodded a solid assent will you have one nutter cried tool no said nutter and why not says tool why i believe tom rook's song in praise of oysters answered nutter especially the verse the youth will ne'er live to scratch a gray head on a supper who goes of welsh rabbit to bed how came it to pass that nutter hardly opened his lips this evening on which as the men who knew him longest all remarked he was unprecedentedly talkative without instantaneously becoming the mark at which o'flaherty directed his fiercest and most suspicious scowls and now that i know the illusion which the pugnacious lieutenant apprehended i cannot but admire the fatality with which without the smallest design a very serious misunderstanding was brought about as to youths living to scratch grey heads or not sir said the young officer in most menacing tones I don't see what concern persons of your age can have in that. But I'll take leave to tell you, sir, that a gentleman, whether he be a youth, as you say, or aged, as you are, who endeavors to make himself diverting at the expense of others, runs a murdering good risk, sir, of getting himself scratched where he'd like it least. Little Nutter, though grave and generally taciturn, had a spirit of his own and no notion whatever of knocking under to a bully it is true he had not the faintest notion why he was singled out for the young gentleman's impertinence but neither did he mean to inquire his mahogany features darkened for a moment to logwood and his eyes showed their whites fiercely we are not accustomed sir in this part of the world to your conic notions of politeness we meet here for social, uh, uh, sociality, sir, and the long and the short of it is, young gentleman, if you don't change your key, you'll find two can play at that game, and, and I tell you, sir, there will be wigs on the green, sir. Here several voices interposed. Silence, gentlemen, and let me speak, or I'll assault him, bellowed O'Flaherty who, to do him justice, at this moment looked capable of anything. "'I believe, sir,' he continued, addressing Nutter, who confronted him like a little gamecock, "'it is not usual for one gentleman who renders himself offensive to another to oblige him to proceed to the length of manually malthrating his person.' "'Hey, hey!' said Nutter, drawing his mouth tight on one side, with an ugly expression, and clenching his hands in his breeches pockets. Manually maltreating his person, sir, repeated O'Flaherty, by striking, kicking, or whipping any part or member of his body, or offering a milder assault, such as a pull by the chin, or a finger tap upon the nose. It is usual, sir, for the purpose of avoiding ungentlemanlike noise, inconvenience and confusion that one gentleman should request of another to suppose himself affronted in the manner whatever it may be most intolerable to his feelings which request i now sir take the liberty of preferring to you and when you have engaged the services of a friend i trust that lieutenant puttock who lodges in the same house with me will in consideration of my being an officer of the same honourable corps a stranger in this part of the country, and above all a gentleman who can show pedigree like himself. Here a low bow to Puttock, who returned it. Then Lieutenant Puttock will be so feeling and so kind as to receive him on my behalf, and acting as my friend to manage all the particulars for settling as easily as may be this most unprovoked affair. With which words he made another bow, and a pause of inquiry directed to Puttock 
who lisped with dignity sir the duty is for many reasons painful but i can't refuse sir and i accept the trust so o'flaherty shook his hand with another bow bowed silently and loftily round the room and disappeared and a general buzz and a clack of tongues arose mr nutter uh, i hope things may be settled pleasantly said puttick looking as tall and weighty as he could at present i uh that is at the moment i uh, don't quite see the fact is he had not a notion what the deuce it was all about but your friend will find me your friend uh at my lodgings up to one o'clock to-night if necessary and so puttick's bow for the moment an affair of this sort presented itself all concerned therein became reserved and official and the representatives merely of a ceremonious etiquette and a minutely regulated ordeal of battle so as i said puttick bowed grandly and sublimely to nutter and then magnificently to the company and made his exit there was a sort of a stun and a lull for several seconds something very decisive and serious had occurred one or two countenances wore that stern and mysterious smile which implies no hilarity but a kind of reaction in presence of the astounding and the slightly horrible there was a silence the gentlemen kept their attitudes too for some moments and all eyes were directed toward the door then some turned to charles nutter and then the momentary spell dissolved itself end of chapter 7 recording by john brandon chapter 8 of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefanu chapter 8 relating how dr toole and captain devereux went on a moonlight errand nearly a dozen gentlemen broke out at once into voluble speech nutter was in a confounded passion but being a man of few words showed his wrath chiefly in his countenance and stood with his legs apart and his arms stuffed straight into his coat pockets his back to the fireplace with his chest thrown daringly out sniffing the air in a state of high tension and as like as a respectable little fellow five feet six could be to that giant who smelt the blood of the irishman and swore with a fee faw fum he'd eat him for his supper that night none of the corps can represent you nutter you know said captain clough it may go hard enough with puttock and o'flaherty as the matter stands but by jove if any of us appear on the other side the general would make it a very serious affair indeed tool can't you asked devereux out of the question answered he shutting his eyes with a frown and shaking his head there's no man i'd do it sooner for nutter knows but i can't i've refused too often besides you'll want me professionally you know for Sturk must attend the Royal Hospital inquiry tomorrow all day. But hang it, where's the difficulty? Isn't there? Pooh! Why, there must be lots of fellows at hand. Just, uh, just think for a minute. I don't care who, said Nutter, with dry ferocity. So he can load a pistol. Tom Forsyth would have done capitally if he was at home said one but he's not remarked clough well said tool getting close up to devereux in a coaxing undertone suppose we try loftus dan loftus ejaculated devereux dan loftus repeated the little doctor testily remember it's just eleven o'clock he's no great things to be sure but what better can we get alon's done said devereux donning his cocked hat with a shrug and the least little bit of a satirical smile and out bustled the doctor beside him 
where the deuce did that broganeer o'flaherty come from said clough confidentially to old major o'neill a connicked man answered the major with a grim smile for he was himself of that province and was perhaps a little bit proud of his countrymen toole says he's well connected pursued clough but by jupiter i never saw so mere a teague and the most cross-grained devil of a catamountain i could not quite understand why he fastened on mr nutter observed the major with a mild smile i'll rid the town of him rapped out nutter with an oath leering at his own shoe buckle and tapping the sole with asperity on the floor if you're thinking of any unpleasant measures gentlemen i'd rather if you please know nothing of them said the sly quiet major for the general you are aware has expressed a strong opinion about such affairs and as tis past my bed hour i'll wish you gentlemen a good night and off went the major upon my life if this conic rapparee is permitted to carry on his business of indiscriminate cut-throat here he'll make the service very pleasant resumed clough who though a brisk young fellow of eight and forty had no special fancy for being shot i say the general ought to take the matter into his own hands not till i'm done with it growled nutter and send the young gentleman home to conic pursued clough i'll send him first to the other place said nutter in allusion to the lord protector's well-known alternative in the open street under the sly old moon red little dr toole in his great wig and gypsy devereux in quest of a squire for a good night who stood panting for battle in the front parlour of the phoenix saw a red glimmer in loftus's dormant window he's alive and stirring still said devereux approaching the hall door with a military nonchalance wisht said toole plucking him back by the sash we must not make a noise the house is asleep i'll manage it leave it to me and he took up a handful of gravel but not having got the range he shied it all against old tom drought's bedroom window deuce take that old sneak whispered toole vehemently he's always in the way the last man in the town i'd have and up went a pebble better directed for this time it went right through loftus's window and a pleasant little shower of broken glass jingled down into the street confound you toole said devereux you'll rouse the town plague take the fellow's glass it's as thin as paper sputtered toole loftus we want you said toole in a hard whispered shout and making a speaking trumpet of his hands as the wild head of the student like nothing in life but a hen's nest appeared above cock loftus come down do you hear urged devereux dr toole and lieutenant devereux i i dear me yes gentlemen you're most obedient murmured loftus vacantly and knocking his head smartly on the top of the window frame in recovering from a little bow i'll be with ye gentlemen in a moment and the hen's nest vanished toole and devereux drew back a little into the shadow of the opposite buildings for while they were waiting a dusky apparition supposed to be old drought in his nightshirt appeared at that gentleman's windows saluting the ambassadors with mop and mow in a very threatening and energetic way just as this demonstration subsided the hall door opened wide and indeed was left so while our friend loftus in a wonderful tattered old silk coat that looked quite indescribable by moonlight the torn linings hanging down in loops inside the skirts pale and discoloured like the shreds of banners in a cathedral his shirt loose at the neck his breeches unbuttoned at the knees and a gigantic misshapen and mouldy pair of slippers clinging and clattering about his feet came down the steps his light round little eyes and queer quiet face peering at them into the shade 
and a smokeified volume of divinity tucked under his arm with his finger between the leaves to keep the place when devereux saw him approaching the whole thing mission service man and all struck him in so absurd a point of view that he burst out into an explosion of laughter which only grew more vehement and uproarious the more earnestly and imploringly toole tried to quiet him pointing up with both hands and all his fingers extended to the windows of the sleeping townsfolk and making horrible grimaces shrugs and ogles but the young gentleman was not in the habit of denying himself innocent indulgences and shaking himself loose of tool he walked down the dark side of the street in peals of laughter making ever and anon little breathless remarks to himself which his colleague could not hear but which seemed to have the effect of setting him off again into new hemi demi semi quavers and roars of laughter and left the doctor to himself to conduct the negotiation with loftus well said devereux by this time recovering breath as the little doctor looking very red and glum strutted up to him along the shady pavement well well oh i very well to be sure i'd like to know what the plague were to do now grumbled tool your precious armor-bearer refuses to act then asked devereux to be sure he does he sees you walking down the street ready to die a-laughin at nothin by jove swore tool in deep disgust and and ach hang it it's all a confounded pack of nonsense sir if you could not keep grave for five minutes you ought not to have come at all and what need i care it's nutter's affair not mine and well for him we failed did you ever see such a fish he'd have shot himself or nutter to a certainty but there's a chance yet we forgot the nightingale club they're still in the phoenix who sir they're all tailors and greengrocers said tool in high dudgeon there are two or three good names among them however answered devereux and by this time they were on the threshold of the phoenix larry he cried to the waiter the nightingale club is there is it not glancing at the great back parlor door be the powers captain you may say that said larry with a wink and a grin of exquisite glee see larry said tool with importance we're a little serious now so just say if there's any of the gentlemen there you you understand now quite steady do you see me larry winked this time a grave wink looked down at the floor and up to the cornice and well said he to be candid with you just at this minute half an hour ago you see it was different the only gentleman i take on myself to recommend to you as perfectly sober is mr mccann of petticoat lane is he in business asked tool does he keep a shop said devereux a shop two shops a great man in the chandlery line responded larry hm not precisely the thing we want though says tool there are some of them surely that don't keep shops said devereux a little impatiently millions said larry come say their names only one of them came this evening mr doolan of stony bather he's a retired merchant that will do said tool under his breath to devereux devereux nodded just i say tap him on the shoulder and tell him that dr tool you know of this town with many compliments and excuses begs one word with him said the doctor oh doctor dear he was the first of them down and was carried out to his coach insensible just when mr crozier of christ church began come roger and listen he's in his bed in stony bather a good hour and a half ago 
a retired merchant says devereux well tool what do you advise now by jove i think one of us must go into town twill never do to leave poor nutter in the lurch and between ourselves that old flaherty's a a bloodthirsty idiot by jove and ought to be put down let's see nutter you or i must go we'll take one of these songsters noddies a noddy give me leave to remark was the one-horse hack vehicle of dublin and the country round which has since given place to the jaunting car which is in its turn half superseded by the cab and devereux followed by tool entered the front parlour again but without their help the matter was arranging itself and a second of whom they knew nothing was about to emerge end of chapter eight recording by john brandon chapter nine of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefanu chapter nine how a squire was found for the night of the rueful countenance when dr toole grumbled at his disappointment he was not at all aware how nearly his interview with loftus had knocked the entire affair on the head he had no idea how much that worthy person was horrified by his proposition and toole walked off in a huff without bidding him good night and making a remark in which the words old woman occurred pretty audibly but loftus remained under the glimpses of the moon in perturbation and sore perplexity it was so late he scarcely dared disturb dr walsingham or general chatsworth but there came the half-stifled cadence of a song not bacchanalian but sentimental something about daphne and a swain struggling through the window shutters next the green hall door close by and dan instantly bethought himself of father roach so knocking stoutly at the window he caused the melody to subside and the shutter to open when the priest looking out saw dan loftus in his deshabelle i believe he thought for a moment it was something from the neighboring churchyard however his reverence came out and stood on the steps enveloped in a hospital aroma of broiled bones lemons and alcohol and shaking his visitor affectionately by the hand for he bore no malice and the lenten ditty he quite forgave as being no worse in modern parlance than an unhappy fluke was about to pull him into the parlour where there was ensconced he told him a noble friend of his this was pat mahoney from beyond killarney just arrived a man of parts and conversation and a lovely singer but dan resisted and told his tale in an earnest whisper in the hall the priest made his mouth into a round queer little o through which he sucked a long breath elevating his brows and rolling his eyes slowly about a jewel and nutter of all the men on the face of the earth though i often heard he was a fine shot and a sweet little fencer in his youth and game too oh be the powers you can see that still game to the backbone and wished a bit now who's the other lieutenant o'flaherty a low whistle from his reverence that's a boy that comes from a fighting county galway i wish you saw them at an election time why there's no end of diversion the diversion of stopping them of course i mean observing a sudden alteration in loftus's countenance and you of course want to stop it and so of course do i my dear well then wait a bit now we must have our eyes open don't be in a hurry let us be harmless as serpents but wise as doves 
now tis a fine thing no doubt to put an end to a jewel by act of interference though i've known cases my dear child where suppressing a simple jewel has been the cause of half a dozen breaking out afterwards in the same neighbourhood and on the very same quarrel do you mind though of course that's no reason here and there my dear boy but take it that a jewel is breaking down and coming to the ground of itself here a hugely cunning wink in an easy natural accommodating way the only effect of interference is to bolster it up do you see so just consider how things are my dear leave it all to me and mind my words it can't take place without a second the officers have refused so has tool you won't undertake it and it's too late to go into town i defy it to come to anything just be said be me dan loftus and let sleeping dogs lie here i am an old experienced observer that's up to their tricks with my eye upon them go you to bed lave them to me and they're checkmated without so much as seeing how we bring it to pass dan hesitated i rock go to your bed dan loftus dear it's past eleven o'clock they're nonplussed already and lave me me that understands it to manage the rest well sir i do confide it altogether to you i know i might through ignorance do a mischief and so they bid a mutual good night and loftus scaled his garret stair and snuffed his candle and plunged again into the business of two thousand years ago here's a purty business says the priest extending both his palms with a face of warlike importance and shutting the door behind him with what he called a cow's kick a jewel my dear pat no less bloody work i'm afeard mr manny who had lighted a pipe during his entertainer's absence withdrew the fragrant tube from his lips and opened his capacious mouth with a look of pleasant expectation for he like other gentlemen of his day and must we confess not a few jolly clerics of my creed as well as of honest father roaches regarded the ordeal of battle and all its belongings simply as the highest branch of sporting not that the worthy father avowed any such sentiment on the contrary his voice and his eyes if not his hands were always raised against the sanguinary practice and scarce a duel occurred within a reasonable distance unattended by his reverence in the capacity as he said of an unauthorized but earnest though he feared unavailing peacemaker there he used to spout little maxims of reconciliation and christian brotherhood and forbearance exhorting to forget and forgive wringing his hands at each successive discharge and it must be said too in fairness playing the part of a good samaritan towards the wounded to whom his green hall door was ever open and for whom the oil of his consolation and the wine of his best bin never refused to flow pat my child said his reverence that nutter's a divil of a fellow at least he was by all accounts he'll be bad enough i'm afeard and hard enough to manage if everything goes smooth but if he's kept waiting there fuming and boiling over do you mind without a natural vent for his feelings or a friend do you see at his side to restrain him and bring about if possible a friendly mutual understanding why my dear child he'll get into that state of exasperation and violence he'll have half a dozen jewels on his hands before morning ah tid be a murther to bulk them for want of a friend answered mr mahony standing up like a warrior and laying his pipe of peace upon the chimney will i go down father dennis and offer my services with a view to reconciliation mind said his reverence raising his finger 
closing his eyes and shaking his florid face impressively ah brother don't i know of course reconciliation and he was buttoning his garments where being a little in flesh as well as tall he had loosed them where are the gentlemen now and who will i ask for i'll show you the light from the steps ask for dr Toole, and he's certainly there and if he's not for mr nutter and just say you came from my house where you uh who accidentally heard through mr loftus do you mind there was a difficulty in finding a friend to uh strive to make up matters between them by this time they stood upon the doorsteps and mr manny had clapped on his hat with a pugnacious cock a one side and following with a sporting and mischievous leer the direction of the priest's hand that indicated the open door of the phoenix through which a hospitable light was issuing there's where you'll find the gentleman in the front parlor says the priest you remember dr tool and he'll remember you and mine dear it's to make it up you're goin mr manny was already under way at a brisk stride and with a keen relish for the business and the blessing of the peacemaker go with you my child added his reverence lifting his hands and his eyes towards the heavens and upon my fanny looking shrewdly at the stars and talking to himself they'll have a fine morning for the business if unfortunately and here he reascended his doorsteps with a melancholy shrug if unfortunately pat manny should fail when mr pat manny saw occasion for playing the gentleman he certainly did come out remarkably strong in the part it was done in a noble florid glowing style according to his private ideal of the complete fine gentleman such bows such pointing of the toes such graceful flourishes of the three-cocked hat such immensely engaging smiles and wonderful by-play such an apparition in short of perfect elegance valor and courtesy were never seen before in the front parlor of the phoenix mr manny by jingo ejaculated tool in an accent of thankfulness amounting nearly to rapture nutter seemed relieved too and advanced to be presented to the man who instinct told him was to be his friend clough a man of fashion of the military school eyed the elegant stranger with undiagnosed disgust and wonder and devereux with that subacid smile with which men will sometimes quietly relish absurdity mr manny discoursing a country neighbor outside the halfway house at muckafubble or enjoying an easy tete-a-tete with father roach was a very inferior person indeed to patrick manny esq the full-blown diplomatist and pink of gentility astonishing the front parlor of the phoenix there mr manny's periods were fluent and florid and the words chosen occasionally rather for their grandeur and melody than for their exact connection with the context or bearing upon his meaning a consequence was a certain gorgeous haziness and bewilderment which made the task of translating his harangues rather troublesome and conjectural having effected the introduction and made known the object of his visit nutter and he withdrew to a small chamber behind the bar where nutter returning some of his bows and having listened without deriving any very clear ideas to two consecutive addresses from his companion took the matter in hand himself and said he i beg sir to relieve you at once from the trouble of trying to arrange this affair amicably i have been grossly insulted he's not going to apologize and nothing but a meeting will satisfy me he's a mere murderer i have not the faintest notion why he wants to kill me but being reduced to this situation i hold myself obliged if i can to rid the town of him finally shake hands sir cried manny forgetting his rhetoric in his enthusiasm be the hole in the wall sir 
I honor you. End of chapter 9. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 10 of The House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lafano. Chapter 10 The Dead Secret Showing How the Fireworker Proved to Puttock That Nutter Had Spied Out the Nakedness of the Land. When Puttock, having taken a short turn or two in the air, by way of tranquilizing his mind, mounted his lodging stairs, he found Lieutenant O'Flaherty not at all more sober than he had last seen him in the front drawing-room which apartment was richly perfumed with powerful exultations of rum punch drink this puttock drink it said o'flaherty filling a large glass in equal quantities with rum and water drink it my sincere friend it will study you it will upon my honour puttock but uh, thank you sir i am anxious to understand exactly said puttock here he was interrupted by a frightful grin and a ha from o'flaherty who darted to the door and seizing his little withered french servant who was entering swung him about the room by his coat collar so sir you've been prating again have you you deceitful idle old drunken miscreant you did it on purpose you blunderin' old hyena it's the third jewel you got your master into and if i lose my life divil a penny of your wages you'll ever get that's one comfort yes sir this is the third time you've caused me to brew my hands in human blood i don't know if it's malice or only blunderin oh he cried with a still fiercer shake it's i that wishes i could be sure twas malice i'd skiver you heels and elbows on my sword and roast you alive on that fire is not it a hard thing my darlin puttock i can't find out he was still holding the little valet by the collar and stretching out his right hand to puttock but i am always the sport of misfortunes small and great if there was an old woman to be handed in to supper or a man to be murdered by mistake or an ugly girl to be danced with whose turn was it ever and always to do the business but poor hyacinth o'flaherty's tears i could tell you puttock he continued forgetting his wrath and letting his prisoner go in his eager pathos the frenchman made his escape in a twinkling i was the only man in our regiment that took the measles in cork when it was going among the children bad luck to them i that was near dying of it when i was an infant and i was the only officer in the regiment when we were at athlone that was prevented going to the race ball and i would not for a hundred pounds i was to dance the first minuet and the first country dance with that beautiful creature miss rose cox i was making a glass of brandy punch not feeling quite myself and i dressed in all in our room when ensign higgins a most thoughtless young man said something disrespectful about a beautiful mole she had on her chin bedad sir he called it a wart if you plays and feeling it strongly i let the jug of scalding water drop on my knees i wish you felt it my darlin puttock i was scalded in half a crack from a foot above my knees down to the last joint of my two big toes and i really thought my senses were leaving me i lost the ball by it oh ho we're through poor hyacinth o'flaherty and thereupon he wept you see lieutenant o'flaherty lisped puttock growing impatient we can't say how soon mr nutter's friend may apply for an interview 
and uh, i must confess i don't quite understand the point of difference between you and him and therefore ah where the devil's that blackguard little french ways all gone to exclaimed o'flaherty for the first time perceiving that his captive had escaped kokang madate do you hear me kokang madate he shouted but really sir you must be so good as to place before me before me sir clearly the the cause of this unhappy dispute the exact offence for otherwise cause to be sure and plenty of cause i never fought a duel yet puttick my friend and this will be the ninth without cause they said i'm tolt in cork i was quarrelsome they lied i'm not quarrelsome i only want pace and quiet and justice i hate a quarrelsome man i tell you puttick if i only knew where to find a quarrelsome man be the powers i'd go fifty miles out of my way to pull him by the nose they lied puttick my dear boy and i'd give twenty pounds this minute i had them on this floor to tell them how damnably they lied no doubt sir said puttick but if you please i really must have a distinct answer to my get out of that sir thundered o'flaherty with an awful stamp on the floor as the coquin modded o'flaherty's only bit of french such as it was and obedience to that form of invocation appeared nervously at the threshold or i'll fling the contents of this room at your head exit monsieur again veganis if i thought it was he that done it i'd jerk his old bones through the top of the window will i call him back and give him his desarts will i puttick oh ho home my darlin puttick everything turns agin me what'll i do puttick jewel or what's to become of me and he shed some more tears and drank off the greater part of the beverage which he had prepared for puttick i believe sir that this is the sixth time i ventured to ask a distinct statement from your lips of the cause of your disagreement with mr nutter which i plainly tell you there i don't at pretence understand said puttick loftily and firmly enough to be sure my darlin puttick replied o'flaherty it was that cursed little french whippersnapper with his money-fied interruptions be the powers puttick if you knew half the mischief that same little baste has got me into you would not wonder if i'd murdered him it was he was the cause of my duel with my cousin art considine and i wanton to be the very pink of politeness to him i wrote him a note when he came to athlone after two years in france and just out a compliment to him i unluckily put in a word of french come and dine says i and we'll have a dish of chat i knew u n p l a t was a dish and says i to jerome that pigamy so he pronounced it you see here at the door that's his damnable name what's chat in french c h a t spelling it to him sha says he sha says i spell it if you plays says i c h a t says he the stupid old viper well i took the trouble to write it out un plat de chat is that right says i showing it to him it is my lord says he looking at me as if i had two heads i never knew the maining of it for more than a month after i shot poor art through the two calves and he that fought two duels before 
all about cats one of them was a scotch gentleman that he gave the lie to for saying that french cooks had a way of stewing cats you could never tell them from hares and the other immediately after with lieutenant rouge of the royal navy that got one stewed for fun and after my cousin art dined off it like a man showed him the tail and the claws it's well he did not die of it and no wonder he resented my invitation though upon my honour as a soldier and a gentleman may i be stewed alive myself in a pot put it my dear if i had the least notion of offering him the smallest affront i begin to despair sir exclaimed Puddock, of receiving the information without which tis vain for me to try to be useful to you once more may i entreat to know what is the affront of which you complain you don't know really and truly now you don't know said o'flaherty fixing a solemn tipsy leer on him i tell you no sir rejoined Puddock and do you mean to tell me you did not hear that vulgar dog nutter's unmanly jokes jokes repeated puddock in large perplexity why i have been here in this town for more than five years and i never heard in all that time that nutter once made a joke and upon my life i don't think he could make a joke sir if he tried i don't indeed lieutenant o'flaherty upon my honour and rat it sir how can i help it cried o'flaherty relapsing into pathos help what demanded puddick o'flaherty took him by the hand and gazing on his face with a maudlin lacklustre tenderness said absalom was caught by the hair of his head he was puddick long hair or short hair or uh, uh, no hair at all isn't it nature's doing i ask you my darling puddick isn't it he was shedding tears again very fast there was cicero julius caesar were both as bald as that and he thrust a shining sugar basin bottom upward into puddick's face i'm not bald i tell you i'm not no my poor puddock i'm not war hyacinth o'flaherty is not bald shaking puddock by both hands that's very plain sir but i don't see your drift he replied i want to tell you puddock dear if you'll only have a minute's patience the door can't fasten diffle bother it come into the next room and toppling a little in his walk he led him solemnly into his bedroom, the door of which he locked, somewhat to Puddock's disquietude, who began to think him insane. Here, having informed Puddock that Nutter was driving at the one point the whole evening, as any one that knew the secret would have seen, and having solemnly imposed the seal of secrecy upon his second, and essayed a wild and broken discourse upon the difference between total baldness and partial loss of hair he disclosed to him the grand mystery of his existence by lifting from the summit of his head a circular piece of wig which in those days they called i believe a topping leaving a bare shining disc exposed about the size of a large pat of butter upon my life thur ith a very fine piece of work says puddick who viewed the wiglet with the eye of a stage property man and held it by a top lock near the candle the very finest piece of work of the kind i ever saw it's certainly french oh yes we can't do such things here by jove sir what a wig that man could make for cato and he must be a main crater i say a main crater pursued o'flaherty for well, there was not a soul in the town but jerome the treacherous ape that knew it it's he that dresses my head every morning behind the bed curtain there with the door locked and nutter could never find it out who was to tell him 
unless that odious french damon that's never done talkin about it and o'flaherty strode heavily up and down the room with his hands in his breeches pockets muttering savage invectives pitching his head from side to side and whisking round at the turns in a way to show how strongly he was wrought upon come in sir thundered o'flaherty unlocking the door in reply to a knock and expecting to see his odious french damon but it was a tall fattish stranger rather flashily dressed but a little soiled with a black wig and a rollicking red face showing a good deal of chin and jaw o'flaherty made his grandest bow quite forgetting the exposure at the top of his head and puddock stood rather shocked with the candle in one hand and o'flaherty's scalp in the other you come sir i presume from mr nutter said o'flaherty with lofty courtesy this sir is my friend lieutenant puddock of the royal irish artillery who does me the honour to support me with his advice and as he moved his hand towards puddock he saw his scalp dangling between that gentleman's finger and thumb and became suddenly mute he clapped his hand upon his bare skull and made an agitated pluck at that article but missed and disappeared with an imprecation in irish behind the bed curtains if you will be so obliging sir as to precede me into that room lisped puddock with grave dignity and waving o'flaherty's scalp slightly towards the door for puddock never stopped to hide anything and being a gentleman pure and simple was not ashamed or afraid to avow his deeds words and situations i shall do myself the honour to follow give me that was heard in a vehement whisper from behind the curtains puddock understood it and restored the treasure the secret conference in the drawing-room was not tedious nor indeed very secret for any one acquainted with the diplomatic slang in which such affairs were conducted might have learned in the lobby or indeed in the hall so mighty was the voice of the stranger that there was no chance of any settlement without a meeting which was fixed to take place at twelve o'clock next day on the fifteen acres end of chapter ten recording by john brandon chapter eleven of the house by the churchyard this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. A House by the Churchyard, Chapter 11. Some talk about the haunted house, being, as I suppose, only old women's tales old sally always attended her young mistress while she prepared for bed not that lilius required help for she had the spirit of neatness and a joyous gentle alacrity and only troubled the good old creature enough to prevent her thinking herself grown old and useless sally in her quiet way was garrulous and she had all sorts of old-world tales of wonder and adventure to which lilius often went pleasantly to sleep for there was no danger while old sally sat knitting there by the fire and the sound of the rector's mounting upon his chairs as was his wont and taking down and putting up his books in the study beneath though muffled and faint gave evidence that the good and loving influence was awake and busy old sally was telling her young mistress who sometimes listened with a smile and sometimes lost a good five minutes together on her gentle prattle how the young gentleman mr mervyn had taken that awful old haunted habitation the tiled house beyond at valley Fermit, and was going to stay there and wondered no one had told him of the mysterious dangers of that desolate mansion it stood by a lonely bend of the narrow road Lilius had often looked upon the short, straight, grass-grown avenue 
with an awful curiosity at the old house which she had learned in childhood to fear as the abode of shadowy tenants and unearthly dangers there are people sally nowadays who call themselves freethinkers and don't believe in anything even in ghosts said lilius ah then the place he's stoppin in now miss lily will soon cure him of free thinkin if the half they say about it is true answered sally but i don't say mind he's a free thinker for i don't know anything of mr murfin but if he be not he must be very brave or very good indeed i know sally i should be horribly afraid indeed to sleep in it myself answered lilius with a cosy little shudder as the aerial image of the old house for a moment stood before her with its peculiar malign sacred and skulking aspect as if it had drawn back in shame and guilt under the melancholy old elms among the tall hemlock and nettles and now sally i'm safe in bed stir the fire my old darling for although it was the first week in may the night was frosty and tell me all about the tiled house again and frighten me out of my wits so good old sally whose faith in such matters was a religion went off over the well-known ground in a gentle little amble sometimes subsiding into a walk as she approached some special horror and pulling up altogether that is to say suspending her knitting and looking with a mysterious nod at her young mistress in the four-poster or lowering her voice to a sort of whisper when the crisis came so she told her how when the neighbors hired the orchard that ran up to the windows at the back of the house the dogs they kept there used to howl so wildly and wolfishly all night among the trees and prowl under the walls of the house so dejectedly that they were fain to open the door and let them in at last and indeed small need was there for dogs for no one young or old dared go near the orchard after nightfall no the burnished golden pippins that peeped through the leaves in the western rays of evening and made the mouths of the valley firmet schoolboys water glowed undisturbed in the morning sunbeams and secure in the mysterious tutelage of the night smiled coyly on their predatory longings and this was no fanciful reserve and avoidance mick daly when he had the orchard used to sleep in the loft over the kitchen and he swore that within five or six weeks while he lodged there he twice saw the same thing and that was a lady in a hood and a loose dress her head drooping and her finger on her lip walking in silence among the crooked stems with a little child by the hand who ran smiling and skipping beside her and the widow cresswell once met them at nightfall on the path through the orchard to the back door and she did not know what it was until she saw the men looking at one another as she told it it's often she told it to me said old sally and how she came on them all of a sudden at the turn of the path just by the thick clump of alder trees and how she stopped thinking it was some lady that had a right to be there and how they went by as swift as the shadow of a cloud though she only seemed to be walking slow enough and the little child pulling by her arm this way and that way and took no notice of her nor even raised her head though she stopped and curtsied and old dalton don't you remember old dalton miss lily i think i do 
the old man who limped and wore the old black wig yes indeed akushla so he did see how well she remembers that was by a kick of one of the earl's horses he was groom there resumed sally he used to be troubled with hearing the very sounds his master used to make to bring him and old oliver to the door when he came back late it was only on very dark nights when there was no moon they used to hear all of a sudden the whimpering and scraping of dogs at the hall door and the sound of the whistle and the light stroke across the window with the lash of the whip just like as if the earl himself may his poor soul find rest was there first the wind did stop like you'd be holding your breath then came these sounds they knew so well and when they made no sign of stirring or opening the door the wind would begin again with such a hoo hoo oo oo hi you'd think it was laughing and crying and hooting all at once here old sally's tale and her knitting ceased for a moment as if she were listening to the wind outside the haunted precincts of the tiled house and she took up her parable again the very night he met his death in england old oliver the butler was listening to dalton for dalton was a scholar reading the letter that came to him through the post that day telling him to get things ready for his troubles were nearly over and he expected to be with them again in a few days and maybe almost as soon as the letter and sure enough while he was reading there comes a frightful rattle at the window like someone all in a tremble trying to shake it open and the earl's voice as they both conceited cries from outside let me in let me in let me in it's him says the butler tis so be dad says dalton and they both looked at the windy and at one another and then back again overjoyed in a sort of a way and frightened all at once old oliver was bad with the rheumatiz so away goes dalton to the hall door and he calls who's there and no answer maybe says dalton to himself tis what he's rid round to the back door so to the back door with him and there he shouts again and no answer and not a sound outside and he began to feel queer and to the hall door with him back again who's there do you hear who's there he shouts and receives no answer still i'll open the door at any rate says he maybe it's what he's made his escape for they knew all about his troubles and wants to get in without noise so praying all the time for his mind misgave him it might not be all right he shifts the bars and unlocks the door but neither man woman nor child nor horse nor any living shape was standing there only something or other slipped into the house close by his leg it might be a dog or something that way he could not tell for he only seen it for a moment with the corner of his eye and it went in just like as if it belonged to the place he could not see which way it went up or down but the house was never a happy one or a quiet house after and dalton bangs the hall door and he took a sort of a turn and a trembling and back with him to oliver the butler looking as white as the blank leaf of his master's letter that was between his finger and thumb what is it what is it says the butler 
catching his crutch like a weapon fastening his eyes on dalton's white face and growing almost as pale himself the master's dead says dalton and so he was signs on it after the turn she got by what she seen in the orchard when she came to know the truth of what it was jinny cresswell you may be sure did not stay there an hour longer than she could help and she began to take notice of things she did not mind before such as when she went into the big bedroom over the hall that the lord used to sleep in whenever she went in at one door the other door used to be pulled too very quick as if someone avoiding her was getting out in haste but the thing that frightened her most was just this that sometimes she used to find a long straight mark from the head to the foot of her bed as if twas made by something heavy lying there and the place where it was used to feel warm as if whoever it was they only left it as she came into the room but the worst of all was poor kitty haplin the young woman that died of what she seen her mother said it was how she was kept awake all the night with the walking about of someone in the next room tumbling about boxes and pulling over drawers and talking and sighing to himself and she poor thing wishing to go asleep and wondering who it could be when in he comes a fine man in a sort of loose silk morning dress and no wig but a velvet cap on and to the windy with him quiet and easy and she makes a turn in the bed to let him know there was some one there thinking he'd go away but instead of that over he comes to the side of the bed looking very bad and says something to her but his speech was thick and choking like a dummy's that'd be trying to spake and she grew very frightened and says she i ask your honour's pardon sir but i can't hear you right and with that he stretches up his neck nigh out of his cravat turning his face up towards the ceiling and grace between us and harm his throat was cut across and wide open she seen no more but dropped in a dead faint in the bed and back to her mother with her in the morning and she never swallowed bit or sup more only she just sat by the fire holding her mother's hand crying and trembling and peeping over her shoulder and starting with every sound till she took the fever and died poor thing not five weeks after and so on and on and on flowed the stream of old sally's narrative while lilius dropped into dreamless sleep and then the story-teller stole away to her own tidy bedroom and innocent slumbers End of chapter 11 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 12 of The House by the Churchyard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lufanu chapter twelve some odd facts about the tiled house being an authentic narrative of the ghost of the hand i'm sure she believed every word she related for old sally was voracious but all this was worth just as much as such talk commonly is marvels fabulae what our ancestors called winter's tales which gathered details from every narrator and dilated in the act of narration 
still it is not quite for nothing that the house was held to be haunted under all this smoke there smouldered just a little spark of truth an authenticated mystery for the solution of which some of my readers may possibly suggest a theory though i confess i can't miss rebecca chatsworth in a letter dated in the autumn of seventeen fifty three gives a minute and curious relation of occurrences in the tiled house which it is plain although at starting she protests against all such fooleries she has heard with a peculiar sort of interest and relates it certainly with an awful sort of particularity i was for printing the entire letter which is really very singular as well as characteristic but my publisher meets me with his veto and i believe he is right the worthy old lady's letter is perhaps too long and i must rest content with a few hungry notes of its tenor that year and somewhere about the twenty fourth october there broke out a strange dispute between mr alderman harper of high street dublin and my lord castle mallard who in virtue of his cousinship to the young heir's mother had undertaken for him the management of the tiny estate on which the tiled or tiled house for i find it spelt both ways stood this alderman harper had agreed for a lease of the house for his daughter who was married to a gentleman named prosser he furnished it and put up hangings and otherwise went to considerable expense mr and mrs prosser came there some time in june and after having parted with a good many servants in the interval she made up her mind that she could not live in the house and her father waited on lord castle mallard and told him plainly that he would not take out the lease because the house was subjected to annoyances which he could not explain in plain terms he said it was haunted and that no servants would live there more than a few weeks and that after what his son-in-law's family had suffered there not only should he be excused from taking a lease of it but that the house itself ought to be pulled down as a nuisance and the habitual haunt of something worse than human malefactors lord castle mallard filed a bill in the equity side of the exchequer to compel mr alderman harper to perform his contract by taking out the lease but the alderman drew an answer supported by no less than seven long affidavits copies of all which were furnished to his lordship and with the desired effect for rather than compel him to place them upon the file of the court his lordship struck and consented to release him I am sorry the cause did not proceed at least far enough to place upon the files of the court the very authentic and unaccountable story which Miss Rebecca relates. The annoyances described did not begin till the end of August, when one evening Mrs. Prosser, quite alone, was sitting in the twilight at the back parlor window, which was open, looking out into the orchard and plainly saw a hand stealthily placed upon the stone window sill outside as if by someone beneath the window at her right side intending to climb up there was nothing but the hand which was rather short but handsomely formed and white and plump laid on the edge of the window sill and it was not a very young hand but one aged somewhere about forty as she conjectured it was only a few weeks before that the horrible robbery at clondalkin had taken place and the lady fancied that the hand was that of one of the miscreants who was now about to scale the windows of the tiled house she uttered a loud scream and an ejaculation of terror and at the same moment the hand was quietly withdrawn search was made in the orchard but no indications of any persons 
having been under the window beneath which ranged along the wall stood a great column of flower-pots which it seemed must have prevented any one's coming within reach of it the same night there came a hasty tapping every now and then at the window of the kitchen the women grew frightened and the servant man taking firearms with him opened the back door but discovered nothing as he shut it however he said a thump came on it at a pressure as of somebody striving to force his way in which frightened him and though the tapping went on upon the kitchen window panes he made no further explorations about six o'clock on the saturday evening following the cook an honest sober woman now aged nigh sixty years being alone in the kitchen saw on looking up it is supposed the same fat but aristocratic-looking hand laid with its palm against the glass near the side of the window and this time moving slowly up and down pressed all the while against the glass as if feeling carefully for some inequality in its surface she cried out and said something like a prayer on seeing it but it was not withdrawn for several seconds after after this for a great many nights there came at first a low and afterwards an angry rapping as it seemed with a set of clenched knuckles at the back door and the servant man would not open it but called to know who was there and there came no answer only a sound as if the palm of the hand was placed against it and drawn slowly from side to side with a sort of soft groping motion all this time sitting in the back parlor which for the time they used as a drawing-room mr and mrs prosser were disturbed by rappings at the window sometimes very low and furtive like a clandestine signal and at others sudden and so loud as to threaten the breaking of the pane this was all at the back of the house which looked upon the orchard as you know but on a tuesday night at about half past nine there came precisely the same rapping at the hall door and went on to the great annoyance of the master and terror of his wife at intervals for nearly two hours after this for several days and nights they had no annoyance whatsoever and began to think that nuisance had expended itself but on the night of the thirteenth september jane easterbrook an english maid having gone into the pantry for the small silver bowl in which her mistress's posset was served happening to look up at the little window of only four panes observed through an auger hole which was drilled through the window frame for the admission of a bolt to secure the shutter a white pudgy finger first the tip and then the two first joints introduced and turned about this way and that crooked against the inside as if in search of a fastening which its owner designed to push aside when the maid got back into the kitchen we are told she fell into a swound and was all the next day very weak mr prosser being i've heard a hard-headed and conceited sort of fellow scouted the ghost and sneered at the fears of his family he was privately of opinion that the whole affair was a practical joke or a fraud and waited an opportunity of catching the rogue flagrante delicto he did not long keep this theory to himself but let it out by degrees with no stint of oaths and threats believing that some domestic traitor held the thread of the conspiracy indeed it was time something were done for not only his servants but good mrs prosser herself had grown to look unhappy and anxious they kept at home from the hour of sunset and would not venture about the house after nightfall except in couples 
the knocking had ceased for about a week when one night mrs prosser being in the nursery her husband who was in the parlor heard it begin very softly at the hall door the air was quite still which favored his hearing distinctly this was the first time there had been any disturbance at that side of the house and the character of the summons was changed mr prosser leaving the parlor door open it seems went quietly into the hall the sound was that of beating on the outside of the stout door softly and regularly with the flat of the hand he was going to open it suddenly but changed his mind and went back very quietly and on to the head of the kitchen stair where was a strong closet over the pantry in which he kept his firearms swords and canes here he called his manservant whom he believed to be honest and with a pair of loaded pistols in his own coat pockets and giving another pair to him he went as lightly as he could followed by the man and with a stout walking cane in his hand forward to the door everything went as mr prosser wished the besieger of his house so far from taking fright at their approach grew more impatient and the sort of padding which had aroused his attention at first assumed the rhythm and emphasis of a series of double knocks mr prosser angry opened the door with his right arm across cane in hand looking he saw nothing but his arm was jerked up oddly as it might be with the hollow of a hand and something passed under it with a kind of gentle squeeze the servant neither saw nor felt anything and did not know why his master looked back so hastily cutting with his cane and shutting the door with so sudden a slam from that time mr prosser discontinued his angry talk and swearing about it and seemed nearly as averse from the subject as the rest of his family he grew in fact very uncomfortable feeling an inward persuasion that when in answer to the summons he had opened the hall door he had actually given admission to the besieger he said nothing to mrs prosser but went up earlier to his bedroom where he read a while in his bible and said his prayers i hope the particular relation of the circumstance does not indicate its singularity he lay awake a good while it appears and as he supposed about a quarter past twelve he heard the soft palm of a hand patting on the outside of the bedroom door and then brushed slowly along it up bounced mr prosser very much frightened and locked the door crying who's there but receiving no answer but the same brushing sound of a soft hand drawn over the panels which he knew only too well in the morning the housemaid was terrified by the impression of a hand in the dust of the little parlor table where they had been unpacking delft and other things the day before the print of the naked foot in the sea sand did not frighten robinson crusoe half so much they were by this time all nervous and some of them half crazed about the hand mr prosser went to examine the mark and made light of it but as he swore afterwards rather to quiet his servants than from any comfortable feeling about it in his own mind however he had them all one by one into the room and made each place his or her hand palm downward on the same table thus taking a similar impression from every person in the house including himself and his wife and his affidavit deposed that the formation of the hand so impressed differed altogether from those of the living inhabitants of the house and corresponded with that of the hand seen by mr prosser and by the cook whoever or whatever the owner of that hand might be 
they all felt this subtle demonstration to mean that it was declared he was no longer out of doors but had established himself in the house and now mrs prosser began to be troubled with strange and horrible dreams some of which as set out in detail in aunt rebecca's long letter are really very appalling nightmares but one night as mr prosser closed his bedchamber door he was struck somewhat by the utter silence of the room there being no sound of breathing which seemed unaccountable to him as he knew his wife was in bed and his ears were particularly sharp there was a candle burning on a small table at the foot of the bed beside the one he held in one hand a heavy ledger connected with his father-in-law's business being under his arm he drew the curtain at the side of the bed and saw mrs prosser lying as for a few seconds he mortally feared dead her face being motionless white covered with a cold dew and on the pillow close beside her head and just within the curtains was as he first thought a toad but really the same fattish hand the wrist resting on the pillow and the fingers extended towards her temple mr prosser with a horrified jerk pitched the ledger right at the curtains behind which the owner of the hand might be supposed to stand the hand was instantaneously and smoothly snatched away the curtains made a great wave and mr prosser got round the bed in time to see the closet door which was at the other side pulled too by the same white puffy hand as he believed he drew the door open with a fling and stared in but the closet was empty except for the clothes hanging from the pegs on the wall and the dressing-table and looking-glass facing the windows he shut it sharply and locked it and felt for a minute he says as if he were like to lose his wits then ringing at the bell he brought the servants and with much ado they recovered mrs prosser from a sort of trance in which he says from her looks she seemed to have suffered the pains of death and aunt rebecca adds from what she told me of her visions with her own lips he might have added and of hell also but the occurrence which seems to have determined the crisis was the strange sickness of their eldest child a little boy aged between two and three years he lay awake seemingly in paroxysms of terror and the doctors who were called in set down the symptoms to incipient water on the brain mrs prosser used to sit up with the nurse by the nursery fire much troubled in mind about the condition of her child his bed was placed sideways along the wall with its head against the door of a press or cupboard which however did not shut quite close there was a little valance about a foot deep round the top of the child's bed and this descended within some ten or twelve inches of the pillow on which it lay they observed that the little creature was quieter whenever they took it up and held it on their laps they had just replaced him as he seemed to have grown quite sleepy and tranquil but he was not five minutes in his bed when he began to scream in one of his frenzies of terror at the same moment the nurse for the first time detected and mrs prosser equally plainly saw following the direction of her eyes the real cause of the child's sufferings protruding through the aperture of the press and shrouded in the shade of the valance they plainly saw the white fat hand palm downwards presented towards the head of the child the mother uttered a scream and snatched the child from its little bed and she and the nurse ran down to the lady's sleeping-room where mr prosser was in bed shutting the door as they entered and they had hardly done so when a gentle tap came to it from the outside 
there is a great deal more but this will suffice the singularity of the narrative seems to me to be this that it describes the ghost of a hand and no more the person to whom that hand belonged never once appeared nor was it a hand separated from a body but only a hand so manifested and introduced that its owner was always by some crafty accident hidden from view in the year eighteen nineteen at a college breakfast i met a mr prosser a thin grave but rather chatty old gentleman with very white hair drawn back into a pigtail and he told us all with a concise particularity a story of his cousin james prosser who when an infant had slept for some time in what his mother said was a haunted nursery in an old house near chapel is it and who whenever he was ill over fatigued or in any wise feverish suffered all through his life as he had done from a time he could scarce remember from a vision of a certain gentleman fat and pale every curl of whose wig every button and fold of whose laced clothes and every feature and line of whose sensual benignant and unwholesome face was as minutely engraven upon his memory as the dress and liniments of his own grandfather's portrait which hung before him every day at breakfast dinner and supper mr prosser mentioned this as an instance of a curiously monotonous individualized and persistent nightmare and hinted the extreme horror and anxiety with which his cousin of whom he spoke in the past tense as poor jemmy was at any time induced to mention it i hope the reader will pardon me for loitering so long in the tiled house for this sort of lore has always had a charm for me and people you know especially old people will talk of what most interests themselves too often forgetting that others may have had more than enough of it end of chapter 12 recording by john brandon chapter 13 of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefanu chapter 13 in which the rector visits the tiled house and dr toole looks after the brass castle next morning toole sauntering along the low road towards the mills as usual bawling at his dogs who scampered and nuzzled hither and thither round and about him saw two hackney coaches and a noddy arrive at the brass castle a tall old house by the river with a little bit of a flower garden half a dozen poplars and a few old privet hedges about it and being aware that it had been taken the day before for mr dangerfield for three months he slackened his pace in the hope of seeing that personage of whom he had heard great things take sison of his tabernacle he was disappointed however the great man had not arrived only a sour-faced fussy old lady mrs jukes his housekeeper and a servant wench and a great lot of boxes and trunks and so leaving the coachman grumbling and swearing at the lady who bitter shrill and voluble was manifestly well able to fight her own battles he strolled back to the phoenix where a new evidence of the impending arrival met his view in an english groom with three horses which the hostler and he were leading into the inn yard there were others too agreeably fidgeted about his arrival the fair miss magnolia for instance and her enterprising parent the agreeable mrs mcnamara who both as they gaped and peeped from the windows 
bouncing up from the breakfast table every minute to the silent distress of quiet little major o'neill painted all sorts of handsome portraits and agreeable landscapes and cloud-clapped castles each for her private contemplation on the spreading canvas of her hopes dr walsingham rode down to the tiled house where workmen were already preparing to make things a little more comfortable the towering hall door stood half open and down the broad stairs his tall slim figure showing black against the light of the discolored lobby window his raven hair reaching to his shoulders mervyn the pale large-eyed genius of that haunted place came to meet him he led him into the cedar parlor the stained and dusty windows of which opened upon that moss-grown orchard among whose great trunks and arches those strange shapes were said sometimes to have walked at night like penitents and mourners through cathedral pillars it was a reception as stately but as sombre and as beggarly withal as that of the master of ravenswood for there were but two chairs in the cedar parlor one with but three legs the other without a bottom so they were fain to stand but mervyn could smile without bitterness and his desolation had not the sting of actual poverty as he begged the rector to excuse his dreary welcome and hoped that he would find things better the next time their little colloquy got on very easily for mervyn liked the rector and felt a confidence in him which was comfortable and almost exhilarating the doctor had a cheery kindly robust voice and a good honest emphasis in his talk a guileless blue eye a face furrowed thoughtful and benevolent well formed too he must have been a handsome curate in his day not uncourtly but honest the politeness of a gentle and tender heart very courteous and popular among ladies although he sometimes forgot that they knew no latin so mervyn drew nigh to him in spirit and liked him and talked to him rather more freely though even that was enigmatically enough than he had to anybody else for a long time it would seem that the young man had formed no very distinct plan of life he appeared to have some thought of volunteering to serve in america and some of entering into a foreign service but his plans were i suppose in nubibus all that was plain was that he was restless and eager for some change any it was not a very long visit you may suppose and just as dr walsingham rode out of the avenue lord castle mallard was riding leisurely by towards chapel is it followed by his groom his lordship though he had a drowsy way with him was esteemed rather an active man of business being really i'm afraid only what is termed a fidget and the fact is his business would have been better done if he had looked after it a good deal less he was going down to the town to see whether dangerfield had arrived and slackened his pace to allow the doctor to join him for he could ride with him more comfortably than with parsons generally the doctor being well descended and having married besides into a good family he stared as he passed at the old house listlessly and peevishly he had heard of mervyn's doings there and did not like them yes sir he's a very pretty young man and very well dressed said his lordship with manifest dissatisfaction but i don't like meeting him you know tis not his fault but one can't help thinking of of things and i'd be glad his friends would advise him not to dress in velvets you know particularly black velvets you can understand i could not help thinking at the time of a pall somehow i'm not no not pleasant near him no i i can't his face is so pale 
you don't often see so pale a face no it looks like a reflection from one that's still paler you understand and in short even in his perfumes there's a taint of of you know a taint of blood sir then there was a pause during which he kept slapping his boot peevishly with his little riding whip one can't of course but be kind he recommenced i can't do much i can't make him acceptable you know but i pity him dr walsingham and i tried to be kind to him you know that for ten years i had all the trouble sir of a guardian without the authority of one yes of course we're kind but body o me sir he'd be better anywhere else than here and without occupation you know quite idle and so conspicuous i promise you there are more than i who think it and he has commenced fitting up that vile old house that vile house sir it is ready to tumble down upon my life they say so nutter says so and stirk dr stirk of the artillery here an uncommon sensible man you know says so too tis a vile house and ready to tumble down and you know the trouble i was put to by that corporation fellow ah uh, what's his name about it and he can't let it people servants won't stay in it you know the people tell such stories about it i'm told and what business has he here you know it is all very fine for a week or so but they'll find him out they will sir he may call himself mervyn or fitzgerald or thompson sir or any other name but it won't do sir no dr walsingham it won't do the people down in this little village here sir are play guy sharp they're cunning upon my life i believe they're too hard for nutter in fact stirk had been urging on his lordship the purchase of this little property which for many reasons ought to be had a bargain and it joined lord castle mallard's and it talked him into viewing it quite as an object no wonder then he should look at mervyn's restorations and residence in the light of an impertinence and an intrusion End of chapter 13 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 14 of The House by the Churchyard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by John Brandon The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu Chapter 14 Relating How Puddock Purged O'Flaherty's Head, a chapter which it is hoped no genteel person will read. Rum disagreed with O'Flaherty confoundedly, but being sanguine, and also of an obstinate courage not easily to be put down, and liking that fluid, and being young withal, he drank it defiantly and liberally whenever it came in his way. So this morning he announced to his friend Puddock that he was suffering under a headache that had burst up hot the gallant fellow's stomach too was qualmish and disturbed he heard of breakfast with loathing puddick rather imperiously insisted on his drinking some tea which he abhorred and of which in very imperfect clothing and with deep groans and occasional imprecations of that beastly claret to which he chose to ascribe his indisposition he drearily partook i tell you what sir said puddick finding his patient nothing better and not relishing the notion of presenting his man in that seedy condition upon the field i've got a remedy a very simple one it used to do wondreth for my poor uncle neagle who loved rum shrub though it gave him the headache always and sometimes the gout and puddick had up mrs hogg his landlady and ordered a pair of little muslin bags about the size of a pistol cartridge each, which she promised to prepare in five minutes, 
and he himself tumbled over the leaves of his private manuscript quarto a desultory and miscellaneous album stuffed with sonnets on celia's eye a lock of hair or a pansy here and there pressed between the pages birthday verses addressed to saccharissa receipts for puptons farces etc and several for toilet luxuries angelica water the queen of hungary's ditto surfeit waters and finally that he was in search of to wit my great aunt bell's recipe for purging the head good against melancholy or the headache you are not to suppose that the volume was slovenly or in any wise unworthy of a gentleman and officer of those days it was bound in red and gold had two handsome silver gilt clips and red edges the writing being exquisitely straight and legible and without a single blot i have them all except two three murmured the thoughtful puddick when he read over the list of ingredients these however he got from tool close at hand and with a little silver grater and a pretty little agate pocket pestle and mortar an heirloom derived from poor aunt bell he made a wonderful powder nutmeg and ginger cinnamon and cloves as the song says and every other stinging product of nature and chemistry which the author of this famous family purge for the head could bring to remembrance and certainly it was potent with this the cartridges were loaded the ends tied up and o'flaherty placed behind a table on which stood a basin commenced the serious operation under puddick's directions by introducing a bag at each side of his mouth which as a man of honour he was bound to retain there until puddick had had his morning tete-a-tete with the barber those who please to consult old domestic receipt books of the last century will find the whole process very exactly described therein be the powers sir that was the stuff said o'flaherty discussing the composition afterwards with an awful shake of his head my chops were blazing before you could count twenty it was martyrdom but anything was better than the incapacity which threatened and certainly by the end of five minutes his head was something better in this satisfactory condition jerome being in the back garden brushing his regimentals and preparing his other properties he suddenly heard voices close to the door and gracious powers one was certainly magnolia's that born devil jody carroll blazed forth o'flaherty afterwards pushed open the door it served me right for not being in my bedroom and the door locked the who'd have thought there was such a cruel idiot on earth bad luck to her as to show a lady into a gentleman with scarcely the half of his clothes on and undergoing a sort of an operation i may say happily the table behind which he stood was one of those old-fashioned toilet affairs with the back part which was turned toward the door sheeted over with wood so that his ungartered stockings and rascally old slippers were invisible even so it was bad enough he was arrayed in a shabby old silk roquelaire and there was a towel upon his breast thin behind his neck he had just a second to pop the basin under the table and to whisk the towel violently from under his chin drying that feature with merciless violence when the officious judy carroll grand chamberlain in jerome's absence with the facetious grin of a good-natured lady about to make two people happy introduced the bewitching magnolia and her meek little uncle major o'neill in they came rejoicing to ask the gallant fireworker it was a different element just now to make one of a party of pleasure to lickslip o'flaherty could not so much as hand the young lady a chair to emerge from behind the table or even to attempt a retreat was of course not to be thought of in the existing state of affairs the action of puddick's recipe was such as to make his share in the little complimentary conversation that ensued 
very indistinct, and to oblige him to his disgrace and despair when the poor fellow tried to smile, actually to apply his towel hastily to his mouth. He saw that his visitors observed those symptoms with some perplexity. The major was looking steadfastly at O'Flaherty's lips and unconsciously making corresponding movements with his own, and the fair magnolia was evidently full of pleasant surprise and curiosity. I really think, if O'Flaherty had had a pistol within reach, he would have been tempted to deliver himself summarily from that agonizing situation. I'm afraid, Lieutenant, you've got the toothache, said Miss Mag, with her usual agreeable simplicity. In his alacrity to assure her there was no such thing, he actually swallowed one of the bags. "'Twas no easy matter, and he grew very red and stared frightfully, and swallowed a draught of water precipitately. His misery was indeed so great that at the conclusion of a polite little farewell speech of the Major's, he uttered an involuntary groan, and lively Miss Mag, with an odious titter, exclaimed, "'The little creature's teething, Uncle, as sure as you're not, either that, or he's got a hot potato in his poor little mousy wowsy And poor O'Flaherty smiled, a great silent moist smile, at the well-bred pleasantry. The Major, who did not choose to hear Mag's banter, made a formal but rather smiling salute. The lieutenant returned it, and down came the unlucky mortar and a china plate, on which Puddick had mingled the ingredients, with a shocking crash and jingle on the bare boards. A plate and mortar. Never made such a noise before, O'Flaherty thought, with a mental imprecation. Nothing hash happened, sure, said O'Flaherty, whose articulation was affected a good deal, in terror lest the Major should arrest his departure. So the Major and tall Miss Magnolia, with all her roses and lilies, and bold broad talk and her wicked eyes, went down the stairs, and O'Flaherty, looking with lively emotion in the glass, at the unbecoming coup de eel, heard that agreeable young lady laughing most riotously under the windows, as she and the Major marched away. It was well for Judy that, being of the gentler sex, the wrath of the fireworker could not wreak itself upon her. The oftener he viewed himself in the pier glass, trying in vain to think he did not look so very badly after all, the more bitter were his feelings. Oh, that villainous old silk morning gown! And his eyes so confoundedly red, and his hair all disheveled. Bad luck to that claret! The wig was all right. That was his only comfort. And his mouth, ach, look at it, twice its normal size, though there was no trifle. Another week, I'll not stop in her lodgings, cried poor O'Flaherty, grinning at himself in the glass, if she keeps that savage Judy Carroll here a day longer. Then he stumbled to the stairhead to call up for judgment but changed his mind and returned to the looking-glass, blowing the cooling air in short whistles through his peppered lips, and I'm sorry to say, blowing out also many an ejaculation and invective, as that sorry sight met his gaze in the oval mirror, which would have been much better not uttered. End of chapter 14 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 15 of The House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. Chapter 15 Aesculapius to the Rescue. It was not until Puddock had returned that the gallant fireworker recollected all of a sudden that he had swallowed one of the bags. Swallowed? Swallowed it? said Puddock, looking very blank and uncomfortable. Why, sir, I told you you were to be very careful. 
why why curse it it's not tisn't there was a long pause and o'flaherty stared a very frightened and hideous stare at the proprietor of the red quarto not what thir demanded puddock briskly but plainly disconcerted not anything anything bad or or there's no use in pretendin puddock he resumed turning quite yellow i see sir i see by your looks it's what you think i'm poisoned i i do not thir think you're poisoned he replied indignantly but with some flurry that is there's a great deal in it that could possibly do you harm there's only one ingredient yes or or yes perhaps three but certainly no more that i don't quite know about depend upon it tis nothing ah nothing ah seriously ah but why my dear thir why on earth did you violate the simple directions why did you swallow a particle of it ah why did i let you put it into my mouth at all the devil go with it retorted poor old flaherty and wasn't i the born idiot to put them devil's dumplings inside my mouth but i did not know what i was doing no more i didn't i hope your head's better said puddock vindicating by that dignified inquiry the character of his recipe ach my head be smathered what the puck do i care about it o'flaherty broke out ah why the devil puddock do you keep them old women's charums and devilments about you you'll be the death of someone yet so you will it's a recipe sir replied puddock with the same dignity from which my great uncle general neagle derived frequent benefit and here i am says o'flaherty vehemently and you don't know whether i'm poisoned or no at this moment he saw dr stirk passing by and drummed violently at the window the doctor was impressed by the summons for however queer the apparition it was plain he was desperately in earnest let's see the recipe said stirk dryly you think you're poisoned i know you do poor o'flaherty had shrunk from disclosing the extent of his apprehensions and only beat about the bush and if you do i lay you fifty i can't save you nor all the doctors in dublin show me the recipe Puddick put it before him and stirk looked at the back of the volume with a leisurely disdain but finding no title there returned to the recipe they both stared on his face without breathing while he conned it over when he came about halfway he whistled and when he arrived at the end he frowned hard and squeezed his lips together till the red disappeared altogether and he looked again at the back of the book and then turned it round once more reading the last line over with a severe expression and so you actually swallowed this this devil's dose sir did you demanded stirk i i believe he did some of it but i warned him i did upon my honour now tell him did i not warn you my dear lieutenant not to swallow interposed little puddock who began to grow confoundedly agitated but stirk who rather liked shocking and frightening people and had a knack of making bad worse and an alacrity in waxing savage without adequate cause silenced him with i pity you sir and pity shot like a pellet from his lips why the deuce will you dabble in medicine sir do you think it's a thing to be learnt in an afternoon out of the bottom of an old cookery book cookery book excuse me dr stirk replied puddock offended i'm given to understand sir it's to be found in culpepper culpepper said stirk viciously cold poison you've peppered him to a purpose 
i promise you how much of it pray sir to a flaherty have you got in your stomach tell him puddick said o'flaherty helplessly only a trifle i assure you extenuated puddick i need not spell his lisp in a little muslin bag about the size of the top joint of a lady's little finger top joint o oh, the devil roared o'flaherty bitterly rousing himself i tell you dr stirk it was as big as my thumb and a miracle it did not choke me it may do that job for you yet sir sneered the doctor with a stern disgust i dare say you feel pretty hot here jerking his finger into his stomach and 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 what is it is it do you think it's anything anyways dangerous faltered poor o'flaherty dangerous responded stirk with an angry chuckle indeed he was specially vindictive against lay intruders upon the mystery of his craft why yes ha <laughs> ha just maybe a little it's only poison sir deadly barefaced poison he began sardonically with a grin and ended with a black glare and a knock on the table like an auctioneer's gone there are no less than two three five mortal poisons in it said the doctor with emphatic acerbity you and mr puddick will allow that's rather strong O'Flaherty well, sat down and looked at Stirk, and wiping his damp face and forehead, he got up without appearing to know where he was going. Puddock stood with his hands in his breeches pockets, staring with his little round eyes on the doctor. I must confess, with a very foolish and rather guilty vacuity all over his plump face, rigid and speechless, for three or four seconds. Then he put his hand, which did actually tremble upon the doctor's arm and he said very thickly i feel sir you're right it is my fault sir i poisoned him mirthful goodness i i puddick's address acted for a moment on o'flaherty he came up to him pale and queer like a somnambulist and shook his fingers very cordially with a very cold grasp if it was the last word i ever spoke puddock you're a good-natured he's a gentleman sir and it was all my own fault he warned me he did again swallowing in a drop of it remember what i'm saying doctor twas i that done it i was always a botch puddock and a fool and and gentlemen good-bye and the flowered dressing-gown and ungartered stockings disappeared through the door into the bedroom from whence they heard a great souse on the bed and the bedstead gave a dismal groan is there is there nothing doctor for mercy's sake think doctor do i conjure you pray think there must be something urged puddock imploringly ay that's the way sir fellows quacking themselves and one another when they get frightened and with good reason come to us and expect miracles but as in this case the quantity was not very much tis not you see overpowering and he may do if he takes what i'll send him puddick was already at his bedside shaking his hand hysterically and tumbling his words out one over the other you're thief my dear thur thumb thero thero he thayeth dr thirk he can thave you my dear thur my dear lieutenant my dear o'flaherty he can thave you thur thafe and found thur o'flaherty who had turned his face to the wall in the bitterness of his situation for like some other men he had the intensest horror of death when he came peaceably to his bedside though ready enough to meet him with a hurrah and a wave of his rapier if he arrived at a moment's notice with doodash and eclay sat up like a shot and gaping upon puttock for a few seconds relieved himself with a long sigh a devotional upward roll of his eyes and some muttered words of which 
the little ensign heard only blessing very fervently and catch me again and divil bellows it and forthwith out came one of the fireworkers long shanks and o'flaherty insisted on dressing shaving and otherwise preparing as a gentleman and an officer with great gaiety of heart to meet his fate on the fifteen acres in due time arrived the antidote it was enclosed in a gallipot and what was i believe they call an electuary i don't know whether it is an obsolete abomination now but it looked like brick dust and treacle and what it was made of even put it could not divine o'flaherty that great hibernian athlete unconsciously winced and shuddered like a child at sight of it put it stirred it with the tip of a teaspoon and looked into it with inquisitive disgust and seemed to smell it from a distance lost for a minute in inward conjecture and then with a slight bow pushed it ceremoniously toward his brother in arms there is not much the matter with me now i feel well enough said o'flaherty mildly and eyeing the mixture askance and after a little while he looked at puddock that disciplinarian understood the look and said peremptorily shaking his little powdered head and lisping vehemently lieutenant o'flaherty sir i insist on your instantly taking that physic how you may feel sir has nothing to do with it if you hesitate i withdraw my sanction to your going to the field sir there's no there can be no earthly excuse but a a miserable objection to a swallowing a recipe sir that isn't that is maybe not intended to please the palate but to save your life sir remember sir you've swallowed uh you require sir you don't think i fear to say it sir you have swallowed that you ought not to have swallowed and don't sir don't for both our sakes for heaven's sake i implore and insist don't trifle sir o'flaherty felt himself passing under the chill and dismal shadow of death once more such was the eloquence of puddock and so irrepressible his own nature as he followed the appeal of his second life is sweet and though the compound was nauseous and the necessity upon him of swallowing it in horrid instalments spoonful after spoonful yet though not without many interruptions and many a shocking apostrophe and even some sudden paroxysms of horror which alarmed puddock he did contrive to get through it pretty well except a little residuum in the bottom which puddock wisely connived at the clink of a horseshoe drew puddock to the window stirk riding into town reined in his generous beast and called up to the little lieutenant well he's taken it eh puddock smiled a pleasant smile and nodded walk him about then for an hour or so and he'll do thank you sir said little puddock gaily don't thank me sir either of you but remember the lesson you've got said the doctor tartly and away he plunged into a sharp trot with a cling clang and a cloud of dust and puddock followed that ungracious leech with a stare of gratitude and admiration almost with a benediction and his anxiety relieved he and his principal prepared forthwith to provide real work for the surgeons end of chapter 15 recording by john brandon chapter 16 of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefanu chapter 16 the ordeal by battle the chronicles of the small sword and pistol are pregnant with horrid and absurd illustrations of certain great moral facts 
let them pass a duel we all know is conceived in the spirit of punch and judy a farce of murder stern's gallant father expired or near it with the point of a small sword sticking out two feet between his shoulders all about a goose pie i often wondered what the precise quarrel was but these tragedies smell all over of goose pie why oh why brave captain stern as with saucy flashing knife and fork you sported with the outworks of that fated structure was there no auger at thine elbow with the shake of his wintry beard to warn thee that thy birds of fate thy fate sat vigilant under that festive mask of crust beware it is pandora's pie madman hold thy hand the knife's point that seems to thee about to glide through that pasty is palpably levelled at thine own windpipe but this time mephistopheles leaves the revellers to use their own cutlery and now the pie is open and now the birds begin to sing come along then to the fifteen acres and let us see what will come of it all that flanking demi-bastion of the magazine crandled for musketry commands with the aid of a couple of good field glasses an excellent and sacred view of the arena on which the redoubted o'flaherty and the grim nutter were about to put their mettle to the proof general chatsworth who happened to have an appointment as he told his sister at breakfast in town about that hour forgot it just as he reached the magazine gave his bridle to the groom and stumped into the fortress where he had a biscuit and a glass of sherry in the commandant's little parlor and forth the two cronies sallied mysteriously side by side the commandant colonel bly being remarkably tall slim and straight with an austere mulberry-colored face the general stout and stumpy and smiling plentifully short of breath and double-chinned they got into the sanctum i have just mentioned i don't apologize to my readers english-born and bred for assuming them to be acquainted with the chief features of the phoenix park near dublin irish scenery is now as accessible as welsh let them study the old problem not in blue books but in the green and brown ones of our fields and heaths and mountains if ireland be no more than a great capability and a beautiful landscape faintly visible in the blue haze even from your own headlands and separated by hardly four hours of water and a ten shilling fare from your jetties it is your own shame not ours if a nation of bold speculators and indefatigable tourists leave it unexplored so i say from this coin of vantage looking westward over the broad green level toward the thin smoke that rose from the chapel is it chimneys lying so snugly in the lap of the hollow by the river the famous fifteen acres where so many heroes have measured swords and so many bullies have bit the dust was distinctly displayed in the near foreground you all know the artillery but well that was the centre of a circular enclosure containing just fifteen acres with broad entrances eastward and westward the old fellows knew very well where to look father roach was quite accidentally there reading his breviary when the hostile parties came upon the ground for except when an accident of this sort occurred or the troops were being drilled it was a sequestered spot enough and he forthwith joined them as usual to reconcile the dread debate somehow i think his arguments were not altogether judicious i don't ask particulars my dear i abominate all that concerns a quarrel but lieutenant o'flaherty jewel supposin the very worst supposin just for argument that he has horsewhipped you and who dar suppose it glared o'flaherty or we'll take it that he spit in your face honey well continued his reverence not choosing to hear the shocking ejaculations 
which this hypothesis wrung from the lieutenant what of that my darling think of the indignities insults and disgraces that the blessed saint martellus suffered without allowing anything worse to cross his lips than an ave mary or a smile in resignation order the priest off the ground sir said o'flaherty lividly to little puttick who was too busy with mr manny to hear him and roach had already transferred his pious offices to nutter who speedily flushed up and became to all appearances in his own way just as angry as o'flaherty lieutenant o'flaherty a word in your ear once more droned the mellow voice of father roach you're a young man my dear and here's lieutenant puttick by your side a young man too i'm as old my honeys as the two of you put together and i advise you for your good don't shed human blood don't even draw your swords don't my darlings don't be led or said by them army gentlemen that's always standin' up for fightin' because the ladies admire fightin' men. They'll call you cowards, all thrones, curs, sneaks, turn tails. Let them. There's no standin' this any longer, Puttick, said O'Flaherty, incensed indescribably by the odious names which his reverence was hypothetically accumulating. If you want to see the fightin', Father Roach, Agape, Satanus, murmured his reverence, pettishly raising his plump blue chin and dropping his eyelids with a shake of the head, and waving the back of his fat red hand gently towards the speaker. In that case, stay here and look your full, and welcome. Only don't make a noise behave like a christian and howled your tongue but if you really hate fightin as you say having reached this point in his address but intending a good deal more o'flaherty suddenly stopped short threw himself into a stooping posture with a flush and a strange distortion and his eyes fastened upon father roach with an unearthly glare for nearly two minutes and seized puttick upon the upper part of his arm with so awful a grip in his great bony hand that the gallant little gentleman piped out in a flurry of anguish oh 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 o'flaherty thur let go my arm thur o'flaherty drew a deep breath uttered a short deep groan and wiping the moisture from his red forehead and resuming a perpendicular position was evidently trying to recover the lost thread of his discourse. There decidedly something the matter with you, sir, said Puttick, anxiously, sotto voce, while he worked his injured arms a little at the shoulder. You may say that, said O'Flaherty very dismally, and perhaps a little bitterly. And, 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 you don't mean to say why, eh? asked Puttick uneasily. I tell you what, Puttock, there's no use in pretendin' the poison's workin'. That's what's the matter, returned poor old Flaherty, in what romance writers call a hissing whisper. Good, merciful gracious, sir, ejaculated poor little Puttock in a panic, and gazing up into the brawny fire worker's face with a pallid fascination. Indeed. They both looked unpleasantly unlike the popular conception of heroes on the eve of battle. But, but it can't be. You forgot Dr. Stirk and, oh dear, the antidote. It, I say, it can't be, sir, said Puttick rapidly. It's no use now, but I shirked two or three spoonfuls and I left some more in the bottom, said the gigantic O'Flaherty, with a gloomy sheepishness. Puttick made an ejaculation, the only violent one recorded of him, and turning his back briskly upon his principal, actually walked several steps away, as if he intended to cut the whole concern. 
but such a measure was really not to be thought of o'flaherty lieutenant i won't reproach you began puddock reproach me and who poisoned me my tight little fellow retorted the fireworker savagely puddock could only look at him and then said quite meekly well and my dear thur what on earth had we better do do said o'flaherty why isn't it completely hobson's choice with us what can we do but go through with it the fact is i may as well mention lest the sensitive reader should be concerned for the gallant o'flaherty that the poison had very little to do with it and the antidote a great deal in fact it was a reckless compound conceived in a cynical and angry spirit by stirk and as the fireworker afterwards declared while expressing in excited language his wonder how puddock for he never suspected stirk's elixir had contrived to compound such a poison the torture was such my dear madam as fairly translated me into the purlieus of the other world nutter had already put off his coat and waistcoat and appeared in a neat little black lute-string vest with sleeves to it which the elder officers of the r i a remembered well in bygone fencing matches tis a most miserable situation said puddock in extreme distress never mind groaned o'flaherty grimly taking off his coat you'll have two corpses to carry home with you don't you show the last taste of an aisiness and i'll not disgrace you if i'm spared to see it out and now preliminaries were quite adjusted and nutter light and wiry a good swordsman though not young stepped out with his vicious weapon in hand and his eyes looking white and stony out of his dark face a word or two to his armor-bearer and a rapid gesture right and left and that magnificent squire spoke low to two or three of the surrounding officers who forthwith bestirred themselves to keep back the crowd and as it were to keep the ring unbroken o'flaherty took his sword got his hand well into the hilt poised the blade shook himself up as it were and made a feint or two and a parry in the air and so began to advance like goliath towards little nutter now puddock back him up encourage your man said devereux who took a perverse pleasure in joking tell him to flay the lump splat him divide him and cut him into two pieces it was a custom of the corps to quiz puddock about his cookery but puddock i suppose did not hear his last night's receipt quoted and he kept his eye upon his man who had now got nearly within fencing distance of his adversary but at this critical moment o'flaherty much to puddock's disgust suddenly stopped and got into the old stooping posture making an appalling grimace in what looked like an endeavour to swallow not only his upper lip but his chin also uttering a quivering groan he continued to stoop nearer to the earth on which he finally actually sat down and hugged his knees close to his chest holding his breath all the time till he was perfectly purple and rocking himself this way and that the whole procedure was a mystery to everybody except the guilty puddock who changed colour and in manifest perturbation skipped to his side bless me bless me my dear old flowerty he's very ill where is the pain is it farce pain puddock or gammon pain asked devereux with much concern puddock's plump panic-stricken little face and staring eyeballs were approached close to the writhing features of his redoubted principal as i think i have seen honest sancho panza's in one of tony Jehanet's sketches to that of the prostrate knight of the rueful countenance 
i wish to heaven i'd followed it myself it's dreadful what it's to be are you ethier i think you're ethier i don't think o'flaherty heard him he only hugged his knees tighter and slowly turned up his face wrung into ten thousand horrid puckers to the sky till his chin stood as high as his forehead with his teeth and eyes shut and he uttered a sound like a half-stifled screech and indeed looked very black and horrible some of the spectators rear rank men having but an imperfect view of the transaction thought that o'flaherty had been hideously run through the body by his solemn opponent and swelled the general chorus of counsel and ejaculation by altogether advising cobwebs brown paper plugs clergymen brandy and the like but as none of these comforts were at hand and nobody stirred o'flaherty was left to the resources of nature Puddick threw his cocked hat upon the ground and stamped in a momentary frenzy. Heath dying! Devereux! Clough! Heath! I tell you, Heath dying! And he was on the point of declaring himself O'Flaherty's murderer and surrendering himself as such into the hands of anybody who would accept the custody of his person, when the recollection of his official position as poor O'Flaherty's second flashed upon him and collecting with a grand effort his wits and his graces if totally impossible gentlemen he said with his most ceremonious bow considering the awful condition of my principle i i have reason to fear in fact i know dr turk hath seen him that he's under the action of poison and it's quite impracticable gentlemen that this affair of honor can proceed at present. And Puddock drew himself up peremptorily and replaced his hat, which somebody had slipped into his hand upon his round powdered head. Mr. Mahoney, though a magnificent gentleman, was perhaps a little stupid, and he mistook Puddock's agitation and thought he was in a passion and disposed to be offensive. He therefore, with a marked and stern sort of elegance, replied, Pison, sir, is a remarkable strong alphabet. It's language, sir, which if a gentleman uses at all, he's bound in justice, in chivalry, and in decency to a generous adversary, to define with precision. Mr. Nutter is too well known to the best of society moving in a circle as he does to require the panegyric of humble me. They drank together last night. They differed in opinion, that's true. But fourteen clear hours has expired, and poison being mentioned. Why, body o oh me, sir, lisp Puddick, in fierce horror, can you imagine for one moment, sir, that I or any man living could suppose for an instant that my respected friend Mr. Nutter to whom a low bow to Nutter returned by that gentleman, I have now the misfortune to be opposed, is capable, capable, sir, of poisoning any living being, man, woman, or child, and to put an end, sir, at once, to all misapprehension upon this point. It was I, I, sir, myself, who poisoned him, altogether accidentally, of course, by a valuable but mismanaged receipt this morning, sir. You, you see, Mr. Nutter? Nutter balked of this gentlemanlike satisfaction, stared with a horrified but somewhat foolish countenance from Puddock to O'Flaherty. And now, sir, pursued Puddock, addressing himself to Mr. Manny, if Mr. Nutter desires to postpone the combat, I consent. If not, I offer myself to maintain it instead of my principle. And he made another low bow, and stood bareheaded, hat in hand, with his right hand on his sword hilt. Upon my honor, Captain Puddock, it's precisely what I was going to propose myself, sir, said Manny, with great alacrity, as the only way left of getting honorably out of the great embarrassment 
in which we are placed by the premature death struggles of your friend for nothing mr puddock but being bona fide in articulo mortis can palliate his conduct my dear puddock whispered devereux in his ear surely you would not kill nutter to oblige two such brutes as these indicating by a glance nutter's splendid second and the magnanimous o'flaherty who was still sitting speechless upon the ground captain puddock pursued the mirror of courtesy mr patrick manny of muckafuddle who by the way persisted in giving him his captaincy may i inquire who's your friend upon this unexpected turn of affairs there's no need sir said nutter dryly and stoutly i would not hurt a hair of your head lieutenant puddock do you hear him panted o'flaherty for the first time articulate and stung by the unfortunate phrase it seemed fated that nutter should not open his lips without making some allusion to human hair do you hear him puddock mr nutter he spoke with great difficulty and in jerks sir mr nutter you shall ah uh, you shall render a strict a cow ow oh um uh. the sound was smothered under his compressed lips his face wrung itself again crimson with a hideous squeeze and puddock thought the moment of his dissolution was come and almost wished it over don't try to speak pray sir don't there there now urged puddock distractedly but the injunction was unnecessary mr nutter said his second sulkily i don't see anything to satisfy your outraged honour in the curious spectacle of that gentleman sitting on the ground making faces we came here not to trifle but as i conceive to dispatch business sir to dispatch that unfortunate gentleman you mean and that seems pretty well done to your hand said little dr toole bustling up from the coach where his instruments lint and plasters were deposited what's it all eh oh dr stirk's been with him eh oh ho 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 and he laughed sarcastically in an undertone and shrugged as he stooped down and took o'flaherty's pulse in his fingers and thumb i tell you what mr eh uh, 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 sir said nutter with a very dangerous look i have had the honour of knowing lieutenant puddock since august seventeen fifty six i won't hurt him for i like and respect him but if fight i must i'll fight you sir since august seventeen fifty six repeated mr manny with prompt surprise who why didn't you mention that before why sir he's an old friend and you could not pleasantly ask him to volunteer to bear his weapon against the bosom of his friend no sir chivalry is the handmaid of christian charity and honour walks hand in hand with the human heart with this noble sentiment he bowed and shook nutter's cold hard hand and then put its plump little white paw you are not to suppose that pat mahony of muckafuddle was a poltroon on the contrary he had fought several shocking duels and displayed a remarkable amount of savagery and coolness but having made a character he was satisfied therewith they may talk of fighting for the fun of it liking it delighting in it don't believe a word of it we all hate it and the hero is only he who hates it least oh i can't take it any longer take me out of this some of you said o'flaherty wiping the damp from his red face i don't think there's ten minutes life in me de profundis conclamavi murmured fat father roach lean on me sir and me said little tool for the benefit of your poor soul my honey just say you forgive mr nutter before you leave the field said the priest quite sincerely anything at all father roach replied the sufferer only don't bother me you forgive him then arun said the priest ach father forgive him to be sure i do that's supposin mind i don't recover but if i do 
Ach, paceable, paceable, my son, said Father Roach, patting his arm and soothing him with his voice. It was the phrase he used to address to his nag, Brian O'Lynn, when Brian had too much oats and was disagreeably playful. Nonsense now. Can't you be paceable, paceable, my son? There now, paceable, paceable. Upon his two supporters, and followed by his little second, this towering sufferer was helped and tumbled into the coach, into which Puddock, Toole, and the priest, who was curious to see O'Flaherty's last moments, all followed, and they drove at a wild canter, for the coachman was hearty, over the green grass, and toward Chapel is it, though Toole broke the check-string without producing any effect, down the hill quite frightfully and were all within an ace of being capsized, but ultimately they reached in various states of mind, but safely enough, O'Flaherty's lodgings. Here the gigantic invalid, who had suffered another paroxysm on the way, was slowly assisted to the ground by his awestruck and curious friends, and entered the house with a groan, and roared for Judy Carroll with a curse, and invoked Jerome, the Kokang Modate, with horrible vociferation. And as among the hushed exhortations of the good priest, Toole and Puddock, he mounted the stairs. He took occasion over the banister in stentorian tones to proclaim to the household his own awful situation and the imminent approach of the moment of his disillusion. End of chapter 16 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 17 of The House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefano. Chapter 17. Lieutenant Puddock receives an invitation and a rap over the knuckles. The old gentleman from their peepholes in the magazine, watched the progress of this remarkable affair of honor, as well as they could, with the aid of their field-glasses, and through an interposing crowd. "'By Jupiter, sir, he's through him,' said Colonel Bly, when he saw O'Flaherty go down. "'So he is, by George,' replied General Chatsworth. "'But, eh, hey, which is he?' "'The long fellow,' said Bly. "'O'Flaherty?' Hey, no, by George, though so it is. There's work in Frank Nutter yet, by Jove, said the general, poking his glass and his fat face an inch or two nearer. Quick work, general, said Bly. Devilish, replied the general. The two worthies never move their glasses, as each on his inquisitive face wore the grim, wickedish half-smile, with which an old stager recalls, in the prowess of his juniors, the pleasant devilment of his own youth. The cool old hand, sir. Too much for your new fire-worker, remarked Bly cynically. Tut, sir, this O'Flaherty has not been three weeks among us, sputtered out the general, who was woundedly jealous of the honor of his corps. There are lads among our fire-workers who would whip Nutter through the liver while you'd count ten. They're removing the... the... A long pause. The body, eh? said Bly. Hey, no, see, by George, he's walking, but he's hurt. I'm mighty well pleased it's no worse, sir, said the general, honestly glad. They're helping him into the coach. Long legs the fellow's got, remarked Bly. These things, sir, are... are... very unpleasant said the general, adjusting the focus of the glass, and speaking slowly, though no Spanish dandy ever relished a bullfight more than he an affair of the kind. He and old Bly had witnessed no less than five, not counting this, in which officers of the RIA were principal performers from the same sung post of observation. The general indeed was conventionally supposed to know nothing of them, and to reprobate the practice itself with his whole soul. But somehow, when an affair of the sort came off on the fifteen acres, 
he always happened to drop in at the proper moment upon his old crony the colonel and they sauntered into the demi bastion together and quietly saw what was to be seen it was miss becky chatsworth who involved the poor general in this hypocrisy it was not exactly her money it was her force of will and unflinching audacity that established her control over an easy harmless plastic old gentleman they are unpleasant devilish unpleasant somewhere in the body i think hey they're stupin again stupin again eh leggy unpleasant sir the general was thinking how miss becky's tongue would wag and what she might not even do if o'flaherty died ha on they go again and uh puddick getting in and that's tool he's not so much hurt eh he helped himself a good deal you saw but taking heart of grace when a quarrel does occur sir i believe after all tis better off the stomach at once a few passes you know or the crack of a pistol who's that got in the priest hey why george awkward if he dies a papist said cynical old bligh the r i a were protestant by constitution that never happens in our corps sir said the general haughtily but as i say when a quarrel does occur sir they're off at last when it does occur i say heyday what a thundering pace a gallop by george that don't look well a pause and and uh, about what you were saying you know he couldn't die a papist in our corps no one does no one ever did it would be you know it would be a trick sir and o'flaherty's a gentleman it could not be he was thinking of miss becky again she was so fierce on the gunpowder plot the rising of sixteen forty two and jesuits in general and he went on a little flustered but then sir as i was saying though the thing has its uses i'd like to know where society'd be without it interposed bligh with a sneer though it may have its uses sir it's not a thing one can sit down and say is right we can't i've heard your sister miss becky speak strongly on that point too said bligh ah i dare say said the general quite innocently and coughing a little this was a sore point with the hand-pecked warrior and the grim scarecrow by his side knew it and grinned through his telescope and you see i say eh i think they're breaking up uh and i say i it seems all over eh and so dear colonel i must take my leave and and after a lingering look he shut up his glass and walking thoughtfully back with his friend said suddenly and now i think of it it could not be that puddick you know would not suffer the priest to sit in the same coach with such a design puddick's a good officer eh and knows his duty a few hours afterwards general chatsworth having just dismounted outside the artillery barracks to his surprise met puddick and o'flaherty walking leisurely in the street of chapel izzard o'flaherty looked pale and shaky and rather wild and the general returned his salute looking deuced hard at him and wondering all the time in what part of his body in his phrase he had got it and how the plague the doctors had put him so soon on his legs again ha ah, lieutenant puddock with a smile which puddock thought significant give you good evening sir dr toole anywhere about or have you seen stirk no he had not the general wanted to hear by accident or in confidence all about it and having engaged puddock in talk that officer followed by his side i should be glad of the honour of your company lieutenant puddock to dinner this evening stirk comes and captain clough and this wonderful mr dangerfield too of whom we all heard so much at mess 
at five o'clock if the invitation's not too late the lieutenant acknowledged and accepted with a blush and a very low bow his commanding officer's hospitality in fact there was a tender in the direction of belmont and little puddock had inscribed in his private book many charming stanzas of various lengths and structures in which the name of gertrude was of frequent recurrence and uh, i say puddock lieutenant o'flaherty i thought i i thought you see just now eh he looked inquisitively but there was no answer i thought i say he looked devilish out of sorts is he uh, ill he was very ill indeed this afternoon general a sudden attack the general looked quickly at puddock's plump consequential face but there was no further light in it he was hurt then i knew it he thought who's attending him and why is he out and was it a flesh wound or where was it all these questions silently but vehemently solicited an answer and he repeated the last aloud in a careless sort of way and uh, lieutenant puddock you were saying uh, tell me now where was it in the park general said puddock in perfect good faith eh ah uh, in the park was it but i want to know you know what part of the body do you see the shoulder or the duodenum dr toole called it just here general and he pressed his fingers to what is vulgarly known as the pit of his stomach what sir do you mean to say the pit of his stomach said the general with more horror and indignation than he often showed yes just about that point general and the pain was very violent indeed answered puddick looking with a puzzled stare at the general's stern and horrified countenance an officer might have a pain in his stomach he thought without exciting all that emotion had he heard of the poison and did he know more of the working of such things than perhaps the doctors did and what in the name of bedlam sir does he mean by walking about the town with a hole through his his what's his name i'm hanged but i'll place him under arrest this moment the general thundered and his little eyes swept the perspective this way and that as if they would leap from their sockets in search of the reckless o'flaherty where's the adjutant sir he bellowed with a crimson scowl and a stomp to the unoffending sentry that's the way to make him lie quiet and keep his bed till he heals sir puddick explained and the storm subsided rumbling off in half a dozen testy assertions of the general's part that he puddick had distinctly used the word wounded and now and then renewing faintly in a muttered explosion on the troubles and worries of his command and a great many shaws and several fits of coughing for the general continued out of breath for some time he had showed his cards however and so in a dignified disconcerted sort of way he told puddock that he had heard something about o'flaherty's having got most improperly into a foolish quarrel and having met nutter that afternoon and for a moment feared he might have been hurt and then came inquiries about nutter and there appeared to have been no one hurt and yet the party's on the ground and no fighting and yet no reconciliation and in fact the general was so puzzled with this conundrum and so curious that he was very near calling after puddock when they parted at the bridge and making him entertain him at some cost of consistency with the whole story so puddock his head full of delicious visions marched homeward to powder and perfume and otherwise equipped for that banquet of the gods of which he was to partake at five o'clock and just as he turned the corner at the phoenix who should he behold sailing down the dublin road from the king's house with a grand powdered footman bearing his cane of office and a great banquet behind her 
and Gertrude Chatsworth by her side, but the splendid and formidable Aunt Becky, who had just been paying her compliments to old Mrs. Colonel Stafford, from whom she had heard all about the duel. So as Puddock's fat cheeks grew pink at sight of Miss Gertrude, all Aunt Becky's color flushed into her face as her keen eye pierced the unconscious lieutenant from afar off, and chin and nose high in air, her mouth just a little tucked in, as it were, at one corner, a certain sign of coming storm, an angry hectic in each cheek, a fierce flirt of her fan, and two or three short sniffs that betokened mischief. She quickened her pace, leaving her niece a good way in the rear in her haste to engage the enemy. Before she came up, she commenced the action at a long range, and very abruptly, for an effective rhetorician of Aunt Becky's sort jumps at once, like a good epic poet, in Medius res, and as Nutter, who, like all her friends in turn, experienced once or twice a taste of her quality, observed to his wife, By Jove, that woman says things for which she ought to be put in the watch-house, so now and here she maintained her reputation. You ought to be flogged, sir, yes, she insisted, answering Puddock's bewildered stare, tied up to the halberts and flogged. Aunt Becky was accompanied by at least a half a dozen lap-dogs, and those intelligent brutes, aware of his disgrace, beset poor Puddock's legs with a furious vociferation. Madam, said he, his ears tingling and making a prodigious low bow, commissioned officers are never flogged. So much the worse for the service, sir, and the sooner they abolish that anomalous distinction, the better. I'd have them begin, sir, with you, and your accomplice in murder, Lieutenant O'Flaherty. Madam, your most obedient, humble servant, said Puddock, with another bow, still more ceremonious, flushing up intensely to the very roots of his powdered hair, and feeling in his swelling heart that all the generals of all the armies of Europe dare not have held such language to him. "'Good evening, sir,' said Aunt Becky, with an energetic toss of her head, having discharged her shot, and with an averted countenance, and in high disdain, she swept grandly on, quite forgetting her niece, who said a pleasant word or two to Puddock as she passed, and smiled so kindly, and seemed so entirely unconscious of his mortification that he was quite consoled, and on the whole was made happy and elated by the rencontre, and went home to his wash-balls and perfumes in a hopeful and radiant, though somewhat excited, state. Indeed, the little lieutenant knew that kind-hearted termagant Aunt Becky too well, to be long cast down or even flurried by her onset. When the same little puddock about a year ago had that ugly attack of pleurisy, and was so low and so long about recovering, and so puny and fastidious in appetite, she treated him as kindly as if he were her own son, in the matter of jellies, strong soups, and curious light wines, and had afterwards lent him some good books, which the little lieutenant had read through, like a man of honor as he was. And, indeed, what specially piqued Aunt Becky's resentment just now was that, having had about that time a good deal of talk with Puddock upon the particular subject of dueling, he had, as she thought, taken very kindly to her way of thinking and she had a dozen times in the last month cited Puddock to the general, and so his public defection was highly mortifying and intolerable. So Puddock, in a not unpleasant fuss and excitement, sat down in his dressing-gown before the glass, and while Moore, the barber, with tongs, powder, and pomade, repaired the dilapidations of the day, he contemplated his own plump face, not altogether unapprovingly, 
and thought with a charming anticipation of the adventures of the approaching evening. End of chapter 17 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 18 of The House by the Churchyard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu Chapter 18 Relating How the Gentlemen Sat Over Their Claret And How Dr. Stirk Saw a Face Puddock drove up the avenue of gentlemen like old poplars, and over the little bridge, and under the high-arched bowers of elms, walled up on either side with evergreens, and so into the courtyard of Belmont. Three sides of a parallelogram, the white old house being the largest, and offices white and in keeping, but overgrown with ivy, and opening to yards of their own on the other sides facing one another at the flanks, and in front a straight Dutch-like moat, with a stone balustrade running all along from the garden to the bridge, with great stone flower-pots set at intervals, the shrubs and flowers of which associated themselves in his thoughts with beautiful Gertrude Chatsworth, and so were wonderfully bright and fragrant, and there were two swans upon the water, and several peacocks marching dandily in the courtyard, and a grand old Irish dog with a great collar and a Celtic inscription dreaming on the steps in the evening sun. It was always pleasant to dine at Belmont. Old General Chatsworth was so genuinely hospitable, and so really glad to see you, and so hilarious himself, and so enjoying. A sage or a scholar, perhaps, might not have found a great deal in him. Most of his stories had been heard before. Some of them, I am led to believe, had even been printed. But they were not very long, and he had a good-natured word and a cordial smile for everybody. And he had a good cook, and explained his dishes to those beside him, and used sometimes to toddle out himself to the cellar in search of a curious bon bosch and of nearly every bit in it, he had a little anecdote or a pedigree to relate, and his laugh was frequent and hearty, and somehow the room and all in it felt the influence of his presence like the glow and cheer and crackle of a bright Christmas fire. Miss Becky Chatsworth, very stately in a fine brocade and a great deal of point lace, received Puddock very loftily, and only touched his hand with the tips of her fingers, it was plain he was not yet taken into favor. When he entered the drawing-room, that handsome stranger with the large eyes, so wonderfully elegant and easy, in the puce-colored cut velvet, Mr. Mervyn, was leaning upon the high back of a chair, and talking agreeably, as it seemed, to Miss Gertrude. He had a shake of the hand and a fashionable greeting from stout, dandified Captain Clough, who was by no means so young as he would be supposed and made up industriously, and braced what he called his waist, with great fortitude, and indeed sometimes looked half-stifled, in spite of his smile and his swagger. Stirk leaning at the window with his shoulders to the wall, beckoned Puddock gruffly, and cross-examined him in an undertone, as to the issue of O'Flaherty's case. Of course he knew all about the duel, but the Corps also knew that Stirk would not attend on the ground in any affair, where the Royal Irish Artillery were concerned, and therefore they could bring what doctor they pleased to the field without an affront. "'And see my buck,' said Stirk, winding up rather savagely with a sneer. "'You've got out of that scrape, you and your patient, by a piece of good luck that's not like to happen twice over.' So take my advice and cut that leaf out of your your grandmother's cookery book and light your pipe with it. This slight way of treating both his book and his ancestors nettled little Puddock. 
who never himself took a liberty and expected similar treatment but he knew stirk the nature of the beast and he only bowed grandly and went to pay his respects to cowed kindly querulous little mrs stirk at the other end of the room an elderly gentleman with a rather white face a high forehead and grim look was chatting briskly with her and Puddock, the moment his eye lighted on the stranger felt that there was something remarkable about him taken in detail indeed he was insignificant he was dressed as quietly as the style of that day would allow yet in his toilet there was entire ease and even a latent air of fashion he wore his own hair and though there was a little powder upon it and upon his coat collar it was perfectly white frizzed out a little at the sides and gathered into a bag behind the stranger rose and bowed as puttock approached the lady and the lieutenant had a nearer view of his great white forehead his only good feature and the pair of silver spectacles that glimmered under it and his small hooked nose and stern mouth tis a mean countenance said the general talking him over when the company had dispersed no countenance said miss becky decisively could be mean with such a forehead the fact is if they had cared to analyze the features taken separately with that one exception were insignificant but the face was singular with its strange pallor its intellectual mastery and sarcastic derision the general who had accidentally omitted the ceremony in those days essential now strutted up to introduce them mr dangerfield will you permit me to present my good friend and officer lieutenant puttock lieutenant puttock mr dangerfield mr dangerfield lieutenant puttock and there was a great deal of pretty bowing and each was the other's most obedient and declared himself honored and the conventional parentheses ended things returned to their former course puttock only perceived that mrs stirk was giving dangerfield a rambling sort of account of the people of chapel is it dangerfield to do him justice listened attentively in fact he had led her upon that particular theme and as easily and cleverly kept her close to the subject for he was not a general to maneuver without knowing first how the ground lay and had an active inquiring mind in which he made all sorts of little notes so mrs stirk prattled on to her own and mr dangerfield's content for she was garrulous when not under the eye of her lord and always gentle though given to lamentation having commonly many small hardships to mention so quite without malice or retention she poured out the gossip of the town but not its scandal indeed she was a very harmless and rather sweet though dolorous little body and was very fond of children especially her own who would have been ruined were it not that they quailed as much as she did before stirk on whom she looked as by far the cleverest and most awful mortal then extant and never doubted that the world thought so too for the rest she preserved her dresses which were not amiss for an interminable time her sheets were always well aired her maids often saucy and she often in tears but stirk's lace and fine linen were always forthcoming in exemplary order she rehearsed the catechism with the children and loved dr walsingham heartily and made more raspberry jam than any other woman of her means in chapel is it except perhaps mrs nutter between whom and herself there were points of resemblance but something as nearly a feud as could subsist between their harmless natures each believed the other matched with a bold bad man who was always scheming something they never quite understood what against her own peerless lord each on seeing the other 
hoping that heaven would defend the right and change the hearts of her enemies or at all events confound their politics and each with a sort of awful second sight when they viewed one another across the street beholding her neighbor draped in a dark film of thundercloud and with a sheaf of pale lightning instead of a fan flickering in her hand when they came down to dinner the gallant captain clough contrived to seat himself beside aunt becky to whom the rogue commended himself by making a corner of his chair next hers for that odious greedy little brute fancy and by a hundred other adroit and amiable attentions and having a perfect acquaintance with all her weak points as everybody who had lived long in chapel is it he had no difficulty in finding topics to interest her and in conversing acceptably thereupon and indeed whenever he was mentioned for some time after she used to remark that captain clough was a very conversable and worthy young man in truth that dinner went swiftly and pleasantly over for many of the guests gertrude chatsworth was placed between the enamoured puddock and the large-eyed handsome mysterious mervyn of course the hour flew with light and roseate wings for him little puddock was in great force and chatted with energy and his theatrical lore and his oddities made him not unamusing so she smiled on him more than usual to make amends for the frowns of the higher powers and he was as happy as a prince and as proud as a peacock and quite tipsy with his success it is not always easy to know what young ladies like best or least or quite what they're driving at and clough from the other side of the table thought though puddick was an agreeable fellow and exerting himself uncommonly for clough like other men not deep in the literae humaniores had a sort of veneration for book learning under which category he placed puddick's endless odds and ends of play lore and viewed the little lieutenant himself accordingly with some awe as a man of parts and a scholar and prodigiously admired his verses which he only half understood he fancied i say although puddick was unusually entertaining that miss gertrude would have been well content to exchange him for the wooden lay figure on which she hung her draperies when she sketched which might have worn his uniform and filled his chair and spared her his agreeable conversation which had eyes and saw not and ears and heard not in short the cunning fellow fancied he saw by many small signs a very decided preference on her part for the handsome and melancholy but evidently eloquent stranger like other cunning fellows however clough was not always right and right or wrong in his own illusions if such they were little puddick was for the time substantially blessed the plump and happy lieutenant when the ladies had flown away to the drawing-room and their small teacups waxed silent and sentimental but being a generous rival and feeling that he could afford it made a little effort and engaged mervyn in talk and found him pleasantly versed in many things of which he knew little and especially in the continental stage and drama upon which puddock heard him greedily and the general's bustling talk helped to keep the company merry and he treated them to a bottle of the identical sack of which his own father's wedding posset had been compounded dangerfield in a rather harsh voice but agreeably and intellectually withal told some rather pleasant stories about old wines and curious wine fanciers and clough and puddick who often sang together being called on by the general chanted a duet rather prettily though neither separately had much of a voice and the incorrigible puddick apropos of a piece of whale once eaten by dangerfield after his want related a wonderful receipt a weaver surprised the weaver turned out to be a fish 
and the surprising was the popping him out of ice into boiling water with after details which made the old general shake and laugh till tears bedewed his honest cheeks and mervyn and dangerfield as much surprised as the weaver both looked each in his own way a little curiously at the young warrior who possessed this remarkable knowledge and the claret like the general's other wines was very good and dangerfield said a stern word or two in its praise and guessed its vintage to his host's great elation who with lord castle mallard began to think dangerfield a very wonderful man dr stirk alone sipped his claret silently looking thoughtfully a good deal at dangerfield over the way and when spoken to seemed to waken up but dropped out of the conversation again though this was odd for he had intended giving dangerfield a bit of his mind as to what might be made of the castle mallard estates and by implication letting in some light upon nutter's mismanagement when dr stirk had come into the drawing-room before dinner dangerfield was turning over a portfolio in the shade beyond the window and the evening sun was shining strongly in his own face so that during the ceremony of introduction he had seen next to nothing of him and then sauntered away to the bow window at the other end where the ladies were assembled to make his obeisance but at the dinner table he was placed directly opposite with the advantage of a very distinct view and the face relieved against the dark stamped leather hangings on the wall stood out like a sharply painted portrait and produced an odd and unpleasant effect upon stirk who could not help puzzling himself then and for a long time after with unavailing speculations about him the grim white man opposite did not appear to trouble his head about stirk he ate his dinner energetically chattered laconically but rather pleasantly stirk thought he might be eight and forty or perhaps six or seven and fifty it was a face without a date he went over all his points insignificant features high forehead stern countenance abruptly silent abruptly speaking spectacles harsh voice harsher laugh something sinister perhaps and used for the most part when the joking or the story had a flavor of the sarcastic and the devilish the image as a whole seemed to stirk to fill in the outlines of a recollection which yet was not a recollection he could not seize it it was a decidedly unpleasant impression of having seen him before but where he could not bring to mind he got me into some confounded trouble some time or other thought stirk in his uneasy dream the sight of him is like a thump in my stomach was he the sheriff's deputy at chester when that rascally jew taylor followed me dangerfield 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 no or could it be that row at taunton or the custom-house officer let me see seventeen fifty one no he was a taller man yes i remember him it is not he or was he at dick luscombe's duel and he lay awake half the night thinking of him for he was not only a puzzle but there was a sort of suspicion of danger and he knew not what throbbing in his soul whenever his reverie conjured up that impenetrable white scoffing face end of chapter eighteen Recording by John Brandon Chapter 19 of The House by the Churchyard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lafano Chapter 19 in which the gentlemen follow the ladies having had as much claret as they cared for the gentlemen fluttered gaily into the drawing-room 
and Puddock, who made up to Miss Gertrude, and had just started afresh, and in a rather more sentimental vein, was a good deal scandalized, and put out by the general's reciting with jolly emphasis, and calling thereto his daughter's special attention, his receipt for surprising a weaver, which he embellished with two or three burlesque improvements of his own, which Puddock, amidst his blushes and confusion, allowed to pass without a protest. Aunt Rebecca was the only person present who pointedly refused to laugh, and with a slight shudder and momentary elevation of her eyes, said wicked and unnatural cruelty, at which sentiment Put accused his pocket-handkerchief in rather an agitated manner. "'Tis a thing I've never done myself, that is, I've never seen it done," said little Puddock, suffused with blushes, as he pleaded his cause at the bar of humanity. For those were the days of Howard, and the fair sex had taken up the philanthropist. The, the receipt, tis you see a thing I happened to meet, and, and just read it in the, in a book, and, uh, I, uh, Aunt Becky, with her shoulders raised in a shudder, and an agonized and peremptory there, 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 moved out of hearing in dignified disgust to the general's high entertainment, who enjoyed her assaults upon innocent Puddock, and indeed took her attacks upon himself when executed with moderation, hilariously enough, a misplaced good humor which never failed to fire Aunt Becky's just resentment. Indeed, the general was so tickled with this joke that he kept it going for the rest of the evening, by sly allusions and mischievous puns. As, for instance, at supper, when Aunt Rebecca was deploring the miserable depression of the silk manufacture and the distress of the poor Protestant artisans of the Liberty, the general, with a solemn wink at Puddock, and to that officer's terror, came out with, Yet who knows, Lieutenant Puddock, but the weavers, poor fellows, may be surprised, you know, by a sudden order from the court, as happened last year. But Aunt Rebecca only raised her eyebrows, and with a slight toss of her head looked sternly at a cold fowl on the other side. But for some cause or other, perhaps it was Miss Gertrude's rebellion in treating the outlawed Puddock with special civility that evening, Miss Becky's asperity seemed to acquire edge and venom as time proceeded. But Puddock rallied quickly. He was on the whole very happy and did not grudge Mervyn his share of the talk, though he heard him ask leave to send Miss Gertrude Chatsworth a portfolio of his drawings made in Venice to look over, which he with a smile accepted. And at supper Puddock at the general's instigation, gave them a solo, which went off pretty well, and, as they stood about the fire after it, on a similar pressure, an imitation of Barry in Othello, and upon this Miss Becky, who was a furious partisan of Smock Alley Theatre, and Mossop against Barry, Woodward, and the Crow Street Playhouse, went off again. Indeed, this was a feud which just then divided the ladies of all Dublin and the greater part of the country with uncommon acrimony. Crow Street was set up, she harangued, to ruin the old house in the spirit of covetousness, you say. But he had not said a word on the subject. Well, covetousness, we have good authority for saying, is idolatry, nothing less. Idolatry, sir, you need not stare. Puddock certainly did stare. I suppose you once read your Bible, sir, but every sensible man, woman, child, and infant, sir, in the kingdom knows it was malice. And malice, Holy Writ says, is murder. But I forgot. That's perhaps no very great objection with Lieutenant Puddock. And little Puddock 
flushed up and his round eyes grew rounder and rounder as she proceeded every moment and he did not know what to say for it had not struck him before that messrs barry's and woodward's theatrical venture might be viewed in the light of idolatry or murder so dumbfounded as he was he took half of lord chesterfield's advice in such cases that is he forgot the smile but he made a very low bow and with this submission the combat si rixa est subsided dangerfield had gone away some time so had mervyn stirk and his wife went next and clough and puttick who lingered as long as was decent at last took leave the plump lieutenant went away very happy notwithstanding the two or three little rubs he had met with and a good deal more in love than ever and he and his companion were both thoughtful and the walk home was quite silent though very pleasant clough was giving shape mentally to his designs upon miss rebecca's twenty thousand pounds and savings he knew she had high offers in her young days and refused but those were past and gone and grey hairs bring wisdom and women grow more practicable as the time for action dwindles and she was just the woman to take a fancy and once the maggot bit to go any honest length to make it fact and clough knew that he had the field to himself and that he was a well-made handsome agreeable officer not so young as to make the thing absurd yet young enough to inspire the right sort of feeling to be sure there were a few things to be weighed she was perhaps well she was eccentric she had troublesome pets and pastimes he knew them all was well stricken in years and had a will of her own that was all but then on the other side was the money a great and agreeable arithmetical fact not to be shaken and she could be well bred when she liked and a self-possessed dignified lady who could sail about a room and curtsy and manage her fan and lead the conversation and do the honours as mrs clough with a certain air of haute ton and in an imposing way to clough's entire content who liked the idea of overawing his peers and the two warriors side by side marched over the bridge in the starlight and both by common consent halted silently and wheeled up to the battlement and puttick puffed a complacent little sigh up the river toward belmont and clough was a good deal interested in the subject of his contemplation and in fact the more he thought of it the better he liked it and they stood each in his reverie looking over the battlements toward belmont and hearing the hushed roll of the river and seeing nothing but the deep blue and the stars and the black outline of the trees that overhung the bridge until the enamoured clough who liked his comforts and knew what gout was felt the chill air and remembered suddenly that they had stopped and ought to be in motion toward their beds and so he shook up puttick and they started anew and parted just at the phoenix shaking hands heartily like two men who had just done a good stroke of business together end of chapter 19 recording by john brandon chapter 20 of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. Chapter 20. In which Mr. Dangerfield visits the church of Chapel Is It, and Ezekiel Irons goes a fishing. Early next morning, Lord Castle Mallard dangerfield and nutter rode into chapel is it plaguy dusty having already made the circuit of that portion of his property which lay west of the town they had poked into the new mills 
and the old mills and contemplated the quarries and lime kilns and talked with doyle about his holding and walked over the two vacant farms and i know not all besides and away trotted his lordship to his breakfast in town and dangerfield seeing the church door open dismounted and walked in and nutter did likewise bob martin was up in the gallery i suppose doing some good and making a considerable knocking here and there in the pews and walking slowly with creaking shoes zekiel irons the clerk was down below about his business at the communion table at the far end lean blue-chinned thin-lipped stooping over his quarto prayer-books and gliding about without noise reverent and sinister when they came in nutter led the way to lord castle mallard's pew which brought them up pretty near to the spot where grave mr irons was prowling serenely the pew would soon want new flooring mr dangerfield thought and the castle mallard arms and supporters a rather dingy piece of vainglory overhanging the main seat on the wall would be nothing the worse of a little fresh gilding and paint there was a claim eh to one foot nine inches off the eastern end of the pew on the part of of the family at inchicore i think they call it said dangerfield laying his riding whip like a rule along the top to help his imagination hey that would spoil the pew the claim's settled and mr langley goes to the other side of the aisle said nutter nodding to irons who came up and laid his long clay-coloured fingers on the top of the pew door and one long thin foot on the first step and with half-closed eyes and a half bow he awaited their pleasure the langley family had this pew said dangerfield with a side nod to that next his lordship's yes sir said irons with the same immutable semblance of a smile and raising neither his head nor his eyes and who's got it now his reverence dr walsingham and so it came out that having purchased salmon falls the rector had compromised the territorial war that was on the point of breaking out among his parishioners by exchanging with that old coxcomb langley the great square pew over the way that belonged to that house for the queer little crib in which the tenant of inchicore had hitherto sat in state and so there was peace if not good will in the church hey let's see it said dangerfield crossing the aisle with irons at his heels for he was a man that saw everything for himself that ever so remotely concerned him or his business we buried lord and the title he spoke very low in the vault here just under where you stand on monday last by night said irons very gently and grimly as he stood behind dangerfield a faint galvanic thrill shot up through the flagging and his firmly planted foot to his brain as though something said eh hey, here i am oh indeed said dangerfield dryly making a little nod and raising his eyebrows and just moving a little a one side twas a nasty affair he looked up with his hands in his breeches pockets and read a mural tablet whistling scarce audibly the while it was not reverent but he was a gentleman and the clerk standing behind him retained his quiet posture and that smile that yet was not a smile but a sort of reflected light was it patience or was it secret ridicule you could not tell and it never changed and somehow it was provoking and some persons i believe had an unpleasant duty to do there said dangerfield abruptly in the middle of his tune and turning his spectacles fully and sternly on mr irons the clerk's head bent lower and he shook it and his eyes but for a little glitter through the eyelashes seemed to close tis a pretty church this a pretty town and some good families in the neighbourhood said dangerfield briskly and i dare say some trout in the river hey eh? the stream looks lively 
middling only poor great troutling sir not a soul cares to fish it but myself he answered you're the clerk eh at your service sir dublin man or born and bred in dublin your honour eh well irons you've heard of mr dangerfield lord castle mallard's agent i am he good morning irons and he gave him half a crown and he took another look round and then he and nutter went out of the church and took a hasty leave of one another and away went nutter on his nag to the mills and dangerfield just before mounting popped into cleary's shop and in his grim laconic way asked the proprietor among his meal bags and bacon about fifty questions in less than five minutes that was one of lord castle mallard's houses eh with the bad roof and manure heap round the corner and where's the pot-house they call the salmon house doing a good business eh and at last i'm told there's some trout in the stream if there's any one in the town who knows the river and could show me the fishing oh the clerk and what sort of fish is he hey oh an honest worthy man is he very good sir then perhaps mr a perhaps sir you'll do me the favour to let one of your people run down to his house and say mr dangerfield lord castle mallard's agent who is staying you know at the brass castle would be much obliged if he would bring his rod and tackle and take a walk with him up the river for a little angling at ten o'clock jolly phil cleary was deferential and almost nervous in his presence the silver-haired grim man with his mysterious reputation for money and that short decisive way of his and sudden cynical chuckle inspired a sort of awe which made his wishes where expressed with that intent very generally obeyed and sure enough irons appeared with his rod at the appointed hour and the interesting anglers piscator and his honest scholar as isaac walton hath it set out side by side on their ramble in the true fraternity of the gentle craft the clerk had i'm afraid a shrew of a wife shrill vehement and fluent rogue old miser old sneak and a great many worse names she called him good mr irons was old fat and ugly and she knew it and that knowledge made her natural jealousy the fiercer he had learned by long experience the best tactic under fire he became actually taciturn or if he spoke his speech was laconic and enigmatical sometimes throwing out a proverb and sometimes a text and sometimes when provoked past endurance spouting mildly a little bit of meek and venomous irony he loved his trout rod and the devious banks of the liffey where saturnine and alone he filled his basket it was his helpmate's rule whenever she did not know to a certainty precisely what irons was doing to take it for granted that he was about some mischief her lodger captain devereux was her great resource on these occasions and few things pleased him better than a stormy visit from his hostess in this temper the young scapegrace would close his novel and set down his glass of sherry and water it sometimes smelt very like brandy i'm afraid to hear her rant one would have supposed who had not seen him that her lank-haired grimly partner was the prettiest youth in the county of dublin and that all the comely lasses in chapel is it and county round were sighing and setting caps at him and devereux who had a vein of satire and loved even farce enjoyed the heroics of the fat old slut oh what am i to do captain jewel she bounced into the room with flaming face and eyes swelled and the end of her apron with which she had been swabbing them in her hand while she gesticulated with her right there he's off again to island bridge the audacious sneak it's all that dirty huzzy's doing i'm not such a fool but i know how to put this and that together though he thinks i don't know of his doings but i'll be even with you meg bartlett yet you trollop 
and all this was delivered in renewed floods of tears and stentorian hysterics while she shook her fat red fist in the air at the presumed level of meg's beautiful features nay madam said the gay captain i prithee weep not the like discoveries as you have read have been made in rome salamonica ballyporine babylon venice and fifty other famous cities he always felt in these interviews as if she and he were extemporizing a burlesque she the queen of crim tartary and he an archbishop in her court and would have spoken blank verse only he feared she might perceive it and break up the conference and what's that to the purpose don't i know they're the same all over the world nothing but brutes and barbarians but suppose madam he has only gone up the river and just taken his rod oh rod indeed i know where he wants a rod the rascal i tell you madam urged the chaplain you're quite in the wrong you've discovered after twenty years wedlock that your husband's a man and you're vexed would you have him anything else you're all in a story she blubbered maniacally there's no justice nor feeling nor succour for a poor abused woman but i'll do it i will i'll go to his reverence don't try to persuade me the reverend hugh walsingham doctor of divinity and rector of chapel is it she used to give him at full length whenever she threatened zekiel with a visitation from that quarter by way of adding ponderosity to the menace i'll go to him straight don't think to stop me and we'll see what he'll say and so she addressed herself to go and when you see him madam ask the learned doctor don't ask me believe the rector of the parish he'll tell you that it hath prevailed from the period at which madam sarah quarrelled with saucy miss hager and it hath prevailed among all the principal nations of antiquity according to pliny strabo and the chief writers of antiquity that juno dido eleanor queen of england and mrs partridge whom i read of here and he pointed to the open volume of tom jones each made or thought she made a like discovery and the captain delivered this slowly with knitted brow and thoughtful face after the manner of the erudite and simple doctor pretty partridges indeed and nice game for a parish clerk cried the lady returning i wonder so i do when i look at him and think of his goings-on how he can have the assurance to sit under the minister and look the congregation in the face and tune his throat and sing the blessed psalms you are not to wonder madam believe the sage who says omnibus hoc vitium es cantoribus devereux knew of old that the effect of latin on mrs irons was to heighten the inflammation and so the matron burst into whole chapters of crimination enlivened with a sprinkling of strong words as the sages of the law love to pepper their indictments and informations with hot adverbs and well-spiced parentheses falsely scandalously maliciously and suadente diabolo to make them sit warm on the stomachs of a loyal judge and jury and digest easily the neighbors were so accustomed to mrs iron's griefs that when her voice was audible as upon such occasions it was upon the high road and in the back gardens it produced next to no sensation everybody had heard from that loud oracle every sort of story touching irons which could well be imagined and it was all so thoroughly published by the good lady that curiosity on the subject was pretty well dead and gone and her distant declamation rattled over their heads and boomed in their ears like the distant guns and trumpets on a review day signifying nothing and all this only shows what every man who has ruralized a little in his lifetime knows more than in theory that the golden age lingers in no corner of the earth 
but is really quite gone and over everywhere and that peace and prisca fides have not fled to the nooks and shadows of deep valleys and bowery brooks but flown once and away to heaven again and left the round world to its general curse so it is even in pretty old villages embowered in orchards with hollyhocks and jasmine in front of the houses and primeval cocks and hens pecking and scraping in the street and the modest river dimpling and simpering along osiers and apple trees and old ivied walls close by you sometimes hear other things than lowing herds and small birds singing and purling streams and shrill accents and voluble rhetoric will now and then trouble the fragrant air and wake up the dim of old river god from his nap as to irons if he was all that his wife gave out he must have been a mighty sly dog indeed for on the whole he presented a tolerably decent exterior to society it is said indeed that he liked a grave tumbler of punch and was sardonic and silent in his liquor that his gait was occasionally a little queer and uncertain as his lank figure glided home by moonlight from the salmon house and that his fingers fumbled longer than need be with the latch and his tongue though it tried but a short and grim barth door marjorie or gimme cannel wench sometimes lacked its cunning and slipped and kept not time there were two other scandals such as the prying and profane love to shoot privately at church celebrities perhaps it was his reserve and sanctity that provoked them perhaps he was in truth though cautious sometimes indiscreet perhaps it was fanciful mrs irons jealous hullabaloos and hysterics that did it i don't know but people have been observed apropos of him to wink at one another and grin and shake their heads and say the nearer the church you know and he's so ancient too but tis an old rat that won't eat cheese and so forth just as mrs irons whisked round for the seventh time to start upon her long threatened march to dr walsingham's study to lay her pitiful case before him captain devereux who was looking toward the phoenix saw the truant clerk and mr dangerfield turned the corner together on their return stay madam here comes the traitor said he and on my honour tis worse than we thought for he has led my lord castle mallard's old agent into mischief too and meg bartlett has had two swains at her feet this morning and see the hypocrites have got some trout in their basket and their rods on their shoulders and look for all the world as if they had only been fishing sly rogues well it's all one said mrs irons gaping from the other window and sobering rapidly if tisn't to-day twill be to-morrow i suppose and at any rate tis a sin and shame to leave any poor creature in this miserable taking not knowing that he might be drowned or worse dear knows it would not be much trouble to tell his wife when the gentleman wanted him and sure for any honest matter i'd never say against it her thoughts were running upon dangerfield and what compliment he had probably made her husband at parting and a minute or two after this devereux saw her with her riding hood on trudging up to the salmon house to make inquisition after the same end of chapter twenty recording by john brandon chapter twenty one of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefano chapter twenty one relating among other things how dr toole walked up to the tiled house and of his pleasant discourse with mr mervyn dr stirk's spirits and temper had not become more pleasant lately in fact he brooded more 
and was more savage at home than was at all agreeable. He used to go into town oftener, and to stay there later, and his language about tool and nutter, when there was none but submissive little Mrs. Dirk by, was more fierce and coarse than ever. To hear him, then, one would have supposed that they were actually plotting to make away with him, and that in self-defense he must smite them hip and thigh. Then beside their moral offensiveness, they were such idiots and noodles, and botching and blundering right and left, so palpably to the danger and ruin of their employers, that no man of conscience could sit easy and see it going on. And all this simply because he had fixed his affections upon the practice of the one and the agency of the other. For Sturk had, in his own belief, a genius for business of every sort. Everybody on whom his insolent glance fell, who had any sort of business to do, did it wrong, and was a precious disciple, or a goose, or a born jackass, and excited his scoffing chuckle. And little Mrs. Sturk, frightened and admiring, used to say while he grinned and muttered and tittered into the fire, with his great shoulders buried in his balloon back chair, his heels over the fender, and his hands in his breeches pockets. But Barney, you know you're so clever. There's no one like you. And he was fond of just nibbling at speculations in a small safe way, and used to pull out a roll of banknotes when he was lucky, and show his winnings to his wife, and chuckle and swear over them, and boast and rail and tell her, if it was not for the cursed way his time was cut up with hospital and field days, and such trumpery regimental duties, he could make a fortune while other men were thinking of it, and he very nearly believed it, and he was doubtless clear-headed, though wrong-headed too at times, and very energetic, but his genius was for pushing men out of their places to make way for himself. But with all that he had the good brood instincts, too, and catered diligently for his brood and their dam, and took a gruff, unacknowledged pride in seeing his wife well-dressed, and had a strong liking for her, and thanked her in his soul for looking after things so well, and thought often about his boys, and looked sharply after their education, and was an efficient and decisive head of a household, and had no vices nor expensive indulgences, and was a hard but tolerably just man to deal with. All this time his uneasiness and puzzle about Dangerfield continued, and, along with other things, kept him awake often to unseasonable hours at night. He did not tell Mrs. Turk. In fact, he was a man who, though on most occasions he gave the wife of his bosom what he called his mind freely enough, yet did not see fit to give her a great deal of his confidence. Dangerfield had his plans, too. Who has not? Nothing could be more compact and modest than his household. He had just a housekeeper and two maids who looked nearly as old, and a valet and a groom who slept at the Phoenix, and two very pretty horses at livery in the same place. All his appointments were natty and complete and his servants, every one, stood in awe of him, for no lip or eye service would go down with that severe prompt and lynx-eyed gentleman, and his groom, among the coachmen and other experts of the Salmon House, used to brag of his hunters in England, and his man of his riches, and his influence with Lord Castle Mallard. In England, Dangerfield, indeed, spent little more money than he did in Chapel Isit, except in his stable, and Lord Castle Mallard, who admired his stinginess, as he did everything else about him, used to say, he's a wonder of the world. How he retains his influence over all the people he knows, without ever giving one among them so much as a mutton chop or a glass of sherry in his house, I can't conceive. I couldn't do it, I know. But he had ultimate plans, if not of splendor, at least of luxury. His taste and perhaps some deeper feelings pointed to the continent, and he had purchased a little paradise on the lake of Geneva, where was an Eden of fruits and flowers and wealth of marbles and colored canvas and wonderful wines maturing in his cellars, and aquaria for his fish, and ice houses and baths, and I know not what refinements of old Roman villa luxury beside, among which he meant to pass the honored evening of his days, 
with just a few more thousands, and, as he sometimes thought, perhaps a wife. He had not quite made up his mind, but he had come to the time when a man must forthwith accept matrimony frankly, or, if he be wise, shake hands with bleak celibacy, and content himself for his earthly future with monastic jollity and solitude. It is a maxim with charitable persons, and no more than a recognition of a great constitutional axiom, to assume, in the absence of proof to the contrary, that every British subject is an honest man. Now, if we had gone to Lord Castle Mallard for his character, and who more competent to give him one, we know very well that we should have heard about Dangerfield. And, on the other hand, we have never found him out, have we, kind reader? In a shabby action, an unworthy thought, and therefore it leaves upon our mind an unpleasant impression about that Mr. Mervyn, who arrived in the dark, attending upon a coffin, as mysterious as himself, and now lives solitarily in the haunted house near Ballyfermot, that the omniscient Dangerfield should follow him, when they pass upon the road, with that peculiar stern glance of surprise which seemed to say, Was ever such audacity conceived? Is the man mad? But Dangerfield did not choose to talk about him, if indeed he had anything to disclose, though the gentleman at the club pressed him often with questions, which, however, he quietly parried, to the signal vexation of active little Dr. Toole, who took up and dropped, in turn, all sorts of curious theories about the younger stranger. Lord Castle Mallard knew all about him, too, but his lordship was high and huffy, and hardly ever in chapel is it, except on horseback, and two or three times in the year at a grand dinner at the artillery mess. And when Mervyn was mentioned, he always talked of something else, rather imperiously, as though he said, You'll please to observe that upon that subject I don't choose to speak. And as for Dr. Walsingham, when he thought it right to hold his tongue upon a given matter, thumbscrews could not squeeze it from him. In short, our friend Toole grew so feverish under his disappointment that he made an excuse of old Tim Malloy's toothache to go up in person to the tiled house in the hope of meeting the young gentleman and hearing something from him. The servants he already knew were as much in the dark as he to alleviate his distress. And sure enough, his luck stood him instead. For as he was going away, having pulled out old Malloy's grinder to give a color to his visit, who should he find upon the steps of the hall door but the pale, handsome, young gentleman himself? Dr. Toole bowed low and grinned with real satisfaction, reminded him of their interview at the Phoenix, and made by way of apology for his appearance at the tiled house a light and kind allusion to poor old Tim, of whose toothache he spoke affectionately and with water in his eyes for he half believed for the moment what he was saying, declared how he remembered him when he did not come up to Tim's knee-buckle, and would walk that far any day, and a bit further, too, he hoped, to relieve the poor old boy in a less matter. And finding that Mr. Mervyn was going toward chapel, is it, he begged him not to delay on his account, and accompanied him down the valley Fermat Road, entertaining him by the way, with an inexhaustible affluence of chapel is it anecdote and scandal, at which the young man stared a great deal, and sometimes even appeared impatient. But the doctor did not perceive it, and rattled on, and told him, moreover, everything about himself and his belongings with a minute and voluble frankness, intended to shame the suspicious reserve of the stranger. But nothing came, and being by this time grown bolder, he began a more direct assault, and told him with a proper scorn of the village curiosity, all the theories which the chapel is at gossips had spun about him. And they say, among other things, that you're not, uh, in fact, there's a mystery, a something, about your birth, you know, said Toole, in a tone implying pity and contempt for his idle townsfolk. They lie, then cried the young man, stopping short, more fiercely than was pleasant, and fixing his great lurid eyes 
upon the cunning face of the doctor, and after a pause, why can't they let me and my concerns alone, sir? But there's no use in saying so. I can tell you, exclaimed little Toole, recovering his feet in an instant. Why, I suppose there isn't so tattling, prying, lying, scandalous a little colony of Christians on earth. Eyes, ears, and mouths all open, sir. Heads busy, tongues wagging, lots of old maids, by Jove, ladies, women, and gentlemen's gentlemen, and drawers and footmen, club talk, sir, and mess-table talk, and talk on band days, talk over cards, talk at home, sir, talk in the streets, talk, talk. By Jupiter, Tonans, tis enough to bother one's ears and make a man envy Robinson Crusoe. So I do, sir, if we were rid of this parrot, answered Mervyn, and with a dry, I wish you a good morning, doctor. Doctor, uh, sir, turned sharply from him up the Palmerstown Road. Going to Belmont, murmured little Toole, with his face a little redder than usual and stopping in an undignified way for a moment at the corner to look after him. He's close, plaguey close, and Miss Rebecca Chatsworth knows nothing about him, neither. I wonder does she, though, and doesn't seem to care, even. He's not there for nothing, though. Someone makes him welcome, depend on it. He winked to himself. A plaguey high stomach, too, by Jove. I bet you fifty. If he stays here three months, he'll be at swords or pistols with some of our hot-bloods. And whatever his secret is, and I dare say tisn't worth knowing, the people here will ferret it out at last, I warrant you. There's small good in making all the fuss he does about it. If he knew but all, there's no such thing as a secret here. Hang the one have I, I know, just because there's no use in trying." The whole town knows when I've tripe for dinner, and where I have a patch or a darn, and when I got the fourteen pigeons at Darkey's Bridge, the birds were not ten minutes on my kitchen table, when old widow Foot sends her maid and her compliments, as she knew my pie dish only held a dozen, to beg the two odd birds. Secret indeed. And he whistled a bar or two contemptuously, which subsided into dejected silence and he muttered, I wish I knew it, and walked over the bridge glumly, and he roared more fiercely on smaller occasions than usual at his dogs on the way home, and they squalled oftener and louder. Now for some reason or other Dangerfield had watched the growing intimacy between Mervyn and Miss Gertrude Chatsworth with an evil eye. He certainly did know something about this Mr. Mervyn, with his beautiful sketches and his talk about Italy and his fine music, and his own spectacles had carefully surveyed Miss Chatsworth, and she had passed the ordeal satisfactorily, and Dangerfield thought these people can't possibly suspect the actual state of the case, and who and what this gentleman is, to my certain knowledge, and tis a pity so fine a young lady should be sacrificed for want of a word spoken in season." and when he had decided upon a point, it was not easy to make him stop or swerve. End of chapter 21 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 22 of The House by the Churchyard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu Chapter 22 Telling how Mr. Mervyn fared at Belmont, and of a pleasant little déjeuner by the margin of the Liffey. Now it happened that on the very same day the fashion of Dr. Walsingham's and of Aunt Rebecca's countenances were one and both changed towards Mr. Mervyn, much to his chagrin and puzzle. The doctor, who met him near his own house on the bridge, was something distant in manner, and looked him in the face with very grave eyes, and seemed sad, and as if he had something on his mind, 
and laid his hand upon the young man's arm, and addressed himself to speak, but glancing round his shoulder and seeing people astir, and that they were under observation, he reserved himself. That both the ladies of Belmont looked as if they had heard some strange story, each in her own way. Aunt Rebecca received the young man without a smile, and was unaccountably upon her high horse, and said some dry and sharp things, and looked as if she could say more, and colored menacingly, and in short was odd and very nearly impertinent. And Gertrude, though very gentle and kind, seemed almost much graver, and looked pale, and her eyes larger and more excited, and altogether like a brave young lady who had fought a battle without crying. And Mervyn saw all this and pondered on it, and went away soon. The iron entered into his soul. Aunt Rebecca was so occupied with her dogs, squirrels, parrots, old women and convicts, that her eyes being off the cards, she saw little of the game, and when a friendly whisper turned her thoughts that way, and it flashed upon her that tricks and honors were pretty far gone, she never remembered that she had herself to blame for the matter, but turned upon her poor niece with sly creature, and so forth. And while owing to this inattention, Gertrude had lost the benefit of her sage Aunt Rebecca's counsels altogether, her venerable but frisky old grandmother, Madame Nature, it was to be feared, might have profited by the occasion to giggle and whistle her own advice in her ear, and been indifferently well obeyed. I really don't pretend to say maybe there was nothing or next to nothing in it, or if there was, Miss Gertrude herself might not quite know. And if she did suspect she liked him ever so little, she had no one but Lilius Walsingham to tell. And I don't know that young ladies are always quite candid upon these points. Some, at least, I believe, don't make confidences until their secrets become insupportable. However, Aunt Rebecca was now wide awake, and had trumpeted a pretty shrill reveller, and Gertrude had started up, her elbow on the pillow, and her large eyes open, and the dream, I suppose, was shivered and flown and something rather ghastly at her side. Coming out of church, Dr. Walsingham asked Mervyn to take a turn with him in the park, and so they did, and the doctor talked with him seriously and kindly on that broad plateau. The young man walked darkly beside him, and they often stopped outright. When on their return they came near the chapel is at gate and Parsons Lodge and the duck pond, the doctor was telling him that marriage is an affair of the heart, also a spiritual union, and moreover a mercantile partnership, and he insisted much upon this latter view, and told him what and how strict was the practice of the ancient Jews, the people of God, upon this particular point. Dr. Walsingham had made a love match, was the most imprudent and open-minded of men, and always preaching to others against his own besetting sin. To hear him talk, indeed, you would have supposed he was a usurer. Then Mr. Mervyn, who looked a little pale and excited, turned the doctor about, and they made another little circuit, while he entered somewhat into his affairs and prospects, and told him something about an appointment in connection with the embassy at Paris, and said he would ask him to read some letters about it and the doctor seemed a little shaken, and so they parted in a very friendly but grave way. When Mervyn had turned his back upon Belmont on the occasion of the unpleasant little visit I mentioned just now, the ladies had some words in the drawing-room. "'I have not coquetted, madam,' said Miss Gertrude haughtily. "'Then I am to presume you've been serious, "'and I take the liberty to ask how far this affair has proceeded,' "'said Aunt Rebecca, firmly, "'and laying her gloved hand and folded fan calmly on the table. "'I really forget,' said the young lady coldly. "'Has he made a declaration of love?' demanded the aunt. "'The two red spots on her cheeks 
coming out steadily and helping the flash of her eyes. Certainly not, answered the young lady, with a stare of haughty surprise that was quite unaffected. At the pleasant luncheon and dance on the grass that the officers gave in that pretty field by the river, half a dozen of the young people had got beside the little brook that runs simpering and romping into the river just there. Women are often good-natured in love matters, where rivalry does not mix, and Miss Gertrude all of a sudden found herself alone with Mervyn. Aunt Becky, from under the ash-trees at the other side of the field, with great distinctness, for she was not a bit nearsighted, and considerable uneasiness, saw their tete a It was out of the question, getting up in time to prevent the young people speaking their minds if so disposed, and she thought she perceived that in the young man's bearing, which looked like a pleading and eagerness, and Gertrude's put out a good deal. I see by her plucking at those flowers, but my head to a china orange, the girl won't think of him. She's not a young woman to rush into a horrible folly. Hand over head, thought Aunt Becky. And then she began to think they were talking very much at length indeed, and to regret that she had not started at once from her post for the place of meeting. And one and two and three minutes passed, and perhaps some more, and Aunt Becky began to grow wroth, and was at the point of marching upon them, when they began slowly to walk towards the group who were plucking bunches of woodbine from the hedge across the little stream, at the risk of tumbling in, and distributing the flowers among the ladies, amidst a great deal of laughing and gabble. Then Miss Gertrude made Mr. Mervyn rather a haughty and slight salutation her aunt thought, and so dismissed him. He, too, made a bow, but a very low one, and walked straight off to the first lady he saw. This happened to be mild little Mrs. Sturk, and he talked a good deal to her, but restlessly, and as it seemed, with a wandering mind, and afterwards he conversed with an affectation of interest. It was only that, Aunt Becky, who observed him with some curiosity, thought, for a few minutes, with Lilius Walsingham, and afterwards he talked with an effort, and so much animation, and such good acceptance, though it was plain, Aunt Becky said, that he did not listen to one word she said, to the fair Magnolia, that O'Flaherty had serious thoughts of horsewhipping him when the festivities were over. For, as he proposed informing him, his ungentlemanlike interference. He has got his quietus, thought Aunt Becky with triumph, this brisk laughing carriage and heightened color. A woman of experience can see through at a glance. Yes, all this frisking and skipping is but the hypocrisy of bleeding vanity. Herit Letary. They are just the flush, wriggle, and hysterics of suppressed torture. Then came her niece, cold and stately, with steady eye and a slight flush, and altogether the air of the conscientious young matron, who has returned from the nursery, having there administered the discipline. And so she sat down beside her aunt, serene and silent, and the little glow passed away, pale and still. Well, he has spoken, said her aunt to her in a sharp aside. Yes, answered the young lady icily. And has had his answer? Yes. And I beg, Aunt Rebecca, the subject may be allowed to drop. The young lady's eyes encountered her aunt's so directly and were so fully charged with the genuine Chatsworth lightning that Miss Rebecca, unused to such demonstrations, averted hers, and with a slight sarcastic inclination, and, oh, your servant young lady, beckoning with her fan grandly to little Puddock, who was hovering with other designs in the vicinity, and taking his arm, though he was not forgiven, but only employed, a distinction often made by good Queen Elizabeth, 
marched to the marquee where it was soon evident the plump lieutenant was busy in commending according to their merits the best bits of the best plates on the table so dear aunt becky has forgiven puddock said devereux who was sauntering up to the tent between o'flaherty and clough and little suspecting that he was decanting upon the intended mrs clough and they are celebrating the reconciliation over a jelly and a pumpkin i love aunt rebecca i tell you i don't know what we should do without her she's impertinent and often nearly insuperable but isn't she the most placable creature on earth i venture to say i might kill you lieutenant o'flaherty of course with your permission sir and she'd forgive me to-morrow morning and she really does princely things doesn't she she set up that ugly widow what's her name twice in a shop in dame street and gave two hundred pounds to poor scamper's orphan and actually pensions that old miscreant waggett who ought to be hanged and never looks for thanks or compliments or upbraids her ingrates with past kindnesses she's noble aunt becky's every inch a gentleman by this time they had reached the tent and the hearty voice of the general challenged them from the shade as he filliped a little chime merrily on his empty glass End of chapter twenty two recording by john brandon chapter twenty three of the house by the churchyard this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon the house by the churchyard by joseph sheraton lefanu chapter twenty three which concerns the grand dinner at the king's house and who are there and something of their talk reveries disputes and general jollity it was about this time that the dinner party at the king's house came off old colonel and mrs stafford were hospitable if not very entertaining and liked to bring their neighbors together without ceremony round a saddle of mutton and a gooseberry pie and other such solid comforts and then hay for a round game for the young people pope joan or what you please in the drawing-room with lots of flirting and favoritism and a jolly little supper of broiled bones and whipped cream and toasts and sentiments with plenty of sly illusions and honest laughter all round the table but twice or thrice in the year the worthy couple made a more imposing gathering at the king's house and killed the fatted calf and made a solemn feast to the bigwigs and the notables of chapel Izzard, with just such a sprinkling of youngsters as sufficed to keep alive the young people whom they brought in their train there was eating of venison and farced turkeys and other stately fare and they praised the colonel's claret and gave the servants their veils in the hall and drove away in their carriages with flambeau and footmen followed by the hearty good night of the host from the hall doorsteps and amazing the quiet little town with their rattle and glare dinner was a five o'clock affair in those days and the state parlor was well filled there was old bligh from the magazine i take the guests in order of arrival and the chatsworths and the walsinghams and old dowager lady glen varlow colonel stratford's cousin who flashed out in the evening sun from dublin in thunder and dust and her carriage and four bringing her mild little country niece who watched her fat painted aunt all the time of dinner with the corners of her frightened little eyes across the table and spoke sparingly and ate with diffidence and captain devereux was there and the next beau who appeared was of all men in the world mr mervyn and aunt becky watched and saw with satisfaction that he and gertrude met as formally and coldly as she could have desired and then there was an elaborate macaroni one of the lord lieutenant's household mr beauchamp and last lord castle mallard who liked very well to be the chief man in the room and dozed after dinner serenely in that consciousness and loved to lean back upon his sofa in the drawing-room 
and gaze in a dozing, smiling Turkish reverie after Gertrude Chatsworth and pretty Lilius, whom he admired, and when either came near enough, he would take her hand and say, Well, child, how do you do? And why don't you speak to your old friend? You charming rogue, you know I remember you no bigger than your fan. And what mischief have you been about, eh? What mischief have you been about, I say, young gentlewoman? Turning all the pretty fellows' heads, I warrant, eh? Turning their heads? And he used to talk this sort of talk very slowly, and to hold their hands all the while. And even after this talk was exhausted, and grin sleepily and wag his head, looking with a glittering unpleasant gaze in their faces all the time. But at present we are all at dinner, in the midst of the row which even the best-bred people, assembled in sufficient numbers, will make over that meal. Devereux could not help seeing pretty Lilius over the way, who was listening to handsome Mervyn, as it seemed, with interest and talking also her pleasant little share. He was no dunce, that Mervyn, nor much of a coxcomb, and certainly no clown, Devereux thought, but as fine a gentleman to speak honestly and as handsome as well-dressed, and as pleasant to listen to, with that sweet low voice and piquant smile as any. Besides, he could draw, and had many yards of French and English verses by rote than Aunt Becky owned of Venetian lace and satin ribbons, and was more of a scholar than he. He? He? Why, he? What the deuce had Devereux to do with it? Was he vexed? A fiddlestick. He began to flag with Miss Ward, the dowager's niece, and was glad when the refined Beauchamp, at her other side, took her up and entertained her with Lady Carrickmore's ball, and the masquerade, and the last levy, and the withdrawing-room. There are said to have been persons who could attend to half a dozen different conversations going on together, and take a rational part in them all, and indulge all the time in a distinct conservative train of thought beside. I dare say Mr. Morphy, the chess player, would find no difficulty in it. But Devereux was not by any means competent to the feat, though there was one conversation, perhaps the thread of which he would gladly have caught up and disentangled. So the talk at top and bottom and both sides of the table, with its cross-readings and muddle and uproar, changed hands, and whisked and rioted like a dance of wall purges in his lonely brain. What he heard on the whole was very like this, hubble bubble rubble double the great match of shuttlecock played between the gentlemen of the north and those of hubble bubble the methodist persuasion, but ha ha ha, a squeeze of a lemon, rubble double ha ha ha, wicked man, hubble bubble, force meat balls and yolks of eggs. Rubble double, musket balls from a steel crossbow, upon my hubble bubble throwing a sheep's eye, ha ha ha, rubble double, and the two remaining heads on Temple Bar, hubble bubble, and the Duke left by his will, rubble double, a quid of tobacco in the brass snuff box, hubble bubble, and my Lady Restivere is very sweet upon rubble double, old Alderman Wallop of John's Lane, hubble bubble. Ha, 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 from Jericho to Bethany, where David, Joab, and Rubble Double, the whole party upset in the mud in a chase marine, and Hubble Bubble, shake a little white pepper over them, and Rubble Double, his name is Solomon, Hubble Bubble, ha, 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 the poor old thing dying of cold and not a stitch of clothes to cover her nakedness, Rubble Double, play or pay, on Finchley Common, Hubble Bubble, most melancholy, truly. Ha, 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 rubble, double. And old Lady Ruth is ready to swear she never, hubble, bubble, served high sheriff for the county of Down in the reign of Queen Anne. Rubble, double. And Dr. and Mrs. Sturk, hubble, bubble, secretaries of state in the room of the Duke of Grafton and General Conway. Rubble, double. Venerable prelate. Ha, 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 hubble, bubble, filthy creature. Hubble bubble rubble double. And this did not make him much wiser or merrier. Love has its fevers, 
its recoveries and its relapses the patient nay even his nurse and his doctor if he has taken to himself such officers in his distress may believe the malady quite cured the passion burnt out the flame extinct even the smoke quite over when a little chance puff of rivalry blows the white ashes off and lo the old liking is still smouldering but this was not devereux's case he remembered when his fever not a love one and his leave of absence at scarborough and that long continental tour of hers with aunt rebecca and gertrude chatsworth had carried the grave large-eyed little girl away and hid her from his sight for more than a year very nearly two years the strange sort of thrill and surprise with which he saw her again tall and slight and very beautiful no not beautiful perhaps if you go to rule and compass and greek trigonometrical theories but there was an indescribable prettiness in all her features and movements and looks higher and finer and sweeter than all the canons of statuary will give you how prettily she stands how prettily she walks what a sensitive spirited clean-tinted face it is this was pretty much the interpretation of his reverie as colonel stafford's large and respectable party obligingly vanished for a while into air is it sad i think it is sad i don't know and how sweetly and how drolly it lighted up at that moment he saw her smile the pleasant mischief in it the dark violent glance the wonderful soft dimple in chin and cheek the little crimson mouth and its laughing coronet of pearls and then all earnest again and still so animated what feminine intelligence and character there is in that face tis pleasanter to me than conversation tis a fairy tale or or a dream it's so interesting i never know you see what's coming is not it beautiful what is she talking about now what does it signify she's so strangely beautiful she's like those irish melodies i can't reach all their meaning i only know their changes keep me silent and are playing with my heart-strings devereux's contemplation of the animated tete a for such in effect it seemed to him at the other side of the table was however by no means altogether pleasurable he began to think mervyn conceited there was a provoking probability of succeeding about him and altogether something that was beginning to grow offensive and odious she knows well enough i like her so his liking said in confidence to his vanity and even he hardly overheard them talk better a great deal than i knew it myself till old stratford got together this confounded stupid dinner party he caught miss chatsworth glancing at him with a peculiar look of inquiry why the plague did he ask me here it was puddock's turn and he likes venison and compotes and and but tis like them the women fall in love with the man who's in love with himself like narcissus yonder and they can't help it not they and what care i hang it i say what is to me and yet if she were to leave it what a queer unmeaning place chapel is it would be and what do you say to that captain devereux cried the hearty voice of old general chatsworth and with a little shock the captain dropped from the clouds into his chair and a clear view of the larded fowl before him and his own responsibilities and situation some turkey he said awaking and touching the carving knife and fork with a smile and a bow and he mingled once more in the business and bustle of life and soon there came in the general talk and business of one of those sudden lulls which catch speakers unawares and mr beauchamp was found saying i saw her play on thursday and upon my honour the bellamy is a mockery a skeleton and a spectacle that's no reason said aunt becky who as usual had got up a skirmish and was firing away in the cause of mossop and smock alley playhouse why she would be fraudulently arrested in her own chair on her way to the playhouse 
by the contrivance of the rogue Barry and that wicked mountebank Woodward. You're rather hard upon them, madam, said Mrs. Colonel Stafford, who stood up for Crow Street with a slight elevation of her chin. Very true, indeed, Mistress Chatsworth, cried the dowager, overlooking madam Stafford's parenthesis and tapping an applause with her fan, and at the same time rewarding the champion of Smock Alley, for she was one of the faction, with one of her large painted smiles, followed by a grave and somewhat supercilious glance at the gentlemen of the household. And I don't believe they, at least, can think her a spectacle, and, uh, the like, or they'd hardly have conspired to lock her in the sponging house, while she should have been in the playhouse. What say you, Mistress Chatsworth? Ha, ha, no, truly, my lady, but you know she's unfortunate, and a stranger, and the good people in this part of the world improve so safe an opportunity of libeling a friendless gentlewoman. This little jet of vitriol was intended for the eye of the castle beau, but he, quite innocent of the injection, went on serenely. So they do, upon my honor, madam, tell prodigious naughty tales about her. Yet upon my life I do pity her from my soul. How that fellow Calcraft, by Jove, she says, you know, she's married to him, but we know better. He has half broken her heart, and treated her with most refined meanness as I live. In the green room, where she looks an infinity worse than on the stage, she told me. I dare say, said Aunt Becky, rather stiffly, pulling him up. For though she had fought around for poor George Ann Bellamy for Mossop's sake, she nevertheless had formed a pretty just estimate of that faded good-natured and insolvent demi-rep, and rather recoiled from any anecdotes of her telling. And Calcraft gave her his likeness in miniature, related the macaroni, never minding, set round with diamonds, and will you believe it? When she came to examine it, they were not brilliants, but rose diamonds. Despicable fellow. Here the talk began to spring up again in different places, and the conversation speedily turned into what we have heard it before, and the roar and confusion became universal and swallowed up what remained of poor Anne's persecutions. End of chapter 23. Recording by John Brandon. Chapter 24 of The House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. Chapter 24 In Which Two Young Persons Understand One Another Better perhaps than ever they did before, without saying so. And now the ladies, with their gay plumage, have flown away like foreign birds of passage, and the jolly old priests of Bacchus, in the parlour, make their libations of claret, and the young fellows, after a while, seeing a gathering of painted fans and rustling hoops and fluttering laces upon the lawn, and a large immigration of hilarious neighbours, besides, and two serious fiddlers, and a black fellow with a tambourine preparing for action, and the warm glitter of the western sun among the green foliage about the window could stand it no longer, but stole away, notwithstanding a hospitable remonstrance and a protest from old Stafford to join the merry muster. The young bucks will leave their claret, said Lord Castle Mallard, and truly tis a rare, fine wine, Colonel, a mighty choice claret, truly. And the Colonel bowed low, and smiled a rugged purple smile in spite of himself, for his claret was choice. All won't do when Venus beckons. When she beckons, ha, <laughs> ha, all won't do, sir, at the first flutter of a petticoat, and the invitation of a pair of fine eyes, 
fine eyes colonel by jupiter they're off you can't keep em i say your wine won't keep em they'll be off sir peeping under the hoods the dogs will and whispering their wicked nonsense dr walsingham ha ha and your wine i say your claret colonel won't hold em twas once so with us eh general ha ha and we must forgive them now and he shoved round his chair lazily with a left backward wheel so as to command the window for he liked to see the girls dance the little rogues with his claret and his french rapi at his elbow and he did not hear general chatsworth who was talking of the new comedy called the clandestine marriage and how the prologue touches genteely on the loss of three late geniuses hogarth quinn and sibber and the epilogue is the picture of a polite company for the tambourine and the fiddles were going merrily and the lasses and lads in motion aunt becky and lilius were chatting just under those pollard osiers by the river she was always gentle with lily and somehow unlike the pugnacious aunt becky whose attack was so spirited and whose thrust so fierce and when lily told a diverting little story and she was often very diverting aunt becky used to watch her pleasant face with such a droll good-natured smile and she used to pat her on the cheek and look so glad to see her when they met and often as if she would say i admire you a great deal more and i am a great deal fonder of you than you think but you know brave stoical aunt becky can't say all that it would not be in character you know and the old lady knew how good she was to the poor and she liked her spirit and candor and honor it was so uncommon and somehow angelic she thought little lily's so true she used to say and perhaps there was there a noble chord of sympathy between the young girl who had no taste for battle and the daring aunt becky i think devereux liked her for liking lily he thought it was for her own sake of course he was often unexpectedly set upon and tomahawked by the impetuous lady but the gay captain put on his scalp again and gathered his limbs together and got up in high good humour and shook himself and smiled after his dismemberment like one of the old soldiers of the valhalla and they were never the worst of friends so turning his back upon the fiddles and tambourine gypsy devereux sauntered down to the river bank and to the osiers where the ladies are looking down the river and a bluebell not half so blue as her own deep eyes in lilia's fingers and the sound of their gay talk came mixed with the twitter and clear evening songs of the small birds by those same osiers that see so many things and tell no tales there will yet be a parting but its own sorrow suffices to the day and now it is a summer sunset and all around dapple gold and azure and sweet dreamy sounds and lilius turns her pretty head and sees him and oh was it fancy or did he see just a little flushing of the colour on her cheek and her lashes seemed to drop a little and out came her frank little hand and devereux leaned on the paling there and chatted his best sense and nonsense i dare say and they laughed and talked about all sorts of things and he sang for them a queer little snatch of a ballad of an enamoured captain the course of whose true love ran not smooth the river ran between them and she looked upon the stream and the soldier looked upon her as a dreamer on a dream believe me oh believe he sighed you peerless maid my honour is pure and my true love sure like the white plume in my hat and my shining blade the river ran between them and she smiled upon the stream like one that smiles at folly a dreamer on a dream i do not trust your promise i will not be betrayed for your faith is light and your cold wit bright like the white plume in your hat and your shining blade the river ran between them and he rode beside the stream and he turned away and parted 
as a dreamer from his dream and his comrade brought his message from the field where he was laid just his name to repeat and to lay at her feet the white plume from his hat and his shining blade and he sang it in a tuneful and plaintive tenor that had power to make rude and ridiculous things pathetic and aunt rebecca thought he was altogether very agreeable but it was time she should see what miss gertrude was about and devereux and lily were such very old friends that she left them to their devices i like the river says he it has a soul miss lily and a character there are no river gods but nymphs look at that river miss lilius what a girlish spirit i wish she would reveal herself i could lose my heart to her i believe if indeed i could be in love with anything you know look at the river is not it feminine it's sad and it's merry musical and sparkling and oh so deep always changing yet still the same twill show you the trees or the clouds or yourself or the stars and it's so clear and so dark and so sunny and so cold it tells everything and yet nothing it's so pure and so playful and so tuneful and so coy yet so mysterious and fatal i sometimes think miss lilius i've seen this river spirit and she's like very like you and so he went on and she was more silent and more a listener than usual i don't know all that was passing in pretty lilia's fancy in her heart near the hum of the waters and the spell of that musical voice love speaks in allegories and a language of signs looks and tones tell his tale most truly so devereux's talk held her for a while in a sort of trance melancholy and delightful there must be of course the affinity the rapport the what you please to call it to begin with it matters not how faint and slender and then the spell steals on and grows see how the poor little woodbine or the jasmine or the vine will lean towards the rugged elm appointed by virgil in his epic of husbandry i mean no pun for their natural support the elm you know it hath been said is the gentleman of the forest see all the little tendrils turn this way silently and cling and long years after maybe clothe the broken and blighted tree with a fragrance and beauty not its own those feeble feminine plants are it sometimes seems to me the strength and perfection of creation strength perfected in weakness the ivy green among the snows of winter and clasping together in its true embrace the loveless ruin and the vine that maketh glad the heart of man amidst the miseries of life i must not be mistaken though for devereux's talk was only a tender sort of trifling and lilius had said nothing to encourage him to risk more but she now felt sure that devereux liked her that indeed he took a deep interest in her and somehow she was happy and little lily drew towards the dancers and devereux by her side not to join in the frolic it was much pleasanter talking but the merry thrum and jingle of the tambourine and vivacious squeak of the fiddles and the incessant laughter and prattle of the gay company were a sort of protection and perhaps she fancied that within that pleasant and bustling circle the discourse which was to her so charming might be longer maintained it was music heard in a dream strange and sweet and might never come again end of chapter twenty four recording by john brandon Chapter Twenty Five of the House by the Churchyard. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. The House by the Churchyard by Joseph Sheraton Lefanu. Chapter Twenty Five. In which the sun sets and the merrymaking is kept up by candlelight in the king's house and lily receives a warning 
which she does not comprehend. Dr. Toole, without whom no jollification of any sort could occur satisfactorily in Chapel Isit or the country round, was this evening at the king's house, of course, as usual, with his eyes about him and his tongue busy, and at this moment he was setting Clough right about Devereux's relation to the title and estates of Athen Rye. His uncle, Roland Lord Athen Rye, was, as everybody knew, a lunatic. Tool used to call him Orlando Furioso, and Louis, his first cousin by his father's elder brother, the heir presumptive, was very little better, and reported every winter to be dying. He spends all his time, his spine being made, it is popularly believed, of gristle, stretched on his back upon a deal board, cutting out paper figures with a pair of scissors. Toole used to tell them at the club, when alarming letters arrived about the health of the noble uncle and his hopeful nephew, the heir apparent, that's the gentleman whose backbone's made of jelly, eh, Puddock? Two letters come, by Jove, announcing that Dick Devereux's benefit is actually fixed for the Christmas holidays, when his cousin undertakes to die, for positively the last time, and his uncle will play in the most natural manner conceivable the last act of King Lear. In fact, this family calamity was rather a cheerful subject among Devereux's friends, and certainly Devereux had no reason to love that vicious, selfish, old lunatic, Lord Athen Rye, who in his prodigal and heartless reign, before straw and darkness swallowed him, never gave the boy a kind word or gentle look, and owed him a mortal grudge because he stood near the kingdom, and wrote most damaging reports of him at the end of the holidays, and dispatched those letters of Bellerophon by the boy's own hand to the schoolmaster, with the natural results. When Aunt Rebecca rustled into the ring that was gathered round about the fiddles and tambourine, she passed Miss Magnolia very near, with a high countenance, and looking straight before her, and with no more recognition than the tragedy queen bestows upon the painted statue on the wing by which she enters. And Miss Mag followed her with a titter and an angry flash of her eyes, so Aunt Rebecca made up to the little hillock, little bigger than a good tea-cake, on which the dowager was perched in a high-backed chair, smiling over the dancers with a splendid benignity, and beating time with her fat short foot. And Aunt Becky told Mrs. Colonel Stafford, standing by, she had extemporized a living Watteau, and indeed it was a very pretty picture or Aunt Becky would not have said so. And craning from this eminence, she saw her niece coming leisurely round, not in company of Mervyn. That interesting stranger, on the contrary, had by this time joined Lilius and Devereux, who had returned toward the dancers, and was talking again with Miss Walsingham. Gertrude's beau was little Puddock, who was all radiant and supremely blessed but encountering rather a black look from Aunt Becky as they drew near, he deferentially surrendered the young lady to the care of her natural guardian, who forthwith presented her to the dowager, and Puddock, warned off by another glance, backed away and fell unawares, helplessly into the possession of Miss Magnolia, a lady whom he never quite understood and whom he regarded with a very kind and polite sort of horror. So the athletic magnolia instantly impounded the little lieutenant, and began to rally him in the sort of slang she delighted in, with plenty of merriment and malice upon his tender for Miss Chatsworth, and made the gallant young gentleman blush and occasionally smile, and bow a great deal, and take some snuff. And here comes the Duchess of Belmont again, said the saucy Miss Magnolia, seeing the stately approach of Aunt Becky, as it seemed to put it, through the back of her head. I think the exertion and frolic of the dance had got her high blood up into a sparkling state, and her scorn and hate of Aunt Rebecca was more demonstrative than usual. 
now you'll see how she'll run against poor little simple me just because i'm small and this is the way they dance it cried she in a louder tone and capering backward with a bounce and an air and a grace she came with a sort of a curtsy and a smart bump and a shock against the stately miss rebecca and whisking round with a little scream and a look of terrified innocence and with her fingers to her heart to suppress an imaginary palpitation dropped a low curtsy saying i'm blessed but i thought twas tall burke the gunner you might look behind before you spring backward young gentlewoman said aunt becky with a very bright color and you might look before you before you spring forward old gentlewoman replied miss mag just as angry young ladies used to have a respect to decorum aunt becky went on so they prayed me to tell you madam replied the young lady with a very meek curtsy and a very crimson face yes miss mac mag madame it used to be so rejoined aunt rebecca twas part of my education at least to conduct myself in a polite company like a civilized person i wish i could see it says blind hugh magnolia retorted but twas a good while ago madame and you've had time to forget i shall acquaint your mother mrs mug mac mcnamara with your pretty behavior to-morrow said miss rebecca to-morrow's a new day and mother may be well enough then to hear your genteel lamentation but i suppose you mean to-morrow come never answered magnolia with another of her provoking meek courtesies oh this is lieutenant puddock said aunt becky drawing off in high disdain the bully of the town your present company sir will find very pretty work i warrant for your sword and pistols sir lancelot and his bell do you like a bell or a bell damn best sir lancelot inquired miss mag with a mild little dr puddock you'll have your hands pretty full sir ha 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 and with scarlet cheeks and a choking laugh away sailed aunt rebecca choke chicken there's more a hatchin said miss mag in a sort of aside and cutting a flick flack with a merry devilish laugh and a wink to puddock that officer being a gentleman was a good deal disconcerted and scandalized too literal to see and too honest to enjoy the absurd side of the combat twas an affair of a few seconds like two frigates crossing in a gale with only opportunity for a broadside or two and when the rebecca chatsworth sheared off it can't be denied her tackling was a good deal more cut up and her hull considerably more pierced than those of the saucy magnolia who sent that whistling shot and provoking cheer in her majestic wake i see you want to go lieutenant puddock lieutenant o'flaherty i promise to dance this country dance with you don't let me keep you ensign puddock said miss mag in a huff observing little puddock's wandering eye and thoughts i uh you see miss mcnamara truly you were so hard upon poor miss rebecca chatsworth that i fear i shall get into trouble unless i go and make my peace with her lisped the little lieutenant speaking the truth as was his wont with a bow and a polite smile and a gentle indication of beginning to move away oh is that all i was afraid you were sick of the mully grubs with eating chopped hay you had better go back to her at once if she wants you for if you don't with a good grace she'll very likely come and take you back by the collar and miss mag and o'flaherty joined in a derisive hee-haw to puddock's considerable confusion who bowed and smiled again and tried to laugh till the charming couple relieved him by taking their places in the dance when i read this speech about the mully grubs in the old yellow letter which contains a lively account of the skirmish my breath was fairly taken away and i could see nothing else for more than a minute and so soon as i was quite myself again i struck my revising pen across the monstrous sentence 
with uncompromising decision, referring it to a clerical blunder or some unlucky transposition, and I wondered how any polite person could have made so gross a slip. But see how authentication waits upon truth. Three years afterwards, I picked up in the parlor of the Cat and Fiddle on the Macclesfield Road in Derbyshire a scrubby old duodecimo, which turned out to be an old volume of Dean Swift's works. Well, I opened in the middle of polite conversation, and there upon my honor, the second sentence I read was, Lady Smart. Mark that, Lady. What, you are sick of the mully grubs with eating chopped hay? So my good old yellow letter writer, I, or T, Tresham, can't decide what he signs himself. You were, no doubt, exact here, as in all other matters, and I was determining the probable and the impossible unphilosophically by the rule of my own time. And my poor Magnolia, though you spoke some years thirty or so later than my Lady Smart, a countess for aught I know, you are not so much to blame. Thirty years. What of that? Don't we, to this hour, more especially in rural districts, encounter among the old folk, every now and then, one of honest Simon Wagstaff's pleasantries, which had served many ladies and gentlemen so long before that charming compiler, with his large table-book, took the matter in hands. And I feel, I confess, a queer sort of a thrill, not at all contemptuous, neither altogether sad, nor altogether joyous, but something pleasantly regretful, whenever one of those quaint and faded old servants of the mirth of so many dead and buried generations turns up in my company. And now the sun went down behind the tufted trees, and the blue shades of evening began to deepen, and the merry company flocked into the king's house to dance again and drink tea, and make more love, and play round games, and joke, and sing songs, and eat supper under old Colonel Stafford's snug and kindly roof tree. Dangerfield, who arrived rather late, was now in high chat with Aunt Becky. She rather liked him, and had very graciously accepted a grey parrot and a monkey, which he had deferentially presented, a step which called forth, to General Chatsworth's consternation, a cockatoo from Clough, who felt the necessity of maintaining his ground against the stranger, and wrote off by the next packet to London in a confounded passion, for he hated wasting money, about a pelican he had got wind of. Dangerfield also entered with much apparent interest into a favorite scheme of Aunt Becky's for establishing between Chapel Isit and Knockmaroon a sort of retreat for discharged jailbirds of her selection. A colony, happily for the character and the silver spoons of the neighborhood, never eventually established. It was plain he was playing the frank good fellow and aiming at popularity. He had become one of the club. He played at whist and only smiled after his sort when his partner revoked, and he lost like a gentleman. His talk was brisk and hard and caustic, that of a Philistine who had seen the world and knew it. He had the peerage by rote, and knew something out of the way, amusing or damnable, about every person of note you could name. And his shrewd gossip had a bouquet its own, and a fine cynical flavor which secretly awed and delighted the young fellows. He smiled a good deal. He was not aware that a smile did not quite become him. The fact is, he had lost a good many side teeth, and it was a hollow and sinister disclosure. He would laugh, too, occasionally, but his laugh was not rich and joyous, like General Chatsworth's, or even Tom Toole's cozy chuckle, or old Dr. Walsingham's hilarious ha-ha-ha. He did not know it, but there was a cold hard ring in it, like the crash and jingle of broken glass. Then his spectacles, shining like ice in the light, never removed for a moment, never even pushed up to his forehead. He eat in them, drank in them, fished in them, joked in them. He prayed in them, and no doubt slept in them, and would it was believed be buried in them, heightened that sense of mystery and mask which seemed to challenge curiosity 
and defy scrutiny with a scornful chuckle. In the meantime, the mirth and frolic and flirtation were drawing to a close. The dowager, in high good humor, was conveyed downstairs to her carriage by Colonel Stafford and Lord Castle Mallard, and rolled away with blazing flambeau like a meteor into town. There was a breaking up and leave-taking and parting jokes on the doorsteps, and as the ladies, old and young, were popping on their mantles in the little room off the hall, and Aunt Becky and Mrs. Colonel Strafford were exchanging a little bit of eager farewell gossip beside the cabinet, Gertrude Chatsworth, by some chance she and Lilius, had not had an opportunity of speaking that evening, drew close to her, and she took her hand and said, Good night, dear Lily, and glanced over her shoulder, still holding Lily's hand, and she looked very pale and earnest, and said quickly in a whisper, Lily, darling, if you knew what I could tell you, if I dare, about Mr. Mervyn, you would cut your hand off rather than allow him to talk to you. As I confess, he has talked to me as an admirer, and knowing what I know, and with an eye upon him. Lily, Lily, I've been amazed by him tonight. I can only warn you now, darling, be aware of a great danger. "'Tis no danger, however, to me, Gertrude, dear,' said Lily, with a pleasant little smile. "'And though he's handsome, there's something, is there not, funest, in his deep eyes and black hair? And the dear old man knows something strange about him, too. I suppose tis all the same story.' "'And he has not told you,' said Gertrude, looking down with a gloomy face at her fan. No, but I am so curious. I know he will, though he does not like to speak of it. But you know, Gertie, I love a horror, and I know the story is fearful, and I feel uncertain whether he's a man or a ghost. But see, Aunt Rebecca and Mistress Strafford are kissing. Good night, dear Lily, and remember, said pale Gertrude, without a smile, looking at her for a moment, with a steadfast gaze and then kissing her with a hasty and earnest pressure. And Lily kissed her again. And so they parted. End of chapter 25 Recording by John Brandon